Dr. Sanjay Gupte sir and the whole team of Dr. Gupte Hospital. Dr. Divakar sir who has come all the way from Bangalore today early morning. So welcome sir, welcome to IMA Pune. This is a great day because maybe many of you, at least 90% of the audience over here have been the students of Dr. Mridula Fadke, madam. And we all are so eager to listen to her. And thank you very much, Dr. Gupte, sir, for arranging this oration by Dr. Mridula Fadke, madam. She was HOD when I was in BJ Medical, as well as she was Dean of BJ Medical College. So we all have Dr. Sanjay Patil is here, Dr. Bhondwe, sir, is here. All BJ IHC, Mantri, sir, everyone is raising hands that we all are her students. So it's a great day today. Today is 1st October, sir. And this is a special day for us as well, because today the new team, Dr. Raju Varyani's presidency, we completed six months. So these last six months have been very active and very fruitful for IMA Pune. We have been doing a lot of academic activities. Uh, there are physical activities. All of these are witnessing that. At least twice a month, we are having physical CMEs. We are having webinars. Uh, and these CMEs are of different topics. There was cardiology, there was general surgery, coloproctology, oncology. Today it is genetics. So I feel that our team is very fortunate to get associated with other teams who come out with such different topics. And so all the members get benefited. So I'm very, very grateful that today's topic is on genetics. This is something new, something new to learn. So I'm sure everyone is going to enjoy it. IMA Pune also organizes a lot of social activities. And if you all know, we have a great project going on as our Gauchale. And just yesterday, we had a great presentation to the national team. And I'm very happy that Dr. Gupte sir is going to get associated with that project as well. He has been associated with us even for the sports activities. Recently, uh, in the month of May 26, 27, 28, we had cricket tournaments and he was the first, come, first one to come forward and to sponsor that event and it was a great success. So thank you very much for all your associations with IMA Pune. We are really, really grateful to you. Let's have something, let's just go through a few slides about IMA Pune, what activities we are doing. It doesn't run. So as you all know, booking or registration for CME is not physical, it is online. It's very easy. You have to register yourself online and fill the Google form. No need of asking us whether we are registered. Once you fill the Google form and it gets submitted, you are registered. So it's very easy. This is one important scheme. It is IMA Maharashtra State Scheme, Social Security, but the office is in IMA Pune premises and our team from IMA Pune runs this uh, scheme. And I request everyone to become the members of this. I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Asmita Gupta, madam. Welcome, madam. Let's all stand. Yes. Good morning, madam. Without taking much time, I just run through the slides. So last month we had this CME on coloproctology. Then on 15th August, we had this special Vyakhyan on Bharatiya Swatantra Chi Panchatar Varsha by Avinash Halbe sir. Then there was CME on neurocritical care on 27th of August. 
well attended, well appreciated. There was a CME on oncology on 27th August, again, a research based CME. There was a special talk on the occasion of organ donation month on 27th August by Dr. Kapil Zirpe on myths and facts about organ donation. As I mentioned earlier, we have adopted a village called Kadwe uh, near Velle. And we go every month, either two times or even at least once to Kadwe for health checkup camp. So on 20th August, we had a cancer screening camp over there and we donated some plastic head covers to these villagers. On 3rd of September, this was a program by IMA Pune Art Circle, where I'm the secretary. We had Ek Sham Shamji Ke Naam, where our own member, Dr. Sham Damle sir, presented beautiful Hindi Marathi songs based on nature's beauty. So it was an audiovisual program. Then we had a fantastic state level conference, HOSPICON 2023. In a pre-conference workshop, it was meant for nursing staff and admin staff. And we gave some live demonstration to them, including the fire safety and the CPR training. So they were the faculty for the pre-conference uh, workshop. You can see Dr. Sarada, Sir Navrange, Sir Sanjay Patil, Sir myself. Then we had uh, Hospicon 2023 on 10th of September, uh, which was inaugurated. Uh, the exhibition was by Dr. Ravindra Kute, who is the IMA state president. We had uh, the Hospicon souvenir released on that day. And if you all have received IMA plus physical copy, it is the Hospicon souvenir where you will find all important articles related to hospital management. So they were all the faculty. Now I'm coming to the upcoming IMA CMEs. Of course, this is today's. Then on 15th October, we are having CME on cardiology and diabetology. There will be IMA Maharashtra state elections on 15th of October. And I request all of you must come over here physically to give your votes. This is from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Along with that, we have organized CME. So IMA does all the programs, but there is always academics attached to it. And then on 22nd of October, which I'm telling you all the while, we have the Marathi Sahitya Sammelan. This is Rajasthariya Doctor and so Marathi Sahitya Sammelan. So I request all of you to get registered for that. On this occasion, even on 21st, that is a day prior, we are trying to keep one beautiful program. So I'll be in touch with you and communicate with you about the details of Shabda Sharada 2023 Sahitya Sammelan and the pre-Sahitya pre Sammelan program. On 3rd of December, our annual conference, pre-conference workshop will be there of Multicon. And 9th and 10th of December, we are having IMA Pune's annual conference, Multicon. These are some awards that we received. Recently, we received, IMA Pune received the Membership Drive Award from IMA Maharashtra State. And congratulations to our team of Dr. Virendra Ostwal and Dr. Sumit Shah, who did a lot of work to increase the membership. This is our IMA Plus. As every time I request everyone, this IMA Plus is our own magazine. Please do write for it. Please do send your articles, your poetry, your experiences with patients, and we are there to publish it in IMA+. Plus. New membership, it is very easy to join. Uh, single membership is 18,526, and couple 27,790. I request everyone to join. So thank you very much. And may I now request our president, Dr. Raju Varyani, sir, to come and give his opening address. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gitanjali, madam. A very good morning to all of you and welcome for this very important CME, which is like a future CME. Welcome. Now, monsoon has arrived. We are facing very dizzy, many diseases, vector borne diseases. Whenever we advise the tests for dengue, like NS1 antigen is advised IgG, IgM. And if that NS1 antigen is positive, please don't label that patient as dengue positive. NS1 antigen is not dengue positive. Many on many death certificates also, when the patient is NS1 antigen positive, it is written as dengue. NS1 is not dengue positive, it is dengue-like disease. 
only if elisa test is positive you can label that person as dengue positive if elisa dengue is positive then only it is dengue positive because unnecessarily there is load on civic bodies if we label that patient as dengue positive ns1 positive is only dengue like disease not dengue on 15th october we have uh, ima maharashtra state elections so all the ima eligible members of ima pune are requested to do come and give your valuable vote for this important elections which is for the post of president elect president elect of ima maharashtra state 2023-24 do come on that voting day with your identity cards as far as today cme is concerned genetics and clinical practice by dr gupte hospital along with this we have a very important oration dr asmita gupte i am a pune dr asmita gupte oration for this we have professor dr mridula fadke madam who will be delivering the oration on genetics today and tomorrow so we all our students most of them are students of madam so madam is known to all so we will have excellent oration by madam in the afternoon time so also we are thankful to dr gupte sir and dr As asmita gupte foundation and green array labs so this research work is going on by dr gupte sir since long and genetics is the future of medicine which whether morning exercise is useful to you or evening exercise is useful to you will be determined by your genes genes pl will play a very important role in diagnosis and management of diseases genes are very important in oncology management so the future of medical practice is genes so this is very important topic for the future thank you very much uh, i take this opportunity to welcome dr mrudula fadke madam she has joined online so may i request uh, our president dr raju varyani sir to welcome her with a floral bouquet welcome madam डॉक्टर मैडम शी इज म्यूटेड या हाँ डॉक्टर फटके मैडम अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रॉम आई एम ए पुणे आई एम स्पीकिंग फ्रॉम आई एम ए पुणे can you start your video madam everybody is eager to see you it's okay if uh, madam comes then we'll again welcome her yeah okay thank you sir so without taking much time we are going to start the session now and to chair the uh, you want to say? Uh, today dr divakar has joined us he is in the auditorium he is former uh, karnataka medical council president and presently is vice president of karnataka hospital association welcome sir yes so we'll start the first session now to chair the first session may i request dr meenakshi deshpande and dr vaishali kode naik to come on to the dais please dr meenakshi deshpande is the immediate past president of ima pune both of them are gynecologist and uh, dr naik madam is a chodi um at my mar so over to you i have kept the program in details and the cvs good morning to all of you on a rainy sunday so i am very glad to see such a big audience today on a sunday after morning and this all credits goes to dr gupte sir and asmita gupte madam who are there in the audience and who has taken a lead 
to formulate this oration every year for IMA Pune since last year. And a huge applause for them for giving this oration to IMA Pune. Thank you, sir, for such a great uh, event which will be conducted every year on some important topic, a focus topic, a focus conference, one day conference with an CME and an oration. So now we go for the first speaker, Dr. Ananda Babrekar. She will be speaking, he will be speaking on chromosomes and their clinical application. So I'll be introducing you. Dr. Ananda Babrekar is a PhD in zoology awarded SPPU Pune. He's worked as a, a project assistant, junior research fellow, and a research project by KDIC and Israel Zoology. He's won the VC Shah Best Poster Presentation Award at the 17th All India Cell Biology Conference and the International Symposium Pune for the poster presentation. He selected for the mini school and workshop of multiple time scales in the dynamics of the nervous system at ICTP Italy 2008. So we welcome you, sir, for a great talk and a good uh, lecture topic which you have been allotted to you. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, to start with that, cytogenetics and fish in clinical practice. So, what is cytogenetics? As everybody is aware about, little bit aware about the cytogenetics, that is nothing but the study of inheritance in relation to structure and function of chromosomes. Now, the question comes in mind, chromosomes. What are chromosomes? Chromosomes are nothing like, they are thread-like structures made up of protein of a single molecule of DNA that seen uh, serve to carry genomic information from cell to cell. So now we need to jump to the cell. Now everybody is uh, aware about the cell that is a basic structure of our body and cell follows a particular cell cycle that having various phases that is G1 phase as well as synthesis phase and G2 phase and the mitosis is important phase that is a cell division which is uh, cytogenetics has to look for this particular or uh, they are eager to wait this phase of cell cycle and that is why we need to catch we need to identify or we need to arrange the cells in a metaphase so that we can see the chromosomes under the bright field microscope and that is these chromosomes are bundles of tightly coiled dna located within the nucleus then these chromosomes are harvested in metaphase stage and the uh, banding is done that is trypsin gymsa banding is done g banded and that observed under the microscope now coming part to the chromosomes as uh, human there are 46 chromosomes are present 23 chromosomes which are contributed by the parents from father as well as from the mother and these chromosomes basically if you identify if you describe the structure of a chromosome chromosome can be uh, having following parts like centromere telomeres short arm which is a p arm long arm is a uh, q arm and uh, specific bands are present now depending upon the presence of a centromere the chromosomes are described some of the chromosomes are metacentric chromosomes some of the chromosomes are submetacentric chromosome and some of the chromosomes are acrocentric chromosomes now chromosome pairs from 1 to 22 are known as the autosomes or they called as the autosomes however x and y are called as the sex chromosomes now in cytogenetics we need to have uh, samples which required basically uh, two categories one category is that which uh, sample is already having the spontaneously dividing cells like uh, leukemic blood, uh, blood, bone marrow aspirates and solid tumors because they are already tuned to develop fast. So that is why you need not require a stimulation. But there are some non-spontaneously dividing cells are there which are present in our peripheral blood as well as uh, amniotic fluid sample cells, chorionic villus sampling as well as cells obtained from POC that is products of conceptions where we need to stimulate by adding the PHA and that gives the undergo cell division because cytogenetics or the whenever you need to harvest chromosomes we need to identify the cell dividing cells or we need to catch the if we want to catch the bus then we need to uh, catch the metaphase and that has to be observed in the dividing cells itself 
harvesting chromosome uh, is an important step in the cytogenetics then culturing for that basically there are two types of cultures we can have one is the suspension cultures where we can add peripheral blood in the media bone marrow aspirates in the and that can be grown in the routine incubator however there are some suspension cultures which are present or uh, that grown in the co2 incubator like amniotic fluid cells or cvs cells now this this one picture of metaphase where uh, chromosomes can be observed under the bright field microscope now how we can identify so chromosomes can be identified basically abnormality can be identified or bifurcated or divided either structurally abnormality or you can have a numerical abnormality so you can have the red arrow which shows the chromosome 21 is appeared thrice however a pair of chromosomes present in a normal, normal human being so that so there, that is, there could be a numerical be a abnormality now there are while reporting these cytogenetics or karyotyping studies there are some guidelines which are given by the international society for chromosome nomenclature that is iscn guidelines and that is why we have to identify we have to find the 20 metaphase that has to be done by the two analysts and that to be blindfolded so that whether this they, they can corroborate or they can identify they can match their results whether the sub person one or analyst one is identified in an abnormality either an analyst second has also found some that particular abnormality so every clone can be found to be as represented as a karyotype now numerical abnormalities as down syndrome that is a trisomy of 21 chromosome number 21 appeared uh, three chromosomes you can see their uh, turner syndrome that is 45 x or xo conditions and klein filter syndrome that is xxy condition now there are there can be some some of as i told you earlier mm. uh, uh, there can be some structural rearrangements that is translocation for example philadelphia that is translocation between chromosome number 9 to 22 generally seen in the uh, hematological disorders robertsonian translocations that is basically occurred in the acrocentric chromosome number 13 and 21 and there could be some deletions duplications as well as the inversions in the uh, structure of chromosomes now while reporting iscn says that criteria it has set some criteria for uh, reporting abnormalities more than two major metaphases are showing structural abnormality and more than three cells showing the numerical abnormalities so that can be reported as the abnormal so this is a particular typical form of a type of a report where you can see uh, the earlier metaphase which I showed you that showed three chromosomes of 21. So there could be a frank down syndrome that all 20 metaphases show or all the cells are showing chromosome number 21 appeared in a three number. So similarly, there could be a mosaic exam can be observed. So here you can see the report says that it is a mosaic down syndrome. Some 10 of 10 metaphases had showed uh, chromosome 21 appeared to be uh, triply in three number as well as some 10 metaphases showed a normal appearance. So it can be the mosaicism can be observed in case of this constitutional abnormalities. As this is a typical karyotype where you can see the chromosome number in the last row that uh, 21 chromosome you can read with red arrow that is shown that chromosome 21 this is a typical down syndrome karyotype. Now this cytogenetics as is uh basically very labor intensive then it very tedious because you have to look under the microscope you have to count the metaphases you have to count the number of chromosomes whether the chromosomes are there you have to identify where all the bands are this uh, present or not so that is why it becomes very time consuming and there is no automation in as regards the, with this uh, karyotyping and so there is no interference of ai nowadays and that is why it takes longer turnaround time for the reports generally for 12 to 15 days or amniotic fluid takes because growing the cell is not in within our hand we have to provide nutritious material to the cells to grow them in an incubator some of the cells may grow fast some of the cells will take some more time we you can say that those cells are sluggish so that they will take some more time to grow so depending upon the growth we need to identify we need to harvest the chromosomes now this is a gold standard or this is the routine cytogenetic 
uh, part now there is a molecular cytosynthesis that is fish that is fluorescence in situ hybridization now this is very specific targeted uh, part or targeted technique where we need to know about particular uh, site or loci loci which is present or we identify or we question there has to be some query with along with the symptoms so that what we need to look for that so that is why fish technique is very useful why it is very useful because it is very user friendly and one important part of the fish technique is that you don't require the viable cells to uh, run this fish test as well as this is very rapid results within two days two and three days you can identify you can immediately get the results and uh, another part is that formalin fixed tissues also can be used or for this fish studies because it's very specific dna probe, probes are available in the market approved probes that specific bind it binds to the specific loci and that will but we need to know which loci we are interested to look for that so unless and until we do have a hint of a particular it will be uh, it, it won't be possible now the probes which are available postnatal probes are also available prenatal probes are, probes are also available in prenatal we have a combo particular that for chromosome 20 21 13 18 as well as for so to identify the sex chrome anoplodes as well as these constitutional abnormalities that is microdeletion syndromes as well as the down syndromes and for cancer acquired abnormalities that is hematological uh, malignancies solid tumors where we can i uh, use the for example the probe for bcr able that is translocation between chromosome number 9 and 22 the 922 translocation so which are the diagnostic applications or prognostic application of cytogenetics that can be into the hematology as well as in oncology then pediatric people can also go for that ob ob obviously the ob obstetric uh, branch also will uh, utilize this particular test as well as the prenatal diagnosis which is very very important so these are the scenarios where we can prescribe particular cytogenetic test depending upon the morphology depending upon the clinical features and suspected underlying genetic causes and which test can be performed for example if a pediatrician has found that gross dysmorphism then the chromosomal structure or chromosomal abnormalities may be there either numerical or structural so karyotyping cytogenetic test can be advised in that and for that we need a peripheral blood in the heparin vacutaner dysmorphic features if for example there is a delay developmental delay or obesity uh, obese baby for example prader syndrome microdeletion syndrome such engelman d george where we can use the specific fish probes to identify these microdeletions even in the same fashion or similarly if there is an ambiguous genitalia to identify a sex of a baby then we can run the fish test that is sry fish so that immediately we can identify the sex of a baby because sometimes uh, gynecologist as well as the pediatrician comes in the oh there is an ambiguous genital how to identify so this can be uh, prescribed similarly the primary amenorrhea is a major challenging part nowadays so that in case of primary amenorrhea we can also go for the karyotyping test now in third last scenario where we can go for the karyotyping test on the amniotic fluid that is prenatal diagnosis or on CVS samples. If a pregnant woman shows uh, double marker, triple marker positive, then uh, NIPS nowadays it advise and even NIPS is showing the high risk result, then we can go for uh, this chromosomal abnormality, chromosomal studies, karyotyping or fish uh, on amniotic fluid sample as well as the CVS sample. In case of advanced maternal age, that also we can have this particular test, which is defined above 35 years old uh, lady. So in nutshell, essentially these uh, these are these tests are very extremely informative tests, which helps in the diagnosis. In uh, it has some particular independent parameter for a prognosis and helping clinicians for the better patient management. So at Green Array, we do this particular test that is cytogenetics as well as subtelomeric fish test and to identify this ambiguous genital primary amenorrhea, cytogenetics and fish SRY gene test. 
and at the end i would like to when the farmer is becomes happy when he can have a yield of crop in a good quantity a cytogenetics can smile on his face you can see the smile on his face when he can harvest he or she can harvest good chromosome from the blood that is uh, important and uh, with this i would like to thank uh, ima house ima uh, team as well as the gupte hospital uh, team dr sanjay gupte sir asmita madam and our green amre uh, Nit ceo nitin gupte sir our uh, director sir dr sarjan saha and entire team of our green array for giving an opportunity thank you very much thank you so much yeah. excellent overview of the chromosomal clinical applications yeah. and being a fetal medicine person i can very well relate yeah. to it and yeah. it is really very important clinically prenatally as well as when there are ambiguous genitally and yes, it's an yes. emergency for obstetricians that what exactly we have to yes. counsel the patient's relatives that what baby is what born. What baby is born, yeah, yes. because they have an anxiety yes. to know whether baby that boy or... first thing they first want thing. to know that what exactly <laughs> I can understand, it's a yeah. male or female. Yeah, yeah. And that time it really comes handy <clears throat> and uh, the situation becomes tricky and you help us in such situations. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah. for a very lucid presentation. Yeah. Thank you. We take questions. Microscope is required because we need to get a blood in a heparin hypotenor. We have to grow them in a cell uh, culture media in the incubator because we have to uh, keep an eye on the dividing cells. Unless and until there is a division of cells, we won't be able to harvest those cells because we have to catch the chromosomes in the metaphase if, uh, if you uh, go for the cell division it has particular phases prophase meta, metaphase anaphase and telophase and cytokinesis then the chromosomes are arranged and that can be observed under bright field microscope in the metaphase stage for that we need to add uh, colchicin that which arrays the metaphases and that can be harvested no, no, no. Our bright will normal where we have to uh, look through our eyes, basically. Cost of is this test because it's labor, yes. Uh, so it starts from 4K to 7K around that kind of thing. Yeah. Fish is quite expensive because these probes are very expensive because we have to uh, go for the approved probes. So that is why. Uh, yeah, depend upon the scene. Yeah. I think that is exactly why Dr. Bhukte sir and myself thought of both this and we started an oration because such topics need to be discussed amongst all medical professionals because we can have pregnant patients in our relatives, in our friends and all of us need to know that this genetic testing is as most possible from 8 weeks of pregnancy onwards and we need to test nearly each and every pregnant female for such tests so that we have lesser number of abnormal children coming out. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Babrikar. Please come over here. May I request our president, Dr. Raju Varyani, sir, and Dr. Sanjay Gupte, sir, to join for felicitation of Dr. Babrikar. I request the chairpersons to join for this. As we have all gathered here for a very futuristic CME and we really congratulate IMA and Gupte sir for this initiative. But at the same time, this CME is going to take us to a very basic things also like how genetic and even our nutrition, our day to day diet is related. And our next speaker is going to talk about it. She's going to tell us to get how to get the maximum benefit of our diet and exercise, which is guided by the genes and for which 
we invite Mrs. Saili Vindorkar to give us a talk on this. She is, she has over 17 years of experience as a health professional practicing clinical nutrition and promoting importance of nutrition. She has experience on, uh, uh, basically she gives consultation on lifestyle disorders, specialized consultation for cancer patients, diabetic, special care patients for weight gain, weight loss, pre and postnatal, even PCOD patient, which will be very handy for all obstetricians. She does nutritional counseling and consultation as well as she's interested in various clinical research and trials. And she's been conducting lectures on best, best practices in nutrition and dietics. The dais is yours. Thank you so much for this introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, we'll be starting, and I'll be talking about nutritionomics and green array. Thank you so much for inviting me here as a speaker. Yeah, so uh, what is basically, what is gene? So gene is a segment of DNA and uh, it helps us to give us the uh, give the instruction it helps to give the instruction to our body to our hormones and it is basically a coding which which will help to pass on the information here then snp single nucleotide uh, polymorphism uh, polymorphism and or it is called as snips in genetic language you call it as snips as well so what this uh, snip has there is a um, hylix uh, kind of structure in uh, your gene and it has uh, thymine cytosine guanine and adenine these four protein uh, strains so nucleotides in that and when it comes to uh, snp a single letter change can uh, change your dna dna complete uh, you know building block of your uh, dna so I'll be talking more with the examples which will help you to understand that uh, how this DNA structure changes and how it directly affect your health. So what is uh, nutrigenomics? Nutrigenomics is the interaction between your genes and your food, uh, your nutrition and how it reacts when specific amount of food is uh, consumed in specific uh, you know particular time when what and how these all answers you get from nutrigenomics and uh, there there are many different kind of studies involved uh, in genetical factor your uh, environmental uh, factor also involved in this nutrigenomics so i have an example do you all know this can you see all this thing? coke right this is zero calorie uh, coke so uh, uh, do you all know phen uh, phenylalanine right it's a protein so excess of phenylalanine what happens when it is there in your body it is toxic to your brain and ultimately we get a condition like pku and when this kind of thing is consumed for larger amount of time, and it is just not this Coke, the fast food, uh, zero calories, uh, sugar-free products, when you see in the market or frozen food, when you see in the market, that time you are ultimately consuming something which is going to change the uh, DNA of one's, uh, you know, DNA of the individual. So it is affecting that deep to you. And ultimately, since 1960, the studies are going on, which is going to, which are showing that infants are uh, having uh, conditions like PKU when they are born. Got it? So phenylalanine, uh, there is an enzyme which is blocked, which helps in converting it into uh, the utilized protein. <laughs> Okay, the way uh, we said that uh, diet, nutrient, and different kind of metabolism, so carbohydrate metabolism, fat metabolism, protein metabolism, your gene expression, cellular functions, these all are giving signal to your gene. So ultimately nutrient and your uh, gene is interacting. Um, again, one of the example about APOE, 
2 epoi 3 epoi 4 gene so uh, we all know omega 3 fatty acid helps us to reduce the uh, triglyceride level and LDL levels. So the consumption or the prescription of cod liver oil, fish oil, omega-3 fatty acid, uh, different uh, are Indian products uh, like uh, Zavas, uh, Flaxis, which are being given or prescribed by us and, and even doctors to many of the patients. But when it comes to APOE4 gene, which is the rarest gene, and when somebody is having apoe4 genes you will see the drastic result drastic change in that patient's uh, triglyceride levels so it drops drastically comparatively apoe2 and 3 gene and one of the uh, best example is about folate uh, september month was celebrated as a portion maha so uh, for ida uh, your uh, iron deficiency anemia and uh, folate is uh, one of the important uh, important uh, nutrient for dna production and deficiency of it can give uh, put the person to the higher risk of various disease conditions like even cancer um, folate plays an important role in dna synthesis and even for reproduct uh, in reproduction and uh, even for the fetal growth so when uh, mtfr gene is there which helps to convert the enzyme uh, when there is a deficiency of mtfr gene the genotype a b c you will see the result a genotype a person is having the normal level of enzyme where new, uh, where iron is being converted hemoglobin levels are normal whereas b and b has the lower one and c has the lowest uh, enzyme level and here we'll see more patients of uh, iron deficiency anemia and they are suffering from chronic disorders like cancer patients okay as we mentioned the um, uh, the protein nucleotide uh, uh, in dna strands snps so when lactose intolerance is the uh, condition where uh, milk and milk product they are not uh, digested tolerated by by the patient by an individual so when you have a cc uh, protein nucleotide in your uh, gene here the patient will show the uh, symptoms of lactose intolerance they won't be able to digest and tolerate the milk protein and uh, the, there is absence of enzyme which helps in the uh, enzyme lactase which is not converting that into the sugar so lactose uh, ct and tt genes those who are having ct and tt genes they can tolerate uh, milk very well milk and milk products okay uh, obesity so according to the statistics currently india has 135 millions of obese people and uh, the prevalence of CVD is around 54.5 million people. Type 2 diabetes. So when we say nutrigenomics and uh, disease conditions, and when we talk about obesity, obesity is lifestyle disorder. But then it has been guided with the help of you know uh, certain genes where fat met metabolism takes a major role. It plays a major role um, uh, in guiding and uh, your fat deposition and utilization of your fat. Okay, so, uh, so when it comes to diabetes, similarly you have uh, when you have a lifestyle disorder you will see the uh, inflammation you will see the metabolic stress you will see the oxidative stress and ultimately it, uh, many genes are responsible for uh, insulin resistance as well as glucose intolerance and metabolic syndrome and ultimately result into type 2 diabetes now uh, what and how nutrigenomics is going to help us to understand the disease condition to understand and prescribe the particular diet and understand the lifestyle of the person and what all changes are required to do so personalized nutrition uh, where you will get the uh, you will see the report further we have some reports we have uh, given in the slides that you will understand what 
kind of genotype this person is having. You will understand that uh, uh, how the, that particular genes is impacting that person's lifestyle and ultimately uh, it is going to, uh, you know, uh, you know, give you that uh, particular lifestyle disorders. It could be a diabetes, it could be PCOS, it could be obesity. Uh, and uh, so the report will help us to guide and give us the recommendation of proper lifestyle, proper diet. And uh, next is about disease prevention. Yes, it is. Uh, nutrigenomics gives us a preventive measure as well as curative measures. So for particular disease conditions, we have panels which helps us to you know uh, understand the disease condition and what all nutrients can helpful to uh, guide us for this kind of condition. As I gave you the example of APOE234 uh, gene. Then athlete performance. Here I have one more example to give you about one of the players. Um, um, uh, what is his name is um, Habana. Okay, uh, Brian Habana. He's a rugby player, and he was a rugby player. He still plays, and they won the World Cup in 2019. Okay, so before his World Cup, he underwent with all genetical uh, test. So here nutrigenomics was also one of the panel. He took all the panels of nutrigenomics and before the game, he understood that what kind of uh, gene he has, where, which is going to help him to give the good endurance, which is going to help him to pre and post exercise meals. You know, there are pre and post exercise meals which are consumed, which helps us to uh, uh, pump the energy and post performance meals as well. So accordingly, after knowing his reports, he went for the training, he decided his placing in the game because rugby is a very high power game. And he decided his placing, he changed the placing and similarly done with many players in his team. And finally they won the World Cup. So it helped him pre-training, post-training and post-performance as well. So there were less injuries and he was able to perform at his best. So this is about sports. We have many medical conditions as well. Okay, so Green Array Nutrigenomics has comprehensive panel of diet panel, PCOS panel, weight management, fit gen uh, genomics panel and cardiac health panel. Now, what all things you get in um, diet panel? So what could be the uh, potential to the best type of diet for you? Do you have gene that makes you more likely to have snacks in between? Do you have any vitamin deficiency? Um, is there any reason which can uh, resist the eating of certain foods? Uh, nausea, vomiting, all these things are also being covered. Uh, uncovered the inter interaction between your cholesterol and diet. So cholesterol on diet here, we also get the guidance, which oil, what oil and when to eat. So there are multiple amount of oils available in the market, uh, including cold press oil, different kind of cold press oils. So all these things, the recommendation and Im impact, which helps us to guide properly to our patients to make them understand ke how your diet and lifestyle should be. Okay, now uh, here we are going to talk a little bit about the fat metabolism. You all know that vitamin D is a, uh, uh, it is fat soluble vitamin and fat metabolism, when it comes to fat met metabolism, um, fat has, a, uh, there is a gene which helps to control your fat. And uh, this fat and, uh, yeah, one sec. Yeah. So when it comes to that particular gene and when that gene is interacted, uh, is uh, absent or uh, there is uh, there is some issue with the, that particular genes, the fat metabolism is uh, hampered at that moment. And when uh, this fat metabolism is hampered, what is the result? There is uh, sleep apnea. You will see the patient is having inflammation because that particular gene is going to uh, make you understand your energy metabolism, your fat metabolism, and when to use what kind of nutrient. So uh, which cycle is to be used? So proteins, energy, or fat, which is which uh, you need to use for energy purpose. And when it is altered, you will see the your metabolic cycles are being disturbed. 
So there are many traits in this panel, but I'm just talking about the fat metabolism because there are particular genes which affects the fat metabolism. These kind of uh, sample reports you see. Can I enlarge this? Sorry. Okay, here you will understand the metabolic cycles and your genotype, uh, what kind of uh, uh, impact it has on your uh, 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 on your body, and even it gives the proper recommendations, which helps us to understand that what kind of life lifestyle you should be having. All the reports are having good recommendations, which helps us to understand what lifestyles uh, you should be having, what kind of diet you should be having, when to exercise, and what all to you need to exercise. PCOS, so uh, this panel identifies the key genes that have an influence over your appetite, your fat storage, your fat metabolism, uh, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, and snacking habits. Yes, uh, it is seen in uh, PCOS patients that they uh, have different snacking habits and um, they uh, there is no sensitivity for particular nutrient or hunger hormone as well. Okay, uh, so how this uh, hyperinsulinemia and uh, uh, different kind of, you know, lifestyle disorders, again, are going to affect your um, life, uh, PCOS and how you get into the condition of P uh, PCOS. There is a particular gene here, IGFBP, which is uh, also helps in, uh, you know, metabolizing your fat cells, as I was mentioning about vitamin D and yeah, vitamin D and impaired glucose intolerance and fat metabolism. Here, what happens when you see an obese person, he has a good amount of fat, uh, adipose tissues. Fat is, uh, vitamin D is soluble in fat, but then you still see the vitamin D deficiency in particular patient. Here, with, the, with those particular genes, you are not able to utilize that fat for energy purpose and then this uh, vitamin D deficiency is seen and ultimately inflammation and there is hardly loss of fat uh, seen in many of the patients. I have a patient here with the example I want to tell you. I, uh, the patient tried many things like reducing the carbohydrate intake, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, intermittent fasting and even ketogenic diet he tried so when um, when it came to ketogenic diet he understood that uh, the fat is not being utilized for energy purpose she was not able she was bouncing back from particular weight like he, she was 125 and she used to come back to 118 and she used to bounce back to 125 again and here that time we went through the test and we understood that uh, there is a problem in all the metabolism uh, metabolic cycles and we need to address that first and the recommendation helped us to uh, treat the patient well these are the reports these kind of reports you get again you understand the um, genotype, you understand the impact and recommendations are given, which helps us to treat the patient well. A weight management pan panel helps you to uncover the best diet that allows you to achieve your optimal metabolism to lose weight, improve your overall health. Uh, learn about the eating behaviors. Yes, behavioral patterns are seen in different kind of uh, weight management patients. So. Uh, there are psychological factors are also responsible for this. Um, to identify these kind of genes, you need to understand the weight loss trend, you need to understand the cholesterol levels, and even the benefits of the exercise. Yeah. So, uh, these are the traits of the uh, panel, what we are covering. This kind of report you get for the weight management patient. Then we have a fitness uh, fitness panel. The fitness panel which identifies the key gene that has uh, been scientifically shown, effect of your body response to typical kind of exercise. Then uh, it even helps us to understand the injury risk of the patient and aerobic exercise, which exercise will help us, uh, which will help to the particular 
player or patient or person to uh, further understand the exercise diet pattern for the uh, for his uh, later life so um, actin 3 this genes play, plays a major role in uh, athlete in their athlete performance so uh, here uh, people must be knowing andrew steel player so Andrew Steele, uh, he's an Olympic athlete, and Greg Rutherford. So both of them, uh, they are Olympic athletes. Both of them underwent with the uh, genetical testing. So Andrew Steele underwent genetical testing after losing four times in Olympics. And when he uh, understood that he is not able to make out or he is not able to uh, give optimum to his training because he tried all the all kind of uh, practices the way the uh, you know all other athletes are doing all kind of trainings he underwent still he was not able to go to the you know 30, 40 45 second was his target he was not able to achieve that target and when he underwent with this test he uh, he got the result that the actin 3 is not the particular gene is not there uh, in his uh, you know body the the that strain was missing and that is why he was not able to perform at his best uh, similarly uh, you must have heard about the uh, circadian rhythm so what is circadian rhythm so circadian rhythm is basically uh, it it uh, you get the response of circadian rhythm uh, with your physical mental and psychological state of mind of 24 hours okay so how it works and uh, what all things are responsible so genotype is one thing which are uh, which is responsible for your circadian rhythm jet lag is one of the responsible factor and uh, then other is your mobile device light which is responsible for circadian uh, factor and it it changes your cycle so ultimately when uh, when it comes to we can change the circadian rhythm with the help of lifestyle change uh, for that person so here you you understand k when is the best time to exercise what is the best time to ex exercise after assessing the person because assessment is very important in this circadian rhythm uh, patients so we will get the good results and then uh, we will understand that how this patient can uh, uh, patient can get a good results after exercising at particular time and what exercise that person should be doing like aerobic exercise yoga what kind of training is required for that patient again this is the um, yeah this is the sample report we have uh, i was uh, actually i wanted to circulate the sample reports if we have if we can get we will circulate it in audience so that you will understand and you will be able to read the uh, report and you can see it in uh, in your hand that what all things you get in this report one last one minute please okay so uh, yes i'll go a little fast so ultimately modifiable and non modifiable factors for cvd so here uh, non modi uh, non modifiable factors we cannot change but modifiable factors are, are all related to your lifestyle and you need to make changes in these factors which will help us to uh, reduce the risk, the risk of cvd caffeine again lot much discussed here coffee is the main product and and these kind of products which has caffeine so uh, coffee has many other um, other chemicals like uh, manganese is there polyphenol is there and caffeine is one of the major factor so sip uh, a1 1f and 1a gene these are responsible so when you have sip a uh, one 1f genes that time even if you are consuming coffee four times a day uh, it is being metabolized very fast and it is other way around so people who are uh, who uh, are having that particular gene they are more prone to cardiovascular disorders and in other hand the other genes is uh, it helps to protect your heart these are the traits okay this is the case study similar to the uh, to what i told you before uh, and about the trait also we had a vo2 max 
uh, in fitness panel, I wanted to give an example of fit, uh, VO2 max. VO2 max is something uh, which helps, uh, which is related to your oxygen intake. And this oxy oxygen, uh, which ultimately converted into energy uh, in your cells. And this uh, VO2 max is uh, responsible. And it is uh, a benchmark for many of the athletes and uh, to the cardiac patients to understand the uh, uh, your uh, heart capacity and the performance and how you deal with your lifestyle. This is the case study here the patient after understanding the profile uh, understanding we un after understanding the patient's profile we were able to treat well and we were able to change the metabolic cycles and uh, and even we were able to give the good amount of prescribed good exercises to the patient so uh, to get uh, to get the patient to optimal weight and to see the ch uh, change in number of the patient's report Thank you so much. I was not able to go through it properly, but thank you so much. Thank you, madam. That was a very exhaustive report on all the how dietics affect our daily. I think uh, well-being also, not only well-being, it will affect our future health also. Yes. So, and that is the most important factor that uh, today's diet and today's exercises patterns will affect our future life and future health. Right. That is the most important message for today. And I think one more message, take home message, which we should give today that preconception folic acid and vitamins and dieting is where diet therapies are very important to reduce the abnormalities in the growing fetus. Yeah. Because there are many unplanned pregnancies in the present era. And this uh, concept of pre-pregnancy folic acid and vitamin supplementation is not still there amongst all the practitioners. We find it that gynecologists are giving it, but there are many other practitioners who need to know that three months of folic acid before conception is a very important aspect for prevention of fetal abnormalities. Thank you so much. Even one, one part about the uh, pregnancies, uh, uh, in nine months, we have different kind of diet. Every three months, every trimester, diet changes. And nowadays, what we have observed that there are different kind of, um, you know, uh, people, uh, the females ask to uh, eat something fast food. They are more inclined towards fast food. And ultimately, as I shown you this about phenylalanine, so these kind of fast food, ultimately, they are changing the DNA structure of that baby. So it affects a lot. I think that was the main reason yeah. why last year when I was the president of IMA uh, Pune, I requested Gupte sir to start an oration in such a uh, concept that we give some knowledge about how diet, genetics and even preconception health yeah. matters a lot in development of the babies. And I thank Gupte sir and Asmita Gupte madam for listening to my, uh, accepting my request. Thank you so much sir. Thank you, sir. Yes sir. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. it, it, com it combines all obesity factors ultimately because that is one of the reason of insulin resistance. And so it combines all the yeah, traits. That's it. That's it. It, it is combined. It uh, somewhere 10 K, uh, I think so. 10k about right so she will get back to you about that <coughs> yeah everyone yes it, it should be uh, for everyone because uh, as i mentioned about vo2 max for the aerobic exercise the people who are performing running kind of atle uh, athletic activity or swimming for them knowing vo2 max is very important and that should be the benchmark some of them in india we haven't there are some players they are doing the reports but yet it is not for everyone cricket is most played and loved game in india but we haven't seen any report of any of the cricketer yet i've heard about the Kohli, but i don't know Kohli, who they are say available nay, sir i would like to know more about it <laughs> yeah it is confident they are not out the way i gave you the example they are not on screen uh, so we are moving more towards individualization about everything about your health 
like PCOS, we have same treatment for all, but it will change now as per the genes yeah. for weight management, for obesity, for everywhere. We have to individualize it after this. And thank you for showing us the report because we were very much interested in knowing what kind of a report. Like if you just tell us that the genetics, this, these genes are present and these are absent, but their implications and the yeah. advice is very important. So thank you so much. Thank you so you much. You made uh, the, the concept very clear to all the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, madam. May I request Dr. Raju Variadi, sir, President IMA Pune, and Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir, to come on to the dais to felicitate, man. I request the chairpersons to join for the felicitation. Thank you. I also wish to thank the chairpersons and for their felicitation, I request Varyani Soren Gupte sir. Shede Kaka, a chair, please add. Kara. For the next session, I take this opportunity to invite to chair the session Dr. Divakar, sir, Dr. Avinash Bhundwe, sir, who is the past president of IMA Pune as well as IMA Maharashtra State, and also Dr. Arti Nimkar, madam, to join the dais, please. Dr. Nimkar, madam, is the past president of IMA Pune and she is the senior vice president of IMA Maharashtra State and is a gynecologist. I again would like to welcome Dr. Bridula Fadke, madam, who has joined online. <laughs> madam is muted, I guess. Yes. Yes. Huh. Good morning, madam. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of uh, uh, Bangalore, uh, I thank uh, uh, Sanjay Gupte, Asmita Gupte, and uh, Sajjan Shaw and team of Greener Labs for arranging this CME on uh, genetics and clinical practice along with uh, AMA Pune. So it is a good topic because genetics is involved in all the systems of the body, not only in the uh, one part, like it is more from the head to the toe, like that it may be the 
uh, related to the brain, like brain disorders or uh, psychological disorders or in the eyes as an ophthalmologist, uh, you come across a number of cases of uh, genetic disorders in the eye also. Uh, so today, uh, where with us, uh, Dr. Gwaiti Raman, who will be telling us about the uh, understanding how genetic screening uh, helps in early cancer detection. So, Dr. Gwaiti Raman is uh, uh, MD OBGYN and uh, she is uh, 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 FPA trained laparoscopist and uh, Oxy certified course advanced in laparoscopy. She's a life member of Foxy, Foxy training in basic ultrasound, co author articles in a comprehensive bulletin on safe motherhood and medical legal journal. 91, she has been MBBS and 95, she has been MBOBGN. So I request Dr. Gwaiti Venkatam to start the topic. Thank you, dignitaries on the dais. Good morning, everyone. Dignitaries of the dais, colleagues and friends. Thank you, team IMA, for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation on uh, genetic screening for cancer. At the outset, I would like to make a disclaimer. I am not a geneticist. I try to be the bridge. I'm a clinician, and I try to be a bridge between the geneticists and my patients. So please pardon me if I seem to demystify, simplify, or at times oversimplify my presentation. So what is the link between cancer and genetics? Cancer is a genetic disease caused by the changes in our genes that control the way cells grow and multiply. So during the course of cell division, if the body substitutes, adds, or subtracts information in the genetic material, variants or mutations results. Mutations in the genes which control the cell division and repair result in cancer. So what are the type of mutations? Largely, they are either germline mutations or somatic mutations. Germline mutations are those which are inherent in the body right from birth. So right from the germ cells. So they are present in all cells of the body. And somatic mutations take place after birth. So only some cells carry these mutations, and especially the ones who are likely to develop cancer. The mosaic mutations are somewhere in between. That is a newer insight, because these mutations occur in utero, but after the initial cell differentiation. So some cells might contain these mutant cells, mutant genes. So depending on the occurrence of mutation, you have a familial inheritance which is at 10% and the rest of it is acquired. The acqui acquired is because of environmental factors, aging and other lifestyle disorders. The journey from mutation to cancer decides what kinds of cancer one develops, whether it is a hereditary cancer because of inherited germline mutations or is it a sporadic cancer because of somatic mutations. The familial mutation, again, a familial cancers are a combination of both, the somatic plus the germline ones. And the cancer gene genes are largely classified into three groups, the tumor suppressor groups, the oncogenes, and the DNA repair genes. So what is the modus operandi? So the oncogenes are basically genes which control, or rather the proto-oncogenes are the genes which control normal cell differentiation, proliferation. And the tumor suppressant genes control the cell differentiation by apoptosis or uh, preventing cell uh, proliferation of abnormal cells. And the DNA repair genes, as the name suggests, repair the damaged DNAs. So when there is a mutation in any of these genes, that is when the proto-oncogenes get mutated or switched on, a mutation results, a, a malignancy results, a tumor suppressor gene, when it gets switched off, a, sub, a cancer can result. And likewise, DNA repair genes, when they are mutated, will result in a proliferation leading to cancer. So that is the role of proto-oncogenes and the anti-oncogenes, which is present in all cells of our body, in all of us. 
They are normal genes for normal cell growth and proliferation, but they have the potential to cause cancer if their expression is altered or if they are mutated. Also, there's a lot of overlap between the tumor suppressor genes and the DNA repair genes in tumor causation. So this list of inherited cancers of which, of course, the breast and the ovarian cancer caused by BRCA gene mutation is possibly the most common and most famous one. Lynch syndrome causing colorectal cancers, the Lee Romani syndrome because of the TP53 gene mutation, familial adenomatous polyposis, pute ziggers, and retinoblastoma. The main role in uh, cancer causation of inherited cancers is because of oncogene or tumor suppressor gene, that is suppression of the tumor suppressor gene or activation of the oncogene. But it's not just BRCA which causes breast cancer. In fact, just around 10% of the breast cancers are caused by BRCA, a gene mutation. There's an endless list that we can see, which have been also implicated in the causation of breast cancer. The induced cancer or the somatic cancers, the sporadic cancers are caused by carcinogens, which are physical or chemical mutagens, alcohol, smoke, ultraviolet radiation, rays, radiations, advanced age, obesity, and microbes, especially oncoviruses, and medicines like the proton pump inhibitor, and some anti-malignant drugs themselves. So now, why does a muta mutant gene cause cancer in some and doesn't in some others? Is because of this two-hit theory. Because dominantly inherited predisposition to cancer entails a germline mutation, but it, ca it causes tumorogenesis only if there is a second somatic mutation. And likewise, in non-hereditary cancers, that is the sporadic type, the same two types are required, but both hits are somatic, that is acquired or environmental. So the point to note is that even if one has a genetic predilection, environmental factors play the second but decisive hit to cause cancer. So there is where the role of predictive gene testing is for cancer. This helps in estimating our chance of developing cancer in the lifetime and then also helps in predicting further risk develop, uh, further cancer development, also the risk of passing it on to the next generation and provides information to the healthcare provider to plan. So right now, genetic tests are available for some types of cancers like the breast, ovarian, colon, thyroid, prostate, pancreatic, et cetera. So what are the advantages of carrier screening? It can predict the risk of developing cancer in self it can help in cautioning the family members, you know, to plan screening accordingly and can help take preventive steps or mitigating steps. We've all heard about the prophylactic mastectomy, oophorectomy, and then it can under undertake lifestyle changes, help in undertaking lifestyle changes. This possibly is the most important because this will help prevent the second hit, which is the decisive hit in causing cancer. So it can help plan regular screening for diagnosis like pap smears, mammography, self breast examination, et cetera. These days, pre-implantation diagnosis is also possible to help prevent it to being spread to the next generation. It can help planning resources. And of course, in deciding the treatment modality, which is appropriate for the given cancer. The community benefits by adding this to the research uh, registry and the research. There are disadvantages too. So most of it, I think most important is the psychological one of being diagnosed of having a mutant gene, which may not lead to a cancer, but that burden is psychological nevertheless, which can lead to unindicated medical interventions and therefore financial issues also. And of course, the insurance guys are always there to hype up the premium if they know that one is carrying a mutant gene. Angelina Jolie has made it world famous by going ahead with a prophylactic mastectomy because of the BRCA gene mutation. The results of these genetic carrier screening tests could be positive, negative, or variant of unknown significance. So that is why there is a role of genetic counseling in this genetic test. So these counseling covers many aspects of the testing processes, including the hereditary risk assessment, the appropriateness of the genetic testing and the potential harms, the medical implications of it all, the possibility that the test might not be informative, the psychological risks and benefits, and the risk of passing it to the 
children, the impact of testing for the family, and the best test to perform, and the specific test to perform, including the technicality of it. Now, who should be taking these tests? If uh, the people who have any or all of this or some of these, like people having family members, first degree family members with the same type of cancer, several family members having cancer, cancer before the age of 50, two or more relatives having uh, cancer, rare cancers like the male breast one, or physical characteristics which are otherwise benign, but can lead to malignancy like neurofibromas. And of course, if one is a member of a specific racial or an ethnic community known to have a heightened inherited cancer syndromes. This is a brief about the BRCA1 and 2 as to who should be taking it up. It's almost a repetition of the previous one. A special note on breast cancer in males. It's been seen that 40% of the breast cancers in males may be related to the BRCA gene mutation. And therefore, the NCCN recommends that all men diagnosed with this cancer do get the BRCA1 and 2 testing done. Important to note it as it is not just for cancer breast, but it's also for pancreatic and prostatic cancer, hence the relevance. So some more statistics regarding BRCA. So as I had mentioned previously, BRCA is responsible, uh, uh, only 10% of uh, breast cancers are caused by BRCA, but those carrying BRCA gene mutation have a very high risk, like 50% plus, 50 to 70% plus of developing CA breast and around uh, 30 to uh, 40% of ovarian cancer. And the, likewise, the risk of breast cancer in males is 10% more than those not carrying the mutation. And therefore, and also the increased risk of pancreatic and prostate cancer. And it would is a numbing thought to see, know that the incidence of BRCA gene mutation in the general population is one in 400. So you can extrapolate the numbers. And then there are, of course, some more tests, the oncoproteins and the oncoviruses, which can help in the screening process. b -onc or the oncoviruses like HPV, Epstein-Barr, hepatitis, HTLV, HHV, etc., or also have also been implicated in different malignancies. Viral genome quantification by the RT-PCR is one of the standard methods of di diagnosing viral oncogenes, and hence its role in genetic screening. The cervical cancer success story is a story which everybody knows and should be told and retold for generations to come. So it has provided an ex excellent example of the power of early detection and therefore subsequent treatment. The pap smear started the whole process. Now, because of pap smear, all of us also have got to know that HPV is the main virus causing uh, cervical cancer. <laughs> And not only that, HPV also is responsible for anorectal, oral, penile cancers, respiratory papillomas, papillomatosis, and warts. So we at Green Array have de uh, developed an HV HPV detection kit, which is which uh, diagnoses all high-risk HPV types. And of that, one of is also is a self-sampling kit, which the women can do at the comfort of their own home. This is a rather busy slide, but in summary, this basically shows the current cancer screening processes using the various methodologies and what it can benefit, I mean, who can benefit from it, in the sense, unknown primaries or people who are apparently healthy find out from this testing that, uh, yes, they do harbor a malignancy. So what are the recent advancements? Liquid biopsy. Now, liquid biopsy has the potential to become an instrumental non-invasive screening tool for solid tumors as against the presently used standard biopsy, which is invasive, can cause seeding, painful, and can be impractical. At some points, it cannot be reached also. So types of liquid biopsies are based on circulating tumor cells, circulating tumor nucleic acids and exosomes, and body fluids like uh, blood, serum, plasma, urine, CSF, saliva are used as samples. So to that extent, it is non-invasive. And it's been called the holy grail of cancer research. So the goal is to develop a blood test, such as this one, that can accurately identify cancers in their early stages. 
multi cancer early detection tests also combine the same the molecular analysis of tumor generated markers along with ai to simultaneously detect a variety of cancers they are promising tests but are to be used with caution at the moment no screening is without a debate so should it be a universal screening or a targeted screening right now one would advise a targeted screening as the approach to quote a, few, a number the estimated number of incident cases of cancer in india for the year 2022 was found to be 14 lakhs 61427 having said that these numbers of uh, these are the cancer cases diagnosed in india in 2022 of which around 10% are hereditary and human tumor viruses account for 12 to 20% of these cancers worldwide which means that at least 1.5 lakh cancers can be potentially predicted or prevented every year using genetic screening alone and in india so as i said you can extrapolate the numbers so there are, and the rest can very definitely benefit from the lifestyle changes so before signing off i would like to make a case report this is mrs tt who approached our hospital age 37 with a family history of two paternal aunts positive for cancer breast one for cancer ovary and a sister with diagnosed cancer breast so she opted to test herself for the braca mutation and tested positive for it so she went ahead with a prophylactic um, bilateral mastectomy and lo behold on hp one of the breast showed infiltrating duct carcinoma and the other benign proliferative parenchyma so she came to our hospital approach sir dr gupte to consider hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy so that's the power of screening thank you Uh, thank you for your presentation on uh, understanding how genetic screening helps in the early detection of cancer and with that we can make out and uh, take all the precautions uh, uh, to prevent the further uh, increase of cancers and uh, to change the genes uh, there is no genetic therapy has to come in the future years I think then you can alter the genes also thank you if uh, there is no history of the cancer in the family and one person finds the cancer positive how we can correlate with the uh, any mutation in the genes or yes there are tests which can test for mutations and then depending on the mutation found we can decide whether this was a hereditary mutation or a somatic mutation which has been got subsequently a sporadic mutation and then subsequently the guidance can be for the family members as to whether they need to go in for the testing or not in the next generation that's right so it is not easy. just next generation the same generation relatives same also generation. yes so with the this uh, genetic study it is very much easy to prevent diagnose and treat the cancer now yes yes at least it has given us an opportunity to do that yes 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 my brother there was cancer at age of 70 Daughter is advised beta one or beta two, right? Or not? Uh, basically, again, it will depend whether the mother is positive or not. If she has uh, got breast cancer because of any other gene, BRCA testing will not be helpful. So her the index case needs to be tested first, and then depending on the gene that she is carrying or the mutation that she is carrying, we would advise accordingly for her uh, family. Oh, they are genetic tests, so they are hundred percent accurate. But that's what I said. Carrying the mutation doesn't mean that you're going to get the disease. Mutation can be diagnosed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Please come over here. May I request President Dr. Raju Varyani sir and Dr. Gupta sir to come on to the dais to felicitate ma'am. And I request all the chairpersons to join for the felicitation. Excellent talk, ma'am.
Excellent. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, before beginning the, of the next lecture, uh, on behalf of this uh, jam-packed audience in this uh, IMA auditorium, I thank uh, IMA Pune branch and especially Dr. Sanjay Gupte and his Gupte Hospital team for organizing such a very, very important uh, CME on very, very uh, important and uh, lesser known thing in medical fraternity. Uh, the next lecture is on a very uh, important topic. It is uh, on newborn genetic screening. As you all know, traditionally in India, whenever a child is born, his parents and all grandparents, they run for the horoscopic thing. They go for arranging a horoscope. Uh, recently, I came to know that uh, this horoscope is rather uh, organized uh, after two days. But the modern genetics and of course the study of genetics has uh, given us opportunity. If you do it in first 48 hours, you get more details about the child's future, especially his health. Uh, in the first 48 hours, if you go for some this genetic screening. There are so many conditions which rather may occur in his uh, future life. Very important. There are around 50 conditions which can be sorted out in this uh, screening. Out of that, uh, phenylketonuria, congenital G6PD deficiency, cystic fibrosis, then uh, sickle cell anemia, then congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and congenital hypothyroidism, and so many uh, things can be diagnosed beforehand. And to enlighten us on this topic may i invite uh, uh, dr sarjan shah uh, to give this lecture dr sarjan shah is mbbs and md from bharti vidyapit uh, medical college in 2008 is a director of uh, green array genomics and research solutions uh, he is director of green cross pathology laboratory uh, he has attended mole molecular diagnostic courses at sgpgl lucknow and tmc calcutta uh, Paul Kata, uh, received training cytogenetics and counseling from Dr. Hema Purandare in Mumbai, uh, completed his training as NABL auditor in 2009 under Virupaksha, the pioneer of NABL in India. And again, when NABL was upgraded uh, in 2017, he did his uh, uh, rather training at Zydus Hospital. Right now, he is serving as consultant pathologist and NABL auditor, deputy quality manager since 2008, and now the deputy technical manager as well. He uh, is associated with Help Voluntary Blood Bank as a quality manager and technical manager under NABH since 2009, and he has, which has become the first private blood bank in Gujarat to receive NABH accreditation. He has presented uh, more than 100 speeches in uh, CMEs and research papers in Academia Journal. May I request uh, Dr. Sarjan Shah to uh, start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Dr. Sarjan Shah. I am the director at Green Array Genomics in Pune. And the uh, topic we are discussing today is newborn genetic screening. So what every couple and family wants after their baby gets delivered at Gupta Hospital? that the baby should be healthy and hearty and they should have a great life. So when I was making this presentation, India's population was 1220 million. And thanks to hospitals like Gupta Hospital, it is approaching 1500 million. And the birth rate is around 20.6. <clears throat> so every day, 30,000 newborn babies are born. Incidence of neonatal disorder is one in thousand. Thus, every day, 30 newborns in India are having some or the other kind of disorder. Individually, these disorders are very rare, but when they are clubbed together, the incidence is one in 1000. Still, in India, we don't have a good NBS disor newborn disorder prevention program in India. So what is newborn screening? Newborn screening is the process of testing newborn babies for treatable genetic endocrinological, metabolic, and hematological disorders 
the goal is to identify the newborn at risk for treatable disorders traditionally focused on disorders with effective early treatment now how did it all start well as you can see this gentleman called robert guthrie he is also known as the father of newborn screening now he had a intellectually disabled child and his physician friend asked him that he is suspecting phenylketonuria as madam discussed in the earlier presentation and uh, at that time in us in 1964 this was so in us also there was only one lab in california and they had to send the sample all the way there so he asked him if he can develop some kind of test and he actually did develop a test called bacteria inhibition test and fortunately or unfortunately the his son was negative but his niece became positive so then he uh, you know made it his mission that i have to put newborn screening panel into practice and he also devised a filter paper system for collection and transportation of this small blood sample. And that is also known as Guthrie's card. So aptly, he is the father of newborn screening. This was back in 1964. Now, as we can see the milestones in newborn screening, as Sir said, the first screening panel was started in 1984 with six disorders in their mind which were congenital hypothyroidism, galactosemia, PKU, then G6PD deficiency, and maple syrup urine disease. Then eventually in 2001, congenital adrenal hyperplasia was added. In 2002, mass spectrometry came into picture, which is a sort of a technology which divides proteins into a single panel and identifies the test. So it became a second tier confirmatory system in 2002. And as in how the diseases were discovered, there were high incidence of newborn disorders, the panel became bigger and bigger. And as Sir said, it became about 50 disorders in mass spectrometry. So till 2018, this mass spectrometry was used as a confirmatory panel. But due to lots of false positives and false negatives, genetic testing was started. And in 2023, all the developed countries like USA, Australia, Europe, they are all using genetic testing for newborn disorder detection. In 1968, Wilson devised a criteria that what diseases should be there in this panel. And I feel they are still relevant. The first was condition should be an important health problem. The test should be acceptable to the population. Disease does not manifest at birth or routine examination. Treatment will prevent mortality and morbidity. Delay in diagnosis will cause irreversible damage and screening should be cost effective. Indian Pediatric Association also came into picture and they published their, according to them, what should be the three categories for newborn screening panel testing. So category A, they said that screening should be done for congenital hypothyroidism and hearing and it should be a must in Indian scenario. Then screening for congenital adrenal hyperplasia and G6PD deficiency should be added in a phased manner. And as we all know that G6PD is seen more in northern states, so that is mandatory there. And screening of sickle cell anemias and hemoglobinopathies should be there in pockets of high incidence. Category B was for high risk screening. Screening for the disorder should be conducted in high risk population like consanguineous marriage, previous child with unexplained intellectual disability, seizure disorders, previous unexplained sibling deaths, critically ill neonates, and newborn children with symptoms, signs, or investigation suggestive of inborn error of metabolism. And category C screening was for in source rich settings where laboratory is available, transportation is easily possible, and there it should be done for 30 to 40 metabolic disorders. Now, why screening is important? This again is a very busy slide, but we have mentioned here all the different disorders. And if it is not screened, the baby will be, uh, uh, there'll be a developmental delay in intellectual disability will be seen. There can be neurological damages, seizures can occur. As we are aware, hemoglobinopathies will require multiple blood transfusions and even death can occur. And when the, all the babies are screened for neonatal disorders and neonatal disorders are identified, then most will stay alive most will have a good life uh, there will be less chances of mental retardation intellectual disabilities they can have a normal life with fewer metabolic crises as compared to an undiagnosed patient 
who should avail this test ideally every newborn should undergo this test so that many congenital disorders can be diagnosed early and the incidence will again become shorter if all are screened for that this will help in early treatment measures and prevent some important disorders of which severely affects baby's health and progress now what are the types of newborn screening the blood spot screening which is done in a laboratory a hearing screening which determines if a newborn is deaf or hard of hearing pulse oximetry to rule out uh, heart heart conditions cns ultrasound is usually done for newborn babies who are preterm now what are the types of laboratory newborn screening one is a conventional type which include immunoassays elisa methods mass spectrometry and hplc and there are genetic screening which is by sanger sequencing which is the gold standard and next generation sequencing which will have panels for neonatal screening now what is the kind of sample we'll be able to use so it will be a dry blood spot as you can see from the image a hill prick or an earlobe prick sample can be taken and uh, those sample will be put on five or three or uh, round circles which are present on dry blood spot or a guthrie's card as i mentioned earlier a cord blood can also be taken <clears throat> with the help of gupte hospital we have actually uh, identified how to take the sample we train the doctors how to take the sample so we get baby sample properly and we have validated this system so in a way for a baby it becomes a non invasive technique and of course first void urine sample will also have a lot of dna so that also can be taken now what is conventional nbs conventional nbs primarily detects levels of amino acids acyl carnitine and biochemical markers that it detect congenital disorders samples are run in batches and results can be achieved in a week any positive needs to be reconfirmed again with a second sample and eventually with a genetic test by new next generation sequencing or sanger sequencing and it should be done between 48 to 72 hours it is a very time dependent test because all the reference ranges for that are time dependent the clsi guidelines suggest that nbs conventional nbs should be done at birth at 48 to 72 hours <clears throat> also 28 days after birth or discharge from hospital whichever is earlier in case of preterm baby and do not opt for nbs if blood transfusion is given there'll be because there will be mixing of blood of the donor as well <clears throat> what are the types of conventional panel so basically they are divided into six uh, divided into two one is a basic panel and another is an expanded panel so basic panel will have six disorders which usually in the world are congenital hypothyroidism congenital adrenal hyperplasia g6pd galactosemia biotinidase deficiency and pku an expanded screening will have around 50 disorders which include the metabolic disorders endocrinal disorders hemoglobinopathies now what are the demerits of conventional nbs firstly as i said it is time dependent it has to be done between 48 to 72 hours why it is to be done between 48 to 72 hours because after breastfeed the baby's metabolic system awakens and there is a a huge uh, progress of those amino acids in the blood so just after breastfeed if you take it lot of amino acids will even if they are deficient there will be a jump in their level and of course the stress of birth process will also add to it it is important to adhere to the recommended time frame for obtaining newborn screening tests because the cutoff values for screening analytes are set to reflect values expected at this age range now there are chances of a lot of false positives if a baby is given total parental nutrition preterm babies low birth weight babies artifacts like if there are blood clots present then it can interfere with the results even some antibiotic also interferes with the protein false negatives can occur because of weather conditions so this was very interesting that if the blood is getting transported from the hospital to the lab and it's an extremely heat uh, condition in a summer it temporarily deactivates the galactose enzyme and so when the uh, blood sample reaches the lab and we test it it will show a deficiency but it is actually not a true deficiency and these cutoff values are not demography based so we are using the same values usa is using the same values australia is using the same values even africa is using the same values 
so if early collection is done then false positive can be seen in hypothyroidism cases and cah cases false negatives can occur in amino acidopathies and organic acid disorders so many potentially treatable conditions cannot be detected in infants using current newborn screening conventional methods like cystic fibrosis sickle cell disease and severe combined immunodeficiency you have to go for genetic testing in these cases and sickle cell scid we know that incidence is increasing day by day most of these disorders result from genetic mutation and could in principle be diagnosed shortly after birth only with genetic screen so coming to next generation sequencing in nbs ngs embraces the same concept as nbs to be predictable preventive and personalized as i mentioned here we are detecting the genes and not the metabolites even asymptomatic babies at birth can also be diagnosed many more genetic conditions can be diagnosed with this and it is time independent it can be done in newborns it can be done in children it can be done at adolescents also so greenaler lab has developed a cost effective newborn genetic screening panel of 47 genes using next generation sequencing to screen this as per indian scenario so we need to look into what is common in india there is no point in discovering a test which is very common in usa and not in india that is just wastage of resources so all the conditions of metabolic disorders hemoglobin disorders congenital hearing loss and endocrine disorders are covered in this short panel so these are the 34 disorders which we cover it covers the complete gene of the panel so not even a single mutation is missed even a novel mutation can be identified in this case and management and treatment strategies are available for this we also have a larger panel of more than 350 genes covering more than 400 disorders so as i mentioned in short panel all other disorders covered are renal disorders congenital heart disorders pediatric cancer disorders there are disorders for vision loss hemoglobin disorders epilepsy disorders neuromuscular disorders immunodeficiency disorders are also covered and management strategies are available for most of the cases so when we compare ngs and conventional nbs conventional nbs will give you at that moment what the child is suffering from it is like a blood test that what is happening in the blood at that time what are the metabolites which are rising at that time and genetic screening will give you the idea about what the baby is suffering today tomorrow or day after so an example of this is a very long chain acyl coa dehydrogenase deficiency which can either present in infancy with a severe cardiomyopathy multi organ failure leading to death or in an individual who starts exercising and presents in adolescence with rhabdomyolysis so there are two different presentations according to the mutations involved the gene rearrangement in that particular baby which can only be detected by genetic screening coming to the comparative analysis between both the methodology are different the disorder there are larger number of disorders which are covered with genetic screening the detection is at gene level so confirmation is not required the test interpretation gives you an idea of predisposition also all of us are aware about beta thal trait and beta thalassemia major so we can identify the traits also so by that we can identify that what will the baby suffer in future how you can plan your pregnancies in next pregnancies you can go back and test the parents also you can go back and test as gayatri ma'am suggested the family also those disorders can be identified in the family as well now the most burning question india will ask is kitne mein padega so the potential benefits of early diagnosis timely treatment and finding out the whole family tree tendencies will outweigh right now the cost ben cost a little higher cost of genetic screening but as we all are aware that when covid started it used to cost the single test used to cost us 5000 right now it is less than 500 so as a, more people will come into this the costing will go down now as i discussed ngs can be used as an adjunct or as a first line test as an adjunct it will clarify the borderline biochemical screening results it will improve the prognostic utility of those conventional nbs results it will pinpoint those screen positive patients where clinical intervention is needed and it will prevent the unnecessary medicalization and when it is used as a first line treatment timely rare disease diagnosis 
which will prevent the cost and distress to the family and an extensive diagnostic ODC can be prevented. It also gives you a reproductive decision idea that what you need to plan for future pregnancies and of course the timely treatment. Coming to few cases we have seen at Green Array, a healthy baby was born to a normal non-consanguineous couple and couple opted for a genetic screening. We found a GJB2 gene mutation, which is for deafness. And you know, usually we see that all the babies who are deaf, they cannot hear any sound. So they cannot speak also at the same time. But now science has come to this, that language therapy, speech therapy, if you identify the mutation and a deaf child and you give this treatment, they do develop speech. It's not that a deaf child will always be deaf and dumb. It is not like that now. There are therapies available which can be started. So only a genetic screening will help in early detection and management of congenital disorders like this. Case two, this was a consanguineous couple and they opted naturally for newborn screening. And we found out a BTD gene mutation in this case. Now BTD gene is for biotin days. Biotin, biotin is an enzyme which has to convert into a free form by an enzyme called biotin days. So if it is not available, biotin is no use. And biotin is most essential for fat, protein and carbohydrate metabolism. It's a small vitamin, but it is very essential for all the metabolites. And we find out that in two months time, the baby's biotinidase levels in a laboratory showed less value. And immediately the baby was started on biotin supplement. So he had, he will have a normal life now, other than identifying later that should have started biotin. And because of that, there are malnutrition and neurological damages. So newborn genetic screening helps in on-time medical intervention for the baby and also help the couple to get themselves screened before planning for next pregnancy. Now, this was a very interesting case. A healthy baby was born to a normal non-consanguineous couple with an elder sibling with two episodes of seizures after one year and mild developmental delay. So the couple opted for newborn screening. Newborn screening revealed a ACADM gene mutation. This condition can have a disease onset within one to three years of age and shows varying penetrance. So it will not show at birth, but it will come up later in life. Therefore, the condition might get missed by a conventional NBS window frame of 48 to 72 hours. If not detected on time, this can lead to developmental issues and failure to thrive. After finding the three year old sibling of this baby was also tested by Sanger. So after doing the panel, we can identify the mutation that single mutation can be done on Sanger sequencing. So as we knew the previous baby was positive for this particular mutation, we immediately <coughs> checked for the baby who was three year old and found the similar homozygous mutation. So and after we found out this, it showed an elevated level of an octanoyl carnitine acid. So that was the defect in the baby. But since the same mutation was there in both, we could identify this mutation and then the family was also tested for this. Newborn genetic screening helps in early detection in the newborn and identifying the similar genetic conditions in siblings which could have outgrown as the child matures. Now these were the cases. Now what government of India has been doing for this? So there were three uh, programs were started in 2007, 2008 and 2012 with different disorders in mind by the government, but due to political reasons, none were continued. Abhi Modi hai, to mumkin hai. So government of India started something called Rashtriya Bal Suraksha Karyakram with four Ds in mind. That was early detection, disease identification, deficiencies, developmental delays and disabilities. So they trained the ASHA workers because you have to go to each villages and find out these disorders. So ASHA workers were trained how to identify these disorders at birth and also to do the follow up of this child till adolescence. So idea was to identify the rare diseases. National health policy also mentioned the same in 2017. And now a new draft which is added for national policy for rare diseases in 2021 will be added into the national health policy, uh, which has following things in it to review the national policy for treatment of rare disorders, to define rare diseases in India, to draft national policy for rare diseases, to suggest vision and strategy in countries' context. And the very important point in this is a compensation of up to 20 lakh for any newborn disorder diagnosed baby. 
So in summary, NBS is not simply a test for diagnosing a disorder, but a coordinated comprehensive system that is consisting of other aspects also like education of the society, follow up of abnormal results and confirmation, diagnosis, treatment, management, periodic outcome evaluation, quality assurance, and evaluation of the whole program for a good newborn health. So let them plan these things, you know, like waking up at 3 a.m. for no reason and just crying, rather than worrying about their health. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarjan Shah, for completing a lecture in given time, accurately, even a few seconds uh, before. Yeah. I would like to ask uh, one very simple uh, and a very important question that uh, what is the accuracy in this diagnosis, percentage of accuracy in this? Uh, Sir, that is why the NGS panel is almost 99.99% because it will only the pre-analytical errors can give a rise to any issues. Otherwise, it is uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, bang on because here we are looking for gen genes and not metabolites. Like actually, when we look back, the conventional newborn screening is hardly 50 to 70% effective. And you have to re keep retesting the samples to confirm it and again go back to genes. But once genes have been identified, there are no chances of it being negative. Yes, you have worked in NABL, you must be aware of it. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. But uh, uh, how do you uh, differentiate uh, the false positive and false negative test in all this? You have to do the genetic screening. Uh, in new newborn genetic screening, there are no chances of false positives and negatives, but the conventional biochemical ones, which uh, shows you a lot of false positives for the what I all mentioned the timing and everything is very important. That is why all the developed countries have shifted to it because there the costing is not that bigger issue and they are covered. So uh, that is why they have gone to genetic testing. Uh, if we can take uh, one or two questions, which are very important. Yes. Correct, correct. Yes, because we are identifying fetal cells and identifying the genetic test out of it. That so there, yes, absolutely. That is why we have validated it uh, at the hospital and now we are asking others also to join. Because parents don't want their newborn baby to be pricked on heel and ear lobe and everybody will have a resistance to it. So that is why we are looking for a non, as far as non-invasive uh, process to do the test. For the NBS, you said that the 78, 48 to 72, 48 to 72 hours. hours, yes. And uh, in cord blood, there is a stress of the liver. Right, right. So sampling is correct that time? Ma'am, for genetic blood. testing, it is correct at birth, but not blood for the conventional is, NBS, yeah. which is used right now. For that, it shouldn't be done at birth. So we have to train the, who is collecting the blood. Absolutely. Not after the breastfeeding. Not of the, even crying of the baby. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So we we have prepared a pre-analytical guideline In for newborn screening. So uh, whosoever is collecting it, we actually go there. Our uh, scientists go there and explain the criteria, how to take it, when to take it, things like that. Like NBS, is there any genetic sampling timing? Is not really. We can take it any time. That that is why genetic screening starts with that umbilical cord. You know, then you can take it any time. Yes. 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 And uh, like we are diagnosing the abnormal genes and uh, conditions, but nowadays we are seeing that the milestones of the baby are very fast. Yes. Is there any reasoning for that? For fast milestones, uh, we fast have to milestones. check. For delayed, we have a panel, but for fast, <laughs> we have to check. <laughs> Nobody has complained so far, so. <laughs> but it is difficult. I have two daughters, so I know what you are saying. So absolutely. Yeah, we are seeing that baby are growing very fast. They are turning on the uh, abdomen. It's the influence yeah. Of yeah. yeah. It's the competitive environment, <laughs> probably. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> As uh, the antibiotics and other medicines, if rather other things are given. Uh, yeah, the blood should not be collected after that. Is yes. there any effect of uh, the vaccines uh, uh, which are given at birth? Like, I am I'm not yeah. aware of, sir. As far as the it is not mentioned, yeah. Yes, vaccines I am not aware, but yeah, antibiotics, like, yes, there are publications on that. Previously, we used to give oral polio okay. and even the uh, yeah, PCG is given. So, is there any effect? It is not. 
we'll find out we'll find out thank you yes thank you dr surgeon please come over here may i request yes uh, so, sir, uh, this is a uh, Actually, uh, I want to ask this in case of kind of leukemia and all that. So, is there any way to detect it? In, um, yes, of course, we have a hereditary cancer panel. So, that also can be done so at work. So, when there is no family history or anything else, still, still, still we can do it. So, there are a lot many tests so available. Advanced, uh, of this, that panel is present, maybe it's some parents. Yes, in that 400 so, disorders we have included, uh, we have included pediatric cancers also. So most of the common pediatric cancers are included in the bigger panel, not in the smaller panel because the incidence is that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Anytime, anytime. Yes. May I request Dr. Varyani sir, Dr. Gupte sir, Dr. Sanjay Patil sir and Dr. Naurange sir also to join for the felicitation and all chairpersons to join please. Yes sir. Hello, Dr. Gupta sir doesn't need any uh, introduction, but it is my privilege to introduce him. So we'll skip that because so that we won't keep uh, Madam waiting. Huh? Otherwise, we'll <laughs> okay. be okay. delaying okay. the oration. No, it's okay. You know, I'm here around, no problem. You know, so, yeah, introductions are not important. It is his greatness. So already I have on the first slide. So don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great to. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much for being here in such a large numbers. And that shows the interest of everybody in this, you know, uh, new science that's coming in. And I think in years to come, and I'm glad a lot of youngsters are also here that we are all going to talk about only about genomics and nutrigenomics, pharmacogenomics, and most important, the later that you have one very important topic, and that's uh, um, by uh, Dr. Dake Parker, and that is uh, you know, the microbiome, you know, so these are the things that we are going to have in future discussing, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, in detail, and I'm sure uh, you will take it up, you will take interest, there are so many good books now available, even, you know, uh, colloquial uh, uh, in literature also. Uh, one book that uh, you may I may suggest to you read is called as you know hacking Darwin you know that's a wonderful book that gives us idea about what's going to happen in this field in uh, next year the whole scenario is going to change completely and everywhere you go right from you know as you will see uh, the all babies will be having their genetic testing so you will have your genome on your pen drive all along and every single thing that you do even if you go for aptitude for uh, your scholastic aptitude your you know the children will go for this athletic aptitude whether to go for a marathon or go for uh, sprinting and all this and this is all going to depend even when somebody goes for uh, a job you know people are going to see the you know uh, the job and see whether what kind of risk taking uh, things are there insurance policies will depend on that your driving license also may depend on that and that's not something i'm imagining and telling you this is the british government's you know official expert panel report and it's available on uh, you know uh, uh, web everywhere and this is what they predict 
is going to happen so genetics is a total revolution just like you know atom came and the bytes you know uh, came and uh, you know atom at the atom, atom bomb and this thing then the bytes came and we had the you know computer revolution this is the next revolution happening in front of us and that's why every one of us and as clinicians as uh, you know doctors and people in this field we are the ones who are, need to lead this revolution and that's why everyone has to take you know interest in uh, you know this uh, particular field and i welcome dr pinkre he has come, come all the way from you know uh, mumbai uh, as you know he's a very very important person in IMA, is the former uh, state president and my mmc colleague so uh, dr pinkre wonderful to have you now we have obviously less time for this talk and so i'm going to go a little faster in this so as i said we don't want uh, madam Parke uh, waiting so these are the reasons why we need to do uh, the testing in uh, you know uh, reproductive medicine causes of infertility genetic diseases transmissible to offspring optimization of assisted reproductive te technology the ART technology and of course investigations in case of repeated pregnancy loss 65 percent of the time we are able to diagnose why the you know the cause of infertility but that means in 35 percent we just label it as unexplained infertility and that's why we need this uh, genetic testing to come in so and this is a summary slide but let's go directly to the male infertility you take it pre-testicular testicular or post-testicular in any situation the uh, genetic testing becomes important the genes play a role and more than 200 genetic disorders have been uh, decided or are seen in OMIM it's OMIM is an atlas where you see you know all these genetic disorders um, displayed and details of that and again these are you know uh, free software or free this thing uh, databases available on website for all of us so everything is now available out there for us to study is the matter that whether we have the inclination to you know do so so, so genes can interfere in male infertility again in gonadal development gonadotropin action uh, gametogenesis uh, organ uh, malformation and sexual behavior so there are uh, chromosomal aberrations, there are partial chromosomal aberrations and monogenetic diseases. In whole chromosomal aberrations, we, uh, there are almost one to two percent. And so, you know, uh, as Madam was just saying, the things are changing, and we see that male infertility is increasing tremendously. And I think we have to look at it uh, very carefully because you see now oligo uh, oligospermia and azospermia patients coming up very very frequently for and i think that's a lot, a lot of lifestyle issues are involved in that and that's something uh, we need to uh, you know, look at also so uh, commonly done i'm not going to go into the details of the test because you already you know uh, uh, heard that in some of the uh, first lectures and you will be again hearing in the uh, next lectures but when you have a patient of you know, azospermia or severe, you know, uh, oligospermia or asthenozospermia. These are the, uh, you know, tests that we have to carry out the partial chromosomal aberration for uh, AZF. AZF means azospermia uh, factor, which is on Y chromosome. And again, this can be seen in detail and we can find out the cause of why the patient is having that uh, oligospermia or azospermia and so on. So uh, these are again the test polymerase, uh, test you know ch chain reactions, multiplex, uh, PCR, and so on, which are utilized for these particular uh, testing. Single mutations are also there, and single mutations are again important because you know CFTR gene is famous, though it's not so common in India, but we have other common genes, AR gene mutation, and we'll discuss some cases regarding this and how that affects you know in uh, in a treatment. Uh, modalities also so let's start with the case first the 32 year old male patient diagnosed with severe oligospermia the patient's physical examination all profile was normal in fact karyotyping uh, karyotype and y chromosome micro deletion test was also uh, normal had no particular history of infection congenital anomalies or iatrogenic uh, injuries 
so was referred to for uh, gene mutation test and when we did the gen, gene mutation test we found out that there was a you know uh, a mutation homozygous truncating variant mutations in exon 6 a particular i won't go into the details of name but that regulates the spermatogenesis so at least in the, these kind of patients we are able to pinpoint why, what the cause is and what we can expect, you know, otherwise these patients, as we all know, keep on, you know, growing from pillar to post and taking all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, treat, uh, treatments and hoping that, you know, they will get some uh, benefit out of that, waste a lot of time in that and then finally, uh, uh, you know, end up in going for um, various ART techniques at very late at uh, infertility level. So, it's diagnosing accurately and properly does make a difference. This is another case. This patient had um, obstructive azospermia and absence of vas deference. And we know when absence of vas deference is there, the generally the CFTR gene is mutated. This gene has also to do with cystic fibrosis. And as uh, uh, expected in this particular patient, we found that CFTR gene mutation was there. Now, why this is important? then what will happen what treatment do we go for in this patient with a you know can we connect you know do something um, to, to sort of replace the was or directly do nowadays techniques like tesa are available and we can collect the uh, uh, sperms from the testes directly and do the ivf so the, all these possibilities are there if we diagnose accurately and properly a lot of time is saved a lot of money is saved for the patients and you know the treatment becomes quite timely so this is again an important guess now this is something we always feel in genetics or we are diagnosed the mutation so what do we do with that you know usually there is no cause so this is one uh, you know test uh, in uh, test now which is run fairly when you have all the hormone levels normal but still there is severe oligospermia or you know, sometimes even uh, you know uh, the uh, azospermia and you do this fhr fshr uh, mutation testing if it is you know uh, comes positive then it's possible to use I'm not saying in 100% cases, but if you, you know Dr. Rupin Shah, who is a famous you know, andrologist from Mumbai, he has done a lot of studies on that. And when you use this HMG uh, injections in these patients, there are uh, you know, advantages and you find that the uh, patient gets uh, better results. So it's not that always these are untreatable diagnoses. No, sometimes they are very much treatable diagnoses also. So this is what was done in this patient and we found that actually the sperm count improved in this particular patient. Now, most recent, and this is, I find very exciting. And as I said, we'll be talking about, you know, microbiome in the, the afternoon. We saw many patients who are having absolutely no so-called normal semen. You know, I mean, uh, all usual parameters are done under microscope and uh, everything, even uh, you know, uh, the sperm culture or semen culture is done in routine manner and found to be absolutely normal. But some patients can you know, have pregnancies and the others don't. And why this happens, so, you know, we went into the detail of the analysis and found there is now something called as microbiome and there is something called a semen microbiome. That means there are thousands of good and bad bacteria in the semen itself. And if we are able to diagnose or and find out what these bacteria are, whether they're good or bad bacteria, whether there is now, again, I'm sure Dr. Dake Falker will tell you about what is dysbiosis, um, disturbed balance of these bacteria. And if we can find that out, then there is a possibility that we can correct it and in that so-called unexplained uh, infertility, we can treat and achieve pregnancies. So this is these are the kind of reports that uh, we generate. You know, thousands of bacteria are identified. There are some you know uh, good strains. There are some you know bad strains. For example, Prevotella is known to be a, a, a bad strain. But now these are not just single bacteria to be identified. There are various strains, and that's why we have to go and uh, you know actually diagnose them by next generation sequencing this is something not you can do by culture and all but if you do this uh, and you find that various um, you know different type of bacteria are there then the challenge becomes how do we change this and that's a bigger challenge 
there is no final answer to it but we have seen in many patient a proper lifestyle changes and that's why you know what happens in infertility patients many times only the female is blamed you know she doesn't conceive i'm sure you heard of the families you know even second marriages third marriages by the husband but the husband is obese he is drinking he is having a terrible you know lifestyle and still the wife because his semen report is so called normal and you know that's why the wife is always blamed so now we have to actually act on this and make sure that the you know uh, the males also take onus of this improve their lifestyle diet and then we can achieve results in many such patients so now we go on to the uh, female uh, infertility again has been discussed there is a huge role in premature ovarian failure pcos pcos cases we know that are increasing to the extent now they are almost 18 to 20% in um, practice again because of uh, you know lifestyle issues and the junk diet that starts right from the um, chi you know childhood so uh, various chromosomal abnormalities in females can be found again i will not go into the detail for the shortage of in you know, a time then genetic testing in female infertility is done by karyotype fragile x dna testing next generation sequencing and single cell testing and we find these single cell the single gene mutations also in these cases this will be they will guide us towards what is the exact diagnosis in that particular patient and whether it's treatable or whether we do need to do or take some other measures for that so again as i said let's not go into the technical details of the, uh, you know this because i as i see there are not only gynecologists many other branch um, people are there but so uh, if we can go directly to the cases and i think that makes it a little more interesting so a 27 year old female with no family history of any genetic disease was diagnosed with primary amenorrhea expressed concern about her inability to conceive then physical examination was normal slightly elevated or rather elevated fsh levels 40 uh, uh, was uh, per ml um, diagnosed with primary amenorrhea uh, since 23 years of age a karyotype analysis for both the partners was normal they were referred for chromosomal uh, microarray analysis to see whether a chromosomal abnormality was the cause of the infertility it was found that she had definitely change or you know these uh, the various mutations or changes that are called as deletions and you know uh, additions or gains and that was found and so crucial etiology for premature ovarian failure was seen in this patient. Now, this is where again, the role of a, a genetic counselor comes in or a clinician comes in to decide now what, how to go about it. She's only 27 uh, uh, years old patients so far. So what do we do with her? But we are not going to get her eggs if she's already having you know premature ovarian failure so whether to go for donor eggs in her case which is possible and feasible or if we get this idea much before maybe if she would have been tested much before for this genetic testing maybe whenever the eggs were at that time uh, you know available if at all then could have been frozen and kept and so on so this is something that we'll have to think for the future that whether we start you know actually uh, testing this uh, the patients earlier you know in this situation so again a second case 35 year old female presented with primary infertility you know the genetic test of patient revealed atosomal uh, dominant heterozygous missions you know variant so again genetic testing can identify uh, the cause of disease and we can decide our further management accordingly fortunately since now uh, all these art techniques are available and you know donor eggs and all are possible uh, or even surrogacies are possible so all these issues can be tackled in a different manner so genetic diseases are also transmissible to the offspring and we've been talking about ngs and you know the hereditary cancers and so on and so forth there are so many others almost 2000 genetic disorders now have been identified and that's why it's important now and the time will come i'm pretty sure pretty soon that 
the young couples will undergo preconception uh, you know carrier screening if not before marriage carrier screen which happens in israel because they have a lot of tay sachs uh, you know de uh, disease also so there are diagnostic options in this pgt and pnd that is you know invasive prenatal diagnosis we know we do by uh, you know cvs or korean villa sampling or we also do by m can do by amniocentesis but now non invasive tests are available and as of course all the gynecologists and obstetricians do know but for you know other branches at after 10 weeks any time we can draw mother's blood and there is cell free dna available of the baby in the mother and we can test that dna and then rule out you know many of the conditions especially you know trisomy th you know 13 18 21 and any sex chromosome anomalies also can be uh, uh, looked at so one of the uh, you know case studies non sanguineous couple in their 30s this is one of the you know, recent cases that we uh, encountered the first child had delayed milestones convulsions in moderate mr and low uh, glucose mr is a and a total exosomalinase level child passed away at the age of two years and was diagnosed as lysosomal enzyme uh, a disease and uh, to be specific it was diagnosed as sandop disease and now this couple she is a relative of a doctor came recently for now what further what are they going to do further and this is where again the you know testing helps so in this baby fortunately they had found out that there is a variation in hexb gene and that's why the couple underwent you know carrier screening and it was found that husband and wife were both carriers for same variant of xhb gene but this gene is a autosomal recessive gene that's why they were not suffering any obviously symptoms but that means there was a possibility of 25 percent of uh, you know, having uh, send off disease in their further ch child and that's why again here we either can do uh, allow them to have next pregnancy and test is during uh, prenatal period at third month itself to find out whether uh, that gene is present or by amniocentesis in uh, around 15 16 weeks or we can you know we can tell them to go for pgta and that is you know testing uh, creating the many embryos uh, as we do for ivf and testing the embryos for this particular gene and then deciding uh, this thing so rather than it's pgtm rather than pgta so what are these differences we'll discuss uh, in short so this is a uh, various indications where we undergo uh, advice these testings Again, I think theoretical testing will not do, but PGTA, the embryos now can be tested for aneuploidies, for monogenic diseases that we just discussed, and uh, structural uh, re rearrangement also. And now, even non invasive PGTA is available. That means the embryo which is grown in culture fluid, that fluid can be tested to see whether that embryo can be, uh, you know, so actually embryo biopsy is not uh, required in such situations. Now the final part in last five minutes because we, uh, we, as I said we are not going to delay the oration. So uh, there are now many many cases. For, again, for various reasons we get so many of the repeated miscarriage case, you know patients and BOH patients nowadays. And the, let's not go into the details. But most of the times we are not able to find, you know pinpoint the cause. Why? Because in 50% of the time, uh, the cause is genetic and we need genetic studies in uh, these cases. So these tests will help us in identifying genetic causes, give, uh, tailoring the treatment to the, uh, the patient situation, reducing emotional stress, because once she comes to know at least that the baby was genetically abnormal and that's why miscarriage occurred, at least, you know, they're kind of, it's a closure situation that you know they don't blame um, themselves for doing something wrong or eating something wrong or the uh, you know mother-in-law doesn't law, you know blame the, uh, the daughter-in-law for doing something wrong and all that so uh, in rpl also there is a huge role the poc is important that is nowadays it's advised that for every single miscarriage this product of conception uh, uh, should be done it used to be difficult before because in miss, missed abortions where the baby is already you know uh, not viable 
it couldn't be done because cytogenetics or cell culture couldn't be done and karyotyping could not be done. But with now microarray testing, even in missed abortions, it's possible to find out the cause why you know this uh, particular miscarriage occur and what we could do can do about it later on. So uh, genetic test uh, testing can be used as diagnostic tool also in RPL and later on, as we'll see, it can be used as. Uh, um, a, a therapeutic tool also. So POC, as I said, should be done. Then parental te genetic testing. If you just do the uh, testing of that particular uh, child or conceptance, that's not enough because you have to find out where that problem came from. And that's why the parents are also have to be tested in, in these repeated plans. Many times you find a cause and accordingly you can decide how to go about treating them. So there are single gene defects which can be uh, identified in, uh, in uh, these patients. And there can be immunological defects then you know what what usually are there there are two simple causes of you know repeated pregnancy loss or miscarriages one type of cause is basically a genetic cause where there is something genetically wrong with the embryo the second cause of course is immunogenic cause mainly because the from mother's side they, that embryo is not accepted and then from then you can go in the subgroups and find out whether why why this is so and uh, you know, diagnose and, and decide. So there are thromboembolic gene defects. In India, in our, in our patients, somehow we have found the thromboembolic test or thrombophilia testing when it is done, we have found that this plasminogen activator inhibitor is comparatively quite common in our situations compared to any Western literature that uh, we come across. For example, in Western literature, factor V laden will be common, but we find this plasminogen activator, and then there are treatments for this and can be uh, taken care of. And that's why we should be doing all these uh, tests. I think I'll go directly to the case study. A non consanguineous couple presented with a history of RPL with unknown cause. Genetic analysis of product of conception was not done in their case. A couple was advised to go for uh, you know, karyotyping. The male partner uh, had uh, revealed that balanced chromosomal translocation was there. Now this balanced chromosomal translocation is uh, tricky because you can diagnose it only by karyotyping and not by you know even uh, other advanced uh, tests. But once you have that diagnosis, you can decide what should be done, whether they should take a chance and you go for PG, uh, you know, T8 uh, uh, karyotyping of the embryo later on, or advise, you know, donor sperms and donor uh, semen use in the next pregnancy. So these uh, kind of cases, you know, again, the next case, a couple with normal karyotype at three miscarriages during 10 to 14 weeks of pregnancy, product of conception, karyotyping and analysis for last miscarriage was normal. Again, the microarray testing was done and uh, uh, problem was seen and microarray test helped in identifying the cause of miscarriages and then it can guide us for the further uh, treatment in that particular um, patient also. So the panel that we have now, RPL has lots of genes and I'm not going to, I don't want you to go through that slides at all, but see how many genes are responsible for repeated pregnancy loss. This is just one, this is second, this is you know third so all these genes are you know uh, resp uh, responsible at various situations in uh, this problem so to sum up genetic testing itself is not a therapy for recurrent pregnancy loss but it can inform and guide therapy options for individuals experiencing rpl genetic testing can identify chromosomal abnormalities inherited genetic mutations and other genetic factors that may be contributing to rpl which can then inform treatment options and planning of the family so if a specific genetic disorder is identified genetic counseling can be provided to the parents and in some cases pre implantation genetic testing also can be advised so thank you very much we are quite eager to listen to madam Padke. i can see so many of our patients here and that's why you know i, I definitely would like to uh, cut it short thank you so much thank you sir with this lecture we will find the solution from the infertility and repeated abortions so thank you thank you sir thank you sir may i request yes. dr varyani sir
Dr. Naurangesar to come on to the dais, Dr. Sanjay Patil to join on the dais to felicitate Dr. Gupte sir. All the chairpersons please join for the felicitation. Just give us five minutes to make the arrangements and we'll immediately start. Video. Video.
A very good very afternoon, good Dr. Fedor Kemal. We welcome, we welcome you from, from IMA Pune. Pune. And may, may I request our, our president, president, Dr. Varyani Sir and Dr. Sanjay Gupta Sir to welcome you. Good afternoon, Dr. Fadke, madam. Uh, madam. Madam, please, please unmute, unmute yourself. yourself. She's unable to unmute herself, I think. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Can you? I'll I'll rejoin. Yes, madam. We can hear you. Can you hear but us? Are you getting an echo? Then I'll rejoin. No, no, it's okay. No, it's okay, madam. Okay. <clears throat> we wish to welcome you. So I'm requesting our president, Dr. Varyani sir, and Dr. Sanjay Gupte to welcome you. Welcome, Dr. Madam. Dr. Fadgan, welcome. Namaskar. Namaskar. I am overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. I'm I'm overwhelmed. Thank you, madam, for joining. The hall is full packed with all your students and they are waiting to hear you. I request our president to give you a welcome address. Good afternoon, madam. Namaskar. We all are missing you here. So am I. <laughs> So today we have uh, Dr. Gupta CME. In this we have a oration. I may Pune Dr. Yeah. Asmita Gupta oration. We welcome you all. We welcome Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Gupta. And uh, immediate past president I may Maharashtra Dr. Swas Pingle sir. Are you able to listen, madam? No. Okay. Okay. No. okay, welcome, madam. This is Dr. Gitanjali Sharma, Honorary Secretary, IMA Pune. So we start the program with the auspicious lamp lighting. And I request all the dignitaries on the dais, Dr. Sanjay Patil, Executive Trustee, to join on the dais to, for the lamp lighting, please. Asmita, madam. <laughs> okay. Hmm? 
Now request Dr. Naurange sir to speak a few words about Dr. Gupte oration. Madam sir, what? Good noon, madam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, madam? Good afternoon, Dr. Naurange. Good nice afternoon. Nice to see you here. <laughs> Namaskar. Namaste. Uh, I will give a very, very brief introduction of this oration. And this oration was started last year in uh, September 2022. And unfortunately, I was not physically present here, but mentally, and I was, of course, observing on Zoom from USA. So I missed the first program, but that was a very great, successful program. And the uh, great person, Dr. Marshall Kar, was uh, had obliged us to present to be present over in the same auditorium and uh, this particular oration was started at the request of dr minakshi and i was a little instrumental dr sanjay being my close friend and uh, he rightly named it as dr asmita gupta oration award to honor his wife and this particular oration we have kept it this way for it is always an academic intensely academic program and giving us some new vision as what they are instrumental in giving birth to the humanity. Similarly, they would give us the insights of some new topic. And similarly, we have today amongst us, and the right choice about the topics of genetics is Dr. Murudra Padke. I remember you, Madam, when you came and joined first time in Pune, I was I had just completed my five months of inter, uh, housemanship, first house post epidemic. And that was the yeah. thing which I remember in ward number 31, 32. Uh, that you used to take rounds and initially you were not uh, teaching us, but just, just listening to what the students are saying. And then you take a total hold of the situation and become a great teacher for all of us. And you are the most beloved teacher. And you are the right person, I said, because she is she was instrumental in bringing the topic of genetics in the medical college. I think it was first time in Maharashtra if I don't go wrong, and it was initially under the Department of Medicine, under Dr. Mutalik. And you took it forward and made a sapling grow into a big tree. And uh, today's topic is very apt as is genetics today and tomorrow. I would go back a little. Genetics yesterday, today and tomorrow. And uh, what we heard in the first four talks, uh, five talks, is that genetics has not only embraced us from the diagnostic point of view coming to the pinpoint what, what could be the reason for a particular thing 
but it is going to, it is going to affect our plates and our daily activities also as what would be neutrogenomics uh, genetics and also the exercises is related to various gene mutations so i think it's going to go a very long way both diagnostic primary prevention secondary prevention and even the management aspect of it madam with respect and love to you so many i think the hall is having the capacity of 196 and we are here at least 210 so oh, this I is the love and passion towards you and the insights you have imparted untiringly for so many years we would have appreciated you being over here but i think you have just come from uk and maybe because of ganesh festival and you wanted to avoid the traffic and jams and so much of crowd you have preferred to deliver the talk from zoom platform thank you welcome once again thank you thank you sir मैडम मी डॉक्टर इतांजली अश्विनी आणि अविनाश चे मैत्रीण आहे अरे वा आय एम सो सो प्लीज टू हियर योर वॉइस यस थँक यू मॅडम आणि इफ यू वुड हॅव कम ओव्हर हियर यू वुड हॅव सीन द फुल ऑडिटोरियम एक्झॅक्टली द वे एम जी ऑडिटोरियम यूज टू बी पॅक फॉर युअर लेक्चर्स आय मीन देर आर लेक्चर हॉल्स इन बी जे पॅथोलॉजी लेक्चर हॉल फार्मॅट लेक्चर हॉल बट मॅडम लेक्चर यूज टू बी इन एम टी ऑडिटोरियम इट यूज टू बी सो ओव्हर पॅक ओव्हरफुल तर अशा त्या लेक्चरच्या आठवणी आज परत जागृत होत आहे डॉक्टर संजय गुप्ते सर तुमचं इंट्रोडक्शन देणारच आहे पण मी एक छोटीशी कविता मॅडम साठी सादर करते नावार्थ मृदुलता नावार्थ मृदुलता कामार्थ अचुतता मनात ममता सदा वसे बाह्य चिकित्सा ध्यास जीवनी ज्ञान दान हा वसा असे व्यक्तिमत्व हे मोहक सुंदर व्यक्तिमत्व हे मोहक सुंदर हास्य निखळ गाळात असे गुरु आमची ही गुरु आमची ही माताच सकला सत्या माताच सकला प्रेम स्निग्धता हृदयात असे शक्ती बुद्धी व्यक्तित्व कणखर मॅडम वॉज डिज नॉट जस्ट एन थोडी आणि नारकाई शी वॉज डीन ऑफ विजय त्यामुळे त्यांच्या कणखर व्यक्तिमत्वाचा आम्ही सगळ्यांनी खूप छान अनुभव घेतला इट वॉज व्हेरी व्हेरी एंटरप्राइजिंग शक्ती बुद्धीच व्यक्तित्व कणखर संशोधनाचा स्रोत असे ना पैशाचा ना नावाचा लोभ मोह तो कधी नसते जीवन सफल सुबक साजिरे जीवन सफल सुबक साजिरे निर्मोही सेवेत असे उदंड आयु तुम्हाला बुदे आज तिने प्रार्थना असे नमस्ते एंड गुड आफ्टरनून मॅडम गुड आफ्टरनून टू यू इट्स ग्रेट टू हॅव्ही हिअर विथ ऑल ऑफ अस do you are on zoom it's like we are in middle of us definitely friends last year we were very fortunate that we had none other than dr marshalkar himself as the first orator of asmita gupte oration and everybody had really liked the talk and it was it had gone even viral and everything so this time it was a real challenge to find somebody who is you know equally eminent equally scholar you know equally you know really academic um, and so and so with lot after lot of thinking you know we could find nobody else than you know, dr mudra padke and as we know she is the pioneer in genetics and um, you know first i'll go through the formal introduction of madam for people i'm sure 90% of us know all about her but still uh, dr padke has been the first woman vice chancellor of the maharashtra university of health sciences nasik she has been a consultant to unicef and recipient of president of india medal dr padke has intense involvement in patient care student teaching and research and while working as pro- professor of pediatrics as all over uh the eminent uh, you know students here can vouch her previous and 
you know, a lot of things that she has done. She has been a member of Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, WHO Geneva, Senior Advisor, National Rural Health Mission, Ministry of Health, uh, Government of India, uh, Independent Director, Serum Institute of India, vis Visiting Scientific Scientist at Hopkins Institute, a former Director uh, of uh, Medical Education and uh, Research. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, she has been consultant to um, Belinda uh, uh, Gates Foundation. So, a lot of, you know, accolades to her credit, but what is important is she was the pioneer of genetics and that's why most apt person to be here. We all heard when we were uh, resident uh, in Visa Medical College, the G of genetics was really uh, taught to us by Padke uh, Madam. And personally, Madam, you would not remember, but the kind of a spark you had you know, generated and we, we, I spoke on, you know, genetics. A talk, I gave a talk on you know genetics in POGS conference long back in, I think it was in 2001 or something. And Madam was at that time a dean of the Visa uh, Medical College and she had, was uh, invited there as a chief guest. And when I spoke a little bit that was at uh, that time about cytogenetics and all, and in her you know, presidential address she had appreciated that I uh, specifically saying that I really appreciate a gynecologist being aware of you know uh, something about uh, you know genetics yeah. and that sort of little uh, spark and got me interested in this field and that's where we have come now. So, madam, you really are the reason and cause cause leader for all this uh, the progress that we could make. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Namaskar. Madam, just before we start, somebody very close to you is, uh, you know, there, and yes. I, I, I don't think it's a surprise to you, but Dr. Gambir is here, and you would definitely like to speak a couple of words before we start your Thank you. Sir. He has only made all my slides. <laughs> <laughs> We Marathi Bolnare, Karen, Madam, my academic mother, it, and I would tell Boltana, Marathi does Bolna, Matrubash Bolna, the Nakis mother just to show those. Obviously, obviously, in the English of the, it's only English of the Majabashi Mada's students. The Madam Mother now can be reprint for us of Venus for me, Purusha, and the Kapunaka. Madam Mother Kaiser Kasangaka Zerka Sala Mala. तर ते एकाद ओरेशनच असेल तरी पण मी ते थोड्याशा वाक्यामध्ये थोड्या शब्दांमध्ये मी सांगायचा प्रयत्न करणार आहे मी माझं जन्म जन्मांतरीच भाग्य समजतो की मॅडम मला माझ्या आयुष्यात आल्या आणि मला त्यांचा सहवास मार्गदर्शन प्रेम आणि विद्यादान हे मागची जवळजवळ पंचेचाळीस वर्ष मिळाली आणि अजून सुद्धा आम्हाला जर का दिवसातनं एकदा फोन नाही झाला तर आठवड्यातनं एकदा फोन नक्की होतो आणि जशी आई मागे लागते अभ्यासाला तशी मॅडम मला अजून माझ्याकडे मागे लागतात की हे वाचलंस का ते वाचलंस का याच्याबद्दल तुला काय वाटतं माझं मत विचारतात आणि मॅडमचा मोठेपण आहे की त्या सगळ्या स्टुडंट्सना त्यांचं काय मत आहे केसेस बद्दल असं विचारतात ते कशासाठी विचारतात मला माहिती आहे की त्या त्याला विद्यार्थ्यांना उद्युक्त करतात की त्यांनी स्वतः विचार करावा काहीतरी शिकावा काहीतरी स्वतः करावं त्याच्यातनं त्यांना पुढे पेशंटला ट्रीटमेंट द्यायला त्यांना मदत होईल म्हणून मॅडमच्या काही क्वालिटीज सांगताना एक महत्वाची क्वालिटी म्हणजे त्यांचं फॉरवर्ड लुकिंग विचार हे नेहमी असायचे याची जर मी दोन तीन उदाहरणं देतो की मी जेव्हा रेसिडेन्सीला आलो तेव्हा आमच्या डिपार्टमेंटला लडग्या सॅनग्रायझर होत त्याच्यानंतर सोनोग्राफिक मशीन जे होतं ते बी जे मेडिकलमध्ये हे पहिल्यांदा पेडियाटिस्ट डिपार्टमेंटला होतं नंतर एक चार पाच वर्षानंतर ते रेडिओलॉजी डिपार्टमेंटला आलं इथं कोणतं सोनोलॉजिस्ट त्यांनी मला माहित नाही पण सुरुवातीचे आणि बरेच सोनोलॉजिस्ट हे आमच्याकडे शिकलेले आहेत आमच्या डिपार्टमेंटला एच पी एल सी मशीन हे कॉलेजमध्ये फक्त आमच्या डिपार्टमेंटला होतं आणि मॅडमने सगळी ही डिपार्टमेंटची हे जी यंत्र सामग्री होती ही वापरली आणि ती जी वापरली ती ती त्यांनी रिसर्च ग्रँड्समधून मिळवली होती हे त्यांचं विशेष हे कारण त्याचं फॉरवर्ड लुटिकिंग ॲटिट्यूड आणि याच्यामधून आम्ही शिकलो सर जसं म्हणजे जेनेटिक्स त्यांनी इथं एस्टॅब्लिश केलं ते जेनेटिक्स नुसतं एस्टॅब्लिश नाही केलं तर ते फोफावलं त्यांनी आम्हाला त्याच्यामध्ये रिसर्च करायला लावलं आणि हे सगळं करताना 
मॅडमना एक त्यांचं अजून सांगायचं एक विशेष म्हणजे की मॅडमना त्यांनी त्यांच्या ऑफिसचं दार कधी बंद नाही ठेवलं तर मॅडम मला सांगितलं मला आठवत आहे की मॅडम ज्या वेळेला प्रोफेसर झाले हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट झालं त्यावेळेला त्यांच्या वडलांनी सांगितलं होतं ना की तू ऑफिसचं दार कधी बंद करू नको म्हणून आणि नुसतं ऑफिसचं दार आम्हाला सगळ्यांना डॉक्टर्सना तिथं अप्रोच नसायचं नर्सेसना अप्रोच नसायचं विद्यार्थ्यांना अप्रोच नसायचं तर मॅडमचं ऑफिस तुम्ही ससूनमध्ये कधी आला असं तर बघितलं असेल की त्याच्या मागे पेडियाटिकची ओपीडी होती आणि पेडियाटिक शॉपीडमध्ये सगळे गरीब असे निरक्षर लोक किंवा ज्यांना कमी हे माहिती असते लोक हे तिथं औषधं घ्यायचे आणि त्यांना फक्त एक अशी बाई दिसायची खिडकी बंद जी बसली खुर्ची होती त्यांची पाठ दिसायची त्यांना तर माहीत नसायचं मॅडम हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट आहेत म्हणून आणि त्या मॅडमनं विचारलं यायचं ते औषधं घेऊन मॅडम ती औषधं कशी घ्यायची सांगा आम्हाला म्हणून आणि मॅडम हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट असताना त्यांनी कधी कोणाला त्याचं मी नाही सांगणार तुम्हाला असं कधी म्हटलं मला तर माहीत नाही म्हणजे तर त्याच्यामुळे ह्या मॅडमच्या दोन क्वालिटीज आहेत की ज्याच्याबद्दल त्यांचा ह्युमन टच एवढा आहे की अजून सुद्धा जर का तुम्ही त्यांना एकदा भेटलं असेल तुम्ही त्यांच्या याच्या संपर्कामध्ये असाल तर त्यांना तुमच्या मुलांची नावं त्यांना माहिती असतं तर विचार ही काय का सध्या करते तो सध्या काय करतो हे त्यांचं म्हणजे त्यांच्याकडे एन्सायक्लोपीडिया मी ते ट्राय करायचा प्रयत्न केला पण मला काही ते जमलं नाही तर त्यांची मेमरी जी एन्सायक्लोपेडिक आहे ती सतत ती ऍक्टिव्ह असते आणि अगदी आता थोडक्या शब्दामध्ये सांगतो की मला मी आता मणिपालला काल होतो आणि पणिपालला आमच्या लॅबचा बायोकेमिस्ट हा चेन्नईमधून आला होता तो मराठी आहे अनुप निवदाळू म्हणून तो काही दिवस मी जे मेडिकलला शिकायला होतं अंडर ग्रॅज्युएट करिअरमध्ये त्यांनी जी आठवण सांगितली ती सगळ्यांना आपल्याला एकदम अशी काहीतरी सांगून जाईल की मॅडमना तो मला म्हणाला की मॅडम डीन असताना सुद्धा आमचे लेक्चर घ्यायला यायचे आपण बघतो की डीन किंवा असं कोणी मोठे मोठे पदावरती जातात त्यावेळेस ते लोकांना कधी अप्रोचेबल नसतं आणि दुसरी गोष्ट त्यांची अकॅडमिक ऍक्टिव्हिटी ते सोडतात मॅडम बी सी असताना त्यांना गोवारीकर म्हणाले त्यांनी सगळी त्यांची सगळी टीचिंग डिपार्टमेंट युनिव्हर्सिटीमध्ये पहिल्यांदा चालू केली त्याचप्रमाणे मॅडम पेशंट बघायला यायच्या ओपीडीमध्ये यायच्या आणि विद्यार्थ्यांचं लेक्चर डीन असताना सुद्धा त्यांनी कधी नाकारलं नाही ते त्यांनी चालू ठेवलं आणि ते सगळी त्यांना स्टिम्युलेटिंग लेक्चर्स असायचे पुलं म्हणाले की या जगामध्ये पायधरायला फार कमी व्यक्ती आता उडलेल्या आहेत आपल्या सगळ्यांना पायधरायला जे व्यक्तिमत्ता आपल्या आपल्या ते आहे त्यांना उदंड आयुष्य लाभव त्यांनी असंच मला रोज फोन करावेत आणि मला जरा चिमटे काढावेत म्हणजे मी पण जरा वाचत जाईल एवढं बोलून म्हणजे मी मॅडमना thank you sir madam we are eager to listen to you yeah thank you your gitanjali yes yes uh honorable president of the ima present president past president and all the presidents of ima dr asmita gupte and dr sanjay gupte of the gupte memorial oration and all the very distinguished luminaries chairpersons for today's function dr prakash gambhir dr naurange and all my very very dear students at the very outset i am profusely thankful in fact overwhelmed by my introduction i think nobody has ever told me uh that i have such qualities i don't think you have described me i am a simple person like much worse than what all of you are today and much worse than what you all have achieved so having said this i will start my little oration not to match to anyone's oration because i am dr naurange already said madam speak on genetics of the past so i am really going to speak on genetics of the past uh can i have the first slide please i am not seeing the slides i am not able to see my slides i was able to see it some time back can somebody project the slides for me or can i have the ha slides koni tari project karu shakel Dr. Asmita Gupte and Dr. Sanjay Gupte, Dr. Naurange, Dr. Gambhir, Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, Dr. Pingle, Dr. Mangesh Pate, all of, have been, all of them have been one of the best students of the BJ Medical College and now the doyans in their respective fields. They have taught generations of students and there is so much to learn from them 
I am indeed very thankful to Dr. Asmita Gupte. I remember her as Kishori Dunnarkar and Dr. Sanjay Gupte. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, genetics. Everyone knows the science of heredity now has assumed so much and such a great importance. To an old timer like me, geneticist, what did I do? I thought genetics is like a loaded gun. That you have so many genetic diseases, you have so much of predisposition to many diseases and the commonest diseases being the heart disease and the coronary artery disease and the type 2 diabetes. But I thought that this loaded gun of genetics needs one trigger and that is the trigger of lifestyle. So if you want that the trigger is not pulled, then change your lifestyle today. But what does genetics mean to a common man? Dr. Gupte said it so beautifully in his lecture on infertility. But I thought that to a common man, genetics means only one thing, disputed paternity. The next two slides, please, in a row. Disputed paternity, you don't need a DNA test to find out that this probably is the father. And I think both of them holding the mobiles. So that's just to tell you that genetics for a common man is just disputed paternity. And sure, indeed, enough, no DNA test needed if father and child are so similar to each other, as this funny slide is showing. The next slide, please. Before I begin, I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Kate, Dr. Prakash Gambhir, Dr. Bankar, Dr. Kedkar, Dr. Mokashi, Dr. Bhate, Dr. Bulak, and all of you, all the patients and students of the BJ Medical College, the genetic department, Sasun General Hospital. I learned only because of the mistakes that I made on the patients and they pardoned me for it. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. To a common person and to geneticists, to a physician, to a pediatrician, and to all of us, the commonest genetic disorder that we see often is Down syndrome with an incidence of one in 600 births. Pediatricians still see Down syndrome once a month, one case, and you don't need rocket science to diagnose a child of Down syndrome. Trisomy 21, 47 chromosomes. This little lovely little child with all the features of Down syndrome, the face is staggeringly similar for all children of Down syndrome. But the next slide, please. But I learned to diagnose Down syndrome when Dr. Shirole, late Dr. Shirole and late Dr. Ajay Joshi, a child was brought, a neonate was brought to the pediatric department and the neonate was all bundled up. Only his hand was coming out and the hand was hanging and little toe and the feet and little part of the toes was coming out. And Dr. Shirole said, Don't, what is wrong with this child? We were all stumped. And he said, don't you think, looking at the hand of the child, he said, don't you think this child has Down syndrome? We were surprised. What did the child have? A single palmer crease, what we call as a simian crease, running across the palm and increased distance between the first and the second toe. Added to that, compounded to that, was the hand of the child which was dangling out. That means the hand was very hypotonic. These three features made him make a diagnosis and we were all stumped. That was the clinical diagnosis of Down syndrome. And I feel that still our new generation should think that they will be able to diagnose children who are brought in blanketed and totally curled up. Can I have the next slide? So you can see the face of the child and you have the classical features as you saw just now. The epicanthic folds, the downturned eyes that we call as mongoloid slant, no more called as mongoloid. So downturned eyes, nystagmus, brush field spots, cat track, soft, very soft ear cartilages, hypotonia, simian freeze, and the little finger, which is totally in turn, what we call as clinodactyly and single crease even on the little finger. These children have brachycephalic small heads and they obviously may have congenital heart disease, GI abnormalities, and they have developmental delay. Now we no more can call it as mental subnormality. We have to call these children as divyang children. So these are the clinical features which I think were there yesterday. They'll be there today and they will be there tomorrow. But we have to have the eye of Sherlock Holmes to diagnose them. 
So to the younger audience, please remember that diagnosis of Down syndrome, trisomy 21, is today by and large clinical and will remain so. The next slide, please. Tomorrow, what are we going to do? And in some centers, even today, you will see that an older mother, we would say, or at the moment, I should say, every woman who has just conceived should be offered Down syndrome screening. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, we used to say that it occurs at 35 years and beyond in the Western world. And in India, we thought that Down syndrome occurs at 28 and 27 years of age to the mother. And obviously, because uh, Indian mothers produce children at a much younger age, we still don't know. But it's a fact that Down syndrome does occur at younger age group in India. And therefore, needless to say that with HIFI genetic tests, it's important that we try to diagnose Down syndrome right in the antenatal period. And what can we do for it? In all the centers in Pune probably, and some centers all over Maharashtra and few centers in India, second trimester Down syndrome screening is possible. And that is done by maternal blood. You do the beta HCG, you do unconjugated estriol, you do alpha protein and inhibin studies. These are, these are done regularly in many centers in Pune. And with 80% accuracy, you can kind of think whether the child is going to be Down syndrome. But what does this 80% accuracy do? You do the mother's test, you do the screening, and you increase the anxiety of the mother because 20% chance that the baby may not be Down syndrome. So we went further ahead. And now even first trimester Down syndrome screening is done. And most important is the ultrasound machine. So you will try and see nuchal translucency. And if the nuchal translucency is there and nuchal fold is thicker than normal, Obviously, due to the hypotonia, the child's neck is a little extended. And then you do blood tests, that is the pap ace test. So if first trimester screening is done, number one, by nuchal translucency on ultrasound, beta HCG and pap A screening, you will be able to diagnose Down syndrome 95% of the times. But then we have to go further ahead, even that 5% should stop. And therefore, detection of fetal DNA in the maternal blood which all the previous speakers so beautifully said, non-invasive screening test, and it gives you 98% accuracy. The next slide, please. This is the, uh, no, there are two more slides in between. Uh, yes. So then what you can do is using a next generation sequencer machine, you're going to do all the tests and non-invasive invasive tests on the blood can be done. The next slide, please. This is the next generation DNA sequencing, sequencing 98% accuracy for detection of all chromosomal disorders. Can we go to the next slide, please? Which are the other chromosomal disorders that need a mention? Downs is one we have said, but one must also be able to diagnose trisomy 13, trisomy 13 and trisomy eight. Point to tell here that deep palmer crease in a mentally retarded child Besides Downs, you are going to think that the child could have trisomy 18 and that's going to make the diagnosis different but easier for you. Turner syndrome, earlier speakers spoke so much about you. Amenorrhea and all we can detect easily by doing chromosomal studies, one of the common syndromes. I would like to mention on fragile X, particularly common in males and they have large testes, large ears and mental subnormality. And ironically enough, they are a little subfertile. And therefore, a clinical diagnosis of fragile X syndrome should be made first and followed by genetic diagnosis, but particularly cytogenetic diagnosis. Any patient with odd faces, we called in those days FLKs, funny looking child. Now child is not called like that because it is body shaming. And therefore, let us all use the word, not even developmental delay, but we should say, that this is a divyang child and forget about his odd faces. You look at them, but do not mention them. And of course, children with many cardiovascular, gastrointestinal abnormalities, hair, lip, cleft, palate, as seen in trisomy 13. And a good high index of suspicion goes a long way. So diagnosis by clinical means is important. The next slide, please. Single gene disorders after chromosomal disorders, we know it too well. 
a child with a thalassemic face, smaller prominence, low no nasal bridge, little icteric tinge, teeth which are protruding out, and obviously with hepatosplenomegaly, you don't have to think, but it is nothing but thalassemia major. The next slide, please. And in our genetic clinic, we had a number of children who came for thalassemia, thalassemia major to the extent that one child in those days, bone marrow transplant was not available. Now it is available and that's the genetics of tomorrow. One can not only do a bone marrow transplant, but even gene therapy is possible for many genetic disorders. But in those days, we did not have the facility. Only bone marrow was available in some countries abroad. And therefore, we were resorting to counseling and we were trying to tell the recurrence risk to the parents. And the father of this thalassemic child actually stumped us totally. We told him recurrence risk 25%. You and your wife are carriers. And as Dr. Gupta rightly said in his talk, the father married another person who was not a carrier and produced a child who was a normal child. And the normal child then gave bone, uh, uh, bone marrow grafting to the baby who was a thalassemia patient. So I would insist here that whenever you are doing counseling, I spoke the truth 40 years ago telling that you are a carrier. Not that I don't speak the truth now, but that time I was frank enough telling him that both of you are carriers. And so this is what is going to be the recurrence risk. Please remember counseling has to be non-directional and it is the parent's choice that is supreme. The next slide, please. So this is what genetics is going to remain today and tomorrow. Pedigree analysis, most of us forget all the time. So before doing the counseling, before doing a diagnosis, one must do a pedigree analysis, draw a beautiful pedigree, thereby showing the proband who is a sufferer and all the people who are carriers with the dots. And this is especially important for inborn errors of metabolism that you learned this morning, which wherein we know that majority of them are transmitted as recessive traits. The next slide, please. So what do we see? What is the future of single gene disorders for us? Prevention of single gene disorders by avoiding consanguineous marriages, something very simple to practice, but very, very difficult. Thalassemia has been eradicated in Cyprus, but we are unable to do thalassemia screening and particularly carrier screening for young girls or young boys is still not possible. And there is a social element in it. Girls who face difficulty in getting married even today and who are given so much of substandard treatment if you do carrier screening and detect a girl as thalassemia, that girl as thalassemia carrier, that girl may not be able to get married. So if at all carrier screening is to be done, my advice to this August gathering is please do carrier screening, but do them on the boys first. And then boys who are carriers may not marry a carrier girl at the time of her marriage. I will tell you a lovely story of sickle cell anemia and carrier state. In tribals where we used to work along with Dr. Kate. He devised a simple method, what he called as tattooing method, because tribals tattoo on their hand devs, what are called as gods. They have five gods. And Dr. Kate would tattoo a sickle cell, a tattooing of a sickle cell on the patient who was found to be sickle cell trait and who came sometimes with thrombotic or other kinds of crisis. And these children were screened. So Dr. Kate did a lot of community screening. He still does it at his age of 85 and he puts all tribals into tattooed tribals or non-tattooed tribals, thereby meaning an easy way of detecting a carrier in tribals. Let us at least do some carrier screening in our population. And then, of course, prenatal diagnosis, which is getting advanced as the days go by. And then enzyme replacement therapy, especially for inborn errors of metabolism. Can I have the next slide, please? And what do we see in this next slide? We talk on not only single gene disorders, but we talk on genetics of common diseases, polygenic multifactorial diseases. Most of us know coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, hair lip cleft palate, congenital hip dysplasia for the orthopedicians in this gathering. And we know that their inheritance is very, very complex. And so we need to know about the role of environment. It's not only the genes that are important, but it is your environment and environment has many, many factors. And one of the factors there besides your environment, like the air that you are breathing is nutrition. And rightly so, you had a lecture on nutrition. The next slide, please. 
And what do we see on nutrition? All of us know that as diabetics and as coronary artery disease, it is the nutrition, nutrition, nutrition that's important. But what is it in the nutrition? The nutrigenomics. Effect of nutrition on genes and effect of genes on nutrition. Most important is the gene for lactose intolerance. Most of us who have lactose intolerance have acquired lactose intolerance. We get it as we grow by in age. Our enzyme, lactase enzyme becomes lesser and lesser. But that is acquired lactose intolerance. There is an entity called as congenital lactose intolerance where from birth the child is sensitive to lactose. Treatment is very simple. You have to give lactose-free diet, milk-free diet and substitute enzymes wherever possible. The same thing is for a rare disorder like phenylketonuria. Again, an inborn error of metabolism, genetically transmitted. Parents carrier and phenylalanine accumulates in the blood only because the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase is deficient. And because phenylalanine accumulates in the blood, the patient gets mental retardation, may get convulsions, may get seboriasis. We detected one case of phenylketonuria only by seeing severe seboric skin that the child had, little fairish complexion, and the child was mentally subnormal. We got his phenylalanine done in those days from the National Chemical Laboratory, and the child was put on a special diet. So if that is possible in those days, why not we do all the therapies and all that is available for us? So phenylketonuria is another disorder governed totally by genes and a simple dietary treatment of low phenylalanine diet, not absent phenylalanine diet, low phenyl. Phenylalanine restricted diet may be good for patients who have inborn error of metabolism, phenylketonuria. The same is true for galactosemia. Can I have the next slide, please? And then we move on from there to diseases wherein good amount of food is going to help to the patient. So genes that are responsible for altering your nutrition and now the nutrition, which is going to see what is happening. The classical polygenic multifactorial disease, type 2 diabetes. Genes make variable contribution. Obesity is a major risk factor in type 2 diabetes. And how to detect it by quantitative trait locus analysis. You can also do single nucleotide polymorphism and you can detect and find out how much is the insulin resistance. And when you do SNPs or SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphism is a good genetic marker. It is a good linkage analysis to tell you whether you inherit the genes for getting type 2 diabetes. And needless to say that there are 600 gene markers obesity governs. So if you are obese, well, you already have 600 genetic markers. And therefore, I think it is extremely difficult to find out. And the linkage analysis only is going to tell. The future of genetics lies here. When you are born, if you know that you have 98% predisposition to type 2 diabetes, well, the matter could be a bit simple. Can I have the next slide, please? And the same thing holds true for coronary artery disease is the genes and the environment. So obesity, well, we are going to control. We know it too well. But how are we going to manage the HDL, LDL, and the VLDL? HDL, the protective high-density lipoprotein, and LDL and the VLDL are the bad low-density lipoproteins. Well, everybody who's a little obese has a genetic predisposition. You just prescribe. There are lots of physicians here. So with the highest regards, statins are prescribed. And they statins, what do they do? They inhibit hepatic 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaric coenzyme reductase and therefore they decrease the circulating cholesterol. Simple methodology, take statins and then eat what you want. It's not so simple as that because we know that there are several candidate genes which are known, which predispose us to cardiovascular diseases. The cholesterol ester transfer protein, the lipoprotein lipase, the hepatic triglyceride lipase, the lipoproteins and the lecithin cholesterol transferase, all these can be identified today and will be identified in every sense of the word tomorrow. And if you do SNPs, you'll be able to identify and you do your gene sequencing. You know that if you have deficiency or absence of any of these enzymes, then what do we have? Then the treatment probably is simpler. The next slide, please. The how treatment is simple. Well, there is a gene-diet interaction, which we know. 
and coronary artery disease malignancy as well and when you are born with such genes which are predisposing you to coronary artery disease well this beautiful pre lunch slide of 50 samosas you are going to say no 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 to these samosas if you have all the genes to produce all the genes to produce uh, inheritance of coronary artery disease so it's true for malignancy you all learnt about the brca gene 10 minutes ago well take vitamins take antioxidants and maybe control your obesity hormonal regulation and you may conquer not only diabetes not only coronary artery disease but malignancy i am still using the word may because i don't know what is stored for us tomorrow the next slide please what is stored for us tomorrow it is only epigenetics and diet epi is about so we are talking on genetics but i want to tell you something on epigenetics epi is about and it is temporarily activating or repressing our gene expression means your genes are there but whether they get switched on or they get switched off depends on your epigenetics and therefore it's the change in the gene expression without actual change in your dna sequence so your dna sequence the same born with the same gene but it is in your hands to alter your epigenetics and you can change your d gene expression and how do you change that this gene expression can be changed by three or four factors which we are going to tell you but it's rather dismaying and i do not know why it occurs but once an epigenetic change occurs then it gets passed from generation to generation so epigenetic change that occurs often gets transmitted intergenerationally so see how beautiful is epigenetics that the genetic change occurs your dna remains the same but the expression of the gene is altered and then it gets transferred in 1940s there was severe hunger in europe it was called as the dutch hunger epidemic and what happened all the grandmothers of those times could not get enough food and they produced mothers whose ova were already deprived of nutrition and they produced children who had mental issues who were malnourished and who had so many other problems the example that i am giving is old time actress audrey hepburn who was produced like this in dutch hunger and it was her grandmother who was responsible for all this so i might say that if you have any problems it is very easy blame it on your grandmother and for the males in this audience mail it straight away on mother in law and the problem is sorted out so that's epigenetics and diet we'll go further next slide please and what does it show to us a simple slide you can see the chromosome on the right hand side you can see the compact chromatin in the middle you can see a chromatin that is getting tails and there are three things that happen in epigenetics the first one is what is called as dna methylation the second one is histone acetylation and the third one is rna regulation so these are the simple three things that are going to genetically alter our gna and can we go to the next slide and the next slide the courtesy of this slide the first slide is on dna methylation simple add one methyl group to the cytosine of the dna and this is critical and what happens when you add this methyl group how do you add the methyl group folic acid is a methyl group donor so you give folic acid to the patient either in the form of folate in the diet or folic acid tablet and all the neural tube defects are prevented dr minachi talked so well and folic acid and preconceptional giving of folic acid and also that all neural tube defects are transmitted are prevented also preconceptional multi multiple micronutrient supplementation not only folic acid along with it give b12 dr yadnik's hypothesis how many mothers are getting preconceptional folic acid not even 3% of the mothers and in villages in maharashtra one survey found that it was only 0.0003% of the adolescent girls got folic acid in the antenatal period and in the preconceptional period i think folic acid plays a great role not only in the neural tube defect prevention but it plays another important role and that is on imprinting which we are going to discuss shortly so dna methylation 
an important epigenetic mechanism which is going to govern so many things. This DNA methylation is going to improve birth weight of children in our country. 20% of the babies that are born, pediatricians and neonatologists, bread and butter, that they are born low in weight. And if you want to stop this, it is extremely simple to produce a child with good folic acid given to the mother and the baby is born not only without neural tube defects, but the baby is born good in weight. And having a good weight is going to take the physicians, maybe the physicians will feel that we are controlling hypertension, we are controlling coronary artery disease, because if you're born low in weight and you develop obesity in later life after 20s and 30s, you are more prone to getting high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease, the classical Barker's hypothesis and the developmental origin of adult diseases. And that is the Dohad hypothesis and Dr. Yadnik's theory. So I believe that DNA methylation is the crux of the matter and a simple dietary alteration. And we are going to produce good weight babies and maybe we'll be able to decrease the number of hypertensive and coronary artery disease patients. The next epi Genetic modification, the next slide, please. What do we see in the next uh, slide? The next slide, please, is you have histone acetylation. And simple enough, what does this histone acetylation do? Dr. Gambir described it very beautifully to me. The chromatin and the condensed chromosomal structure, as we see, is like a thick wool. And when you are going to knit it with knitting needles, the needles are going to be your epigenetic modification. And then what the final product through the tail of the wool that you are going to get a knitted sweater, may it be a sweater or may it be a cardigan or may, may it be any other structure that you're knitting like a coat. And so the coat is like your altered epigenetic phenomenon. And this histone acetylation performs the role of your knitting needles. And that is, it loosens the DNA. So you can see in the next slide, the next slide shows how the DNA has got loosened uh, and how does it get loosened? Histone acetylation does only two things. The lysine is altered because lysine has an NH2 group and therefore normally the lysine is positively charged. Our DNA is negatively charged and therefore the two are tightly bound. And if the two are tightly bound, the gene does not express itself. The DNA does not express itself. but when it gets opened by histone acetylation, the gene expresses, and the next slide, please. And when the gene expresses, the gene gets loosened, as, as you can see. And this is an important aspect of epigenetic phenomenon, which is the causative factor for all the diseases. So I believe that today, epigenetics is the future of genetics. The next slide, please. And what do we have next? When this histone acetylation balance gets disrupted, what do we mean by that? That the spine balance between histone acetylation and histone deacetylation, two enzymes, HAT and HDAC. Deacetylation enzyme is HDAC. And when the balance is disrupted, many diseases occur. One of them is neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's. So if you want Alzheimer's to not to occur in you, the next slide, please. What do we do? Anyway, Huntington's chorea, major part of it is dominantly inherited, but some part of it is due to acetylation. Histone acetylation can prevent many, many, many things. Histone acetylation can prevent Alzheimer's disease. Histone acetylation can prevent atherosclerosis. And how does it prevent atherosclerosis? So just loosening of your DNA, just loosening of the chromatin work and all that, is going to prevent atherosclerosis because we know that in atherosclerosis, the low density lipoprotein levels are increased. And we also know that pre pro inflammatory cytokines and there is a vascular endothelial damage. Now, LDL plaques have to go and sit there in the vascular endothelium, and histone acetylation triggers this process. So, if there is histone acetylation and you find that there are plaque formations, Imagine that the cytokines and the vascular endothelial damage has occurred because your histone acetylation and deacetylation balance is gone. And what does this balance go with? The balance goes if you don't have 
sulforaphanes in your diet, which are present in broccoli, which are present in cabbage. Most children hate to have cabbage as a vegetable. Imagine that this sulforaphane, which is present in cabbage, is going to prevent atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease in uh, uh, older age group. And the same is true with butyrate, that low-density lipoproteins are going to, even if they are there, the damage will not be done if histone acetylation is good. So the long and short of it is, eat lots of broccoli if you can afford it. Otherwise, at least have cabbage and lots of curcumin, for which Dr. Marshalkar had got patent. And for us as clinicians and as physicians to remember, is your balance of HAT and HDAC is important. And tomorrow's genetics lies in this. That you are going to tell your little baby that wait, 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 I'm going to estimate your hat and HDAC and then tell you what you're going to suffer later on. The next slide, please. And this tells you the balance between the two. And we know that this occurs due to either gene suppression or gene expression. And the balance between the two, if it is lost, we are going to get the diseases. The next slide, please. And this is, of course, aging and epigenetic process. You know that cancer and folate and the metabolism of regulation is too well known. Can we have the next slide? And in the next five minutes, oh, we are going to talk a little bit on personalized medicine. If there is time, please pardon me. You can, uh, organizers can tell me when to stop. We want a little bit on personalized medicine, individualized or precision medicine is important and that's going to be the future of genetics of tomorrow. Diagnosis treatment is decided by the, not only by the epigenetic modification, but by the genetic information of the patient. And you will tailor your medicine, the Ayurveda philosophy of life, that medicine is tailored for individual patient. The same size that fits Karina Kapoor does not fit Madhuri Dikshit. So one size fit all concept is gone. Mm and it is going away. So we can have epigenetic modification and personalized medicine. The next slide, please. And this personal medicine is that you're going to decide on the genetic profile of the patient, not just the weight, age, and sex of the patient, but you can find out whether the drug is likely to have benefit to the patient or it is going to do harm to the patient. And how can we do that? The next slide, please. Personalized medicine today, I owe all this to Dr. Nilima Kshirsagar. Lot of genetic and pharmacogenomic work is done by them. And it is to detect gene-based variation in drug response. And there are 15 to 30% of all our individuals have a lot of variation. And drug metabolism changes, and particularly the cytochrome 450 enzyme in the liver changes because 57 genes encode for cytochrome 450. So if you have abnormality in any of those, simple enough, you become a poor metabolite of a particular drug and the patient will have a lot of toxicity because the drug is remaining in the blood. And if you are ultra fast metabolizer, well, the drug is going to get lost from the uh, body and the patient may not get the desired effect. Classical examples are warfarin and the other example is phenantoin, phenantoin sodium the dilantin that we have used. Patients who are fast, fast acetylators, they don't show the effect of the drug and slow acetylators have more toxicity and therefore one has to be extremely careful. INH is another one and yes. slow metabolizers, we have often seen that such patients, the toxicities occur more particularly in adults. The next slide, please. And now I come to one small thing. Well, we all know drugs and genotyping. We all know that Many drugs which are onco or which are cancer drugs, they have been useful in particular ways. And that is one of the drugs used for chronic myeloid leukemia works only when you have the Philadelphia chromosome. And that Philadelphia chromosome, if it is mutated and the kinase, kinase enzyme is deficient, then only the drug imatinib acts. So that's about drug metabolism, the pharmacology. We'll not go into the oncology aspect of it, but the next slide, please. I want to mention about one drug, other important drugs, you know, phenytoin, slow metabolizers, rapid metabolizers, INH, the next slide, please. And then we come to COVID has just gone. 
And you remember what all drugs we gave in COVID. And I will give you a classical example. One of the examples was every patient, all of us prescribed one Azzy and second hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Some prescribed even erythrocene. And any patient who came with fever then, a prescription of nine drugs was given and two of them were chloroquine and azithromycin, thinking that if it is COVID, the patients will improve. And what happened? Well, we don't know whether they improved or not or whether they improved on their own. But two patients, one in Lucknow and one in down south, one of them got severe arrhythmia and second one, I believe he actually died. I don't have enough actual details of that patient. But what must have happened to them? We are aware of the fact, physicians, particularly in this gathering, that there is something called as long QT interval syndrome, wherein the ECG of the patient shows a prolonged QT interval. And this can be achieved by two means, or you can get it by two means. One of them is a congenital long QT intro, uh, syndrome, congenital long QT interval prolongation syndrome. And the second one is acquired. How do you get acquired? Simple enough, if your potassium level drops, you get acquired QT interval syndrome. But you can also have acquired QT interval syndrome prolongation by two, three important drugs. One of them is azithromycin. Second one is hydroxychloroquine. The third one is fluoroquinolones. The third, fourth one is even ceftrioxon sodium and bedaquiline given now for tuberculosis. All these drugs in some patients, in a few patients, can produce prolongation of the QT interval, which is governed by three major and 10 minor genes. And the defect is only in repolarization of the cardiac muscle. And it is this that sodium and the potassium gating that has occurred and the challenge channels have opened and therefore repolarization does not occur. And long QT interval syndrome is probably one of the greatest things that we are going to think in tomorrow's medicine and the patient can get torsed depoint the syndrome and patients can drop dead. So our genetics of tomorrow is going to be lots of pharmacogenetics. And we will like to study. Today, I can't tell you how much is of the long QT interval is due to drugs and how much of it is congenital. But tomorrow, sure enough, that's going to be known. And that is the genetics of the future, the pharmacogenetics. The next slide, please. Can I have the next slide? And that's your marking of the genome. And that's personalized medicine. The next slide. By single nucleotide polymorphism, many of these can be detected. And SNPs are just small DNA blocks of nucleotides. And they occur in 1% of the population. And they occur between genes. So SNPs themselves don't produce any disease. But their presence can help you as a linkage marker. And we have 600 million SNPs. So the genetics of the future is going to be the biological markers of SNPs. And they will tell you whether you're going to get Alzheimer's, whether you're going to get schizophrenia or coronary artery disease, or for that matter, every possible disease. The next slide, please. Now in the next 10 minutes, oh well, arms PCR and all the genetic tests were discussed so nicely. The fluorescent dye detection, the, the fish fish technique, all of you saw it, the microarrays and the next generation sequencing. The next slide, please. So all this is going to diagnose patients, but I'm going to, in the next five minutes before I close, I'm, to give you, I'm going to give you a new concept, which I think is going to resume lot of, assume a lot of importance, and that is genetics of tomorrow, at least, well, for the place where I am working now, and that is in the interiors of Maharashtra, in Nandrubar and Usmanabad, and that is, Low protein diet given to the mother, the commonest thing. Our mothers have a BMI hardly of 17 or 16.5 sometimes. The girl has just got married, goes to her in-law's place and eats as the last person in the house to eat. One wonders how much of proteins and calories she's going to get, leave aside the folic acid and the green vegetables. And this low protein diet, it has been shown by enough of evidence now. Low protein diet is going to induce low insulin, low branch chain amino acids in the graphene follicle of the going to be mother and the blastocyst, the low protein diet is going to affect the blastocyst. It's going to affect the uterine fluid. And what is the result? 
the result is poor implantation of the zygote the result is poor placenta formation the result is poor fetal growth trajectory and therefore the baby to be born is going to be low birth weight and the effect is immensely seen when it occurs in the first trimester so we all really think every time about the second and the third trimester in the antenatal period but i believe the crux of the matter lies in the first trimester and maternal low protein diet is a good evidence that we have and therefore it's important to know that give food to the mother and see that the father is not clear enough but obese fathers sperm quality poor dr gupta has already told and the dna integrity is lost along with the integrity of the father if some odd and vicious things are done so i would think but fathers are not so responsible it is the diet of the mother which is much more responsible and we should look after it the next slide please and then what do we have new concept why are we going to focus on the adolescent girls the unicef theory today rajalakshmi nair is to focus on the adolescent girl to focus on her ovum formation and you will see that the fetal growth improves what do i mean by that we know that growth of the fetus or growth of the zygote or the embryo that is formed is dependent on one important enzyme and that is igf2 the insulin like growth factor 2 insulin like growth factor 1 is responsible for growth of the human being after birth but it is the igf2 that is responsible it is the growth factor that works before birth so the growth of the baby is dependent on igf2 and igf2 r that is the receptor so the receptor igf2 r and igf2 govern the growth of the baby in the first nine intrauterine months and what is the beauty of this igf this growth factor that the genes for igf2 both the genes are imprinted and what do we mean by imprinted genes that these imprinted genes are expressed only one gene one gene is active so if they are paternally expressed it is good but if both genes are active means both genes are imprinted or if there is a failure of imprinting then the mother's gene is also activated and the father's gene is also activated and then there lies the problem so gene expression of igf2 is dependent on which gene has got activated and can we go to the next slide the next slide please and there is a wonderful paper no not this previous one previous slide please which has come in neuroscience news the cambridge study by sandoviki which came in december 2021's journal and it said that paternal igf2 gene is the gene in the fetus which is responsible for the growth of the placenta and the blood vessels and if the maternal gene has got activated that means igf2 in the mother has got activated then the blood vessels in the placenta become smaller they become thinner obviously the mother has a competition with the baby for survival and therefore when the mother's gene is active the placenta is naturally going to be small the baby's birth weight is going to be low and this happens only when there is what we call as failure of imprinting if imprinting is good only one gene is active paternal gene is active baby's birth weight is excellent but if there is failure of imprinting the maternal gene the mother's gene also in the baby starts active and this imprinting produces a low birth weight child what does imprinting depend on imprinting depends on one mechanism and that is methylation we spoke about epigenetics 15 minutes ago and imprinting depends on methylation so if the methylation is good imprinting is good but if the methylation is bad there is imprinting failure and what does methylation depend upon it depends only on folic acid folic acid and folic acid so give folic acid to the adolescent girl give folic acid right from preconceptional period and from the fifth intrauterine period right later on well you will at least do one good thing and that is the imprinting of genes the methylation of genes will be good and one of the genes is going to be insulin like growth factor 2 and i believe there lies the future of genetics at least for me as a pediatrician and i am sure to many of the gynecologists can i have the next slide please and therefore 
we conclude that genetics of tomorrow before i conclude will i only tell you that future husband or let me say future partner saying to her to his wife or girlfriend honey so nice we got a designer baby and the barcoded baby also is born so today even barcoded baby of tomorrow is going to be born with the entire genome located but the future for india the next and the last slide please thanking all of you for a very patient listening i only conclude by saying that there is no substitute for clinical diagnosis in genetics if you miss a down syndrome by not looking at the hand and the face of the child the boat is missed so there is no substitute for good clinical diagnosis many newer investigations are coming so good laboratories wishing all the best for all the new laboratories are coming they are getting better and better non invasive methods are coming through and therefore the mother mother's blood can be taken for many diseases not just 50 but maybe hundreds of genetic diseases and the accuracy is going to increase and increase and increase so 100% accuracy in prenatal diagnosis and we are going to get designer babies i wonder whether the romance in life will go away but maybe not and therefore for india what do we have for our country still for the next 20 years we have to look after the adolescent girl and see that her health is good you are giving her good protein diet good folic acid and may i at least pray to this audience that girls in my country girls in maharashtra will be eating along with the male folks in the house and not eat at the last in the families that they are living thank you very much thank you so much my personal thanks to all my students i would like to see each one of them personally and pay my greatest respects for being such good doctors and serving the society thank you so much thank you madam my thank you madam thank you mic nahi chala Thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful oration. Uh, you did absolute justice to the topic and showed us the window, not only from the you know past instances but the future window to the future. And the message that you you gave that not the only the investigations but. the clinical diagnosis is so so important and what we all need to do to improve the situation in our own country thank you again we do did miss you here but you made it up for you know with a wonderful oration that you have given we hope to see you here sometime in pune and in this all in person for more and more such uh, teachings from you thank you so much ma'am my heartfelt thanks to all of you thank you so much मला ससून हॉस्पिटल मधल्या पहिल्या गर्ल चाइल्ड ला उद्या ती देऊ शकाल का आपण माझ्या वतीने थँक्यू सो मच थँक्यू जरूर जरूर मॅडम हा मी अस्मिता गुप्ते मॅडम ना विनंती करते नाही तिथे आपण कॅमेरा आणू मॅडम मॅडम कॅमेरा जरा मी हे करणार
डॉक्टर अस्मिता गुप्त अस्मिता गुप्ते मैडम ऑल द वेरी बेस्ट फॉर ऑल योर ग्रेट वेंचर्स एंड ऑल द नाइस थिंग्स दैट यू आर डूइंग बोथ डॉक्टर गुप्ते डॉक्टर संजय गुप्ते एंड डॉक्टर अस्मिता गुप्ते मैडम थैंक यू एंड डॉक्टर गंभीर एंड डॉक्टर नवरंगे नवरंगे थैंक्स फॉर बेरिंग विथ मी सो पेशेंटली चाइल्ड For delivering the second IME Pune, Dr. Asmita Gupta oration uh, on genetic insights, um, the theme genetic insights and uh, past, future, present, and future of uh, genetics. Thank you so much, Madam, for your wonderful explanation. खूप आभारी आहे, धन्यवाद, and my greatest blessings to all of you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for spending time. Thank you, Madam, for a memorable oration. It will be remembered for a long time to come. Thank you, Madam. You have sparked the genetics, genomics ignition. You have sparked in the audience. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Very good solution. Very good solution. Last word. Last word. Last word. युनिक गोष्ट संगत की अपने कड़े पितृ पंद्रवाड़ा चालू है पितृ पंद्रवाड़ा पितृ पंद्रवाड़ इज सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ जेनेटिक्स फ्यूचर ऑफ मैन कैंड एंड अब ऑल दिस इज दिक्स दैट इज अवर लाइफ स्टाइल सो वी हैव टू बी वेरी केयरफुल इन हाउ वी हेडल चीज दैट है and what we are going to actually we are passed on to the next generation so we have to handle that very carefully so that is the message that madam has given us to her talk and so that is the celebration of genetics so whatever the the inheritance of knowledge that you have given us madam we will carry to the future thank you madam. thank you so much thank you so much thank you madam you all can say May I now request uh, Dr. Kedar Patil, uh, the secretary, for the vote of thanks. <laughs> We are indeed privileged today to have a notable dignitary uh, delivering the uh, oration today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mudla Patil, Madam, for the. Uh, I mean, it was a recap of our. Uh, Medical knowledge from 12th standard, starting with genetics, coming to applied pediatrics, and day to day use and future of genetics. Madam has covered it very well. Thank you. We are indeed privileged to have Gupte Hospital and uh, Ashika Gupte Madam oration last year. It was delivered by Dr. Raghunath Mashekar, who showed some wonderful innovations that are going on in medical field. And we are privileged to continue with this oration, uh, getting great speakers who add value to I M A Pune. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are thankful to Gupte Hospital, Greenery Labs, uh, for making this possible. Also, uh, there have been great inputs and efforts by uh, the I M A team, comprising of the trustees, office bearers, uh, managing committee, and of course, uh, you people coming in big numbers. Uh, the delegates and senior members coming for this program add value to this program and thank you all sincerely for making this possible and also our INS staff who's been who's been working for this uh, program uh, and uh, with this I thank you all respected uh, chairpersons dignitaries uh, we take for lunch now lunch is being served on the ground floor uh, and at the boardroom for the dignitaries. Thank you.
Maybe to also thank Dr. Diyakar sir, who has come all the way from Bangalore. Thank you sir for joining us today and all the chat persons who did a wonderful work. Thank you. I request all the managing committee members to come uh, on the stage for a quick photo, please. We would join that for the most time session shop at the Oh. Uh, I request uh, Gupte sir and Dr. Haryan sir and Dr. Gupte sir, please be over here. You felicitate Dr. Gupte.
अतुलला फक्त सांगून टाकू की फ्रूट जे पाठवले त्याचे नाही ऍक्च्युअल मध्ये नाही
A very good afternoon to all of you. Sayani Kurka Jan Hila Sila Sarukai. Good afternoon all. I welcome you again for the Pusla session. For this session, I would like to invite the chairpersons, Dr. Alka Sitsagar and Dr. Padmayar Madam on the stage. We have an interesting topic to discuss. Uh, by Dr. Uparna Shinde, an eminent cardiologist. It's about preventing, how can we prevent sudden cardiac deaths and know the cardiac risk? Over to the chair first, please. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce the 
Next speaker, Dr. Ruku Pavyan Kinde. You think it doesn't require any introduction? It's a very, very well known cardiologist. But as a formality, I'll be introducing him. He has done his MD medicine from BT Medical in 2003. He did his DNP cardiology from Rudy Hall Clinic 2008. Fellow Indian Society of Electrocardio Cardiology. Fellow American College of Cardiology. Former Director. Alja Clinic, Pune, India's first life liver surgeon, former editor, Indian Journal Electrocardiology, clean interest in heart failure, exercise physiology, electrocardiology, basing, and device therapy. He has, he has many uh, publications in national and international journals. Reviewer for various international things. Over to Dr. Ritupanna Shinde for his very important talk on can be know your cardiac risk. Over to Thank you, you sir. Thank you, Padma Madam. Thank you, IMA Pune, for inviting me. And uh, very much big thank you to Professor Gupte, sir. Not many people know that there are two people who saw me on the first day of my life. One of them is Dr. Gupte, who conducted my delivery, and Dr. Naurange, who was my pediatrician. So it gives me great pleasure to be here, especially in this postprandial session when everybody is into a siesta mood and about to go to sleep. So let's see if I am able to keep you awake for the next 15 to 20 minutes. I promise you I will not bore you. I will not get into the details of technicalities of genetics, but we will see what we are going to take application wise in a genetics and sudden cardiac death we all know sudden cardiac death is a big problem nowadays somebody is dying here there some doctor some runner some marathoner they're all dropping dead and you all know that it, this is a electrical problem of heart vis-a-vis -vis heart attack which many people think lay people that is somebody dying with sudden death is always having a massive heart attack so we have to first understand that sudden cardiac death is not heart attack it is an electrical phenomenon and heart attack is basically a vascular phenomenon so heart attack gives you time sudden cardiac death does not give you time so only thing which can save you is timely defibrillation and timely cpr which the rates of which are absolutely low in our country that's besides the point it is a topmost killer in western countries as well as in india india the data is almost unavailable but still whatever is data sudden cardiac death racks at the very top of the death causes in india you have seen all these uh, media coverage of various deaths but we learn nothing from them so if you see sudden cardiac death as a cause of natural death the majority of sudden cardiac deaths happen in people with normal structurally normal heart and no history and symptoms of cardiac disease so it comes out of the blue the word itself has sudden it comes as a bolt and the first symptom can be death and that is why it is imperative for us to know do can we restratify and can we get some clues that we can have a sudden cardiac death and act accordingly and i think genetics is going to play a huge role in doing that so if you look at the causes of sudden cardiac deaths in young they're broadly divided into two one is cardiomyopathy and other is called a channelopathy don't go by these big names cardiomyopathy is basically a myocardial muscle disease structural problem with the myocardial muscle structural oblique functional and the channelopathies are sometimes channels ion channels sodium potassium calcium rhinodin receptors these are the channels which create instability into, into the electrical and structural instability into the cardiac muscle and then they cause arrhythmogenesis. So these are the broadly two things which come to our mind when we talk about sudden cardiac death from electrical causes. So broadly when we disc, uh, divide them, first reason which comes to our mind is coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease, yes, it induces sudden cardiac death, but that is a structurally abnormal heart. The second subset of this is non-ischemic and in non-ischemic we have cardiomyopathies like sec secondary cardiomyopathies wherein it is post myocarditis, post valvular, post alcohol or post hypertension. So there is some reason to this uh, these particular 
uh, uh, cardiomyopathies by which there is a hypertrophy or oblique dilatation of the heart and it leads to dysfunction of the heart. So these are quite okay. We have seen in COVID a lot of problems post COVID myocarditis causing LV dysfunction, arrhythmia, sudden cardiac deaths. Been there, done that. But more problematic are the primary cardiomyopathies where you do not have any reason. So these are basically genetically determined. These happen in families and they are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where heart is very thick, dilated cardiomyopathy where it is weak and dilated. And there is a third subset called as arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, which are actually something similar to dilated, but they have more arrhythmogenicity. So they are very unstable. They are Fudner heart. So they give rise to various impulses and they cause ventricular fibrillations and VTs. And they are very important to know we can prevent that. So RCM, restrictive cardiomyopathy and LV non-compaction. Again, these are uh, parts and parcels, some you can say a cousin, brother, sisters of dilated cardiomyopathy. And the last ones are the channelopathies. The names are big, Brugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, short QT syndrome, radiopathy, we have catecholmonergic. But these are essentially problems with the iron handling in the heart. And they are all monogenic. Some of them are polygenic, some of them are monogenic. And monogenic means you can actually diagnose them by doing certain gene testings. So whenever we're talking about genetic testing, is it just like a lab, pathology lab that you take out blood, send it to the lab, get the report and start medicine? No. Genetic testing starts at testing, but ends at various components. Many of my prior speakers must have, there are some counseling involved, there is a family counseling involved, there are insurance, there are employment, there are a lot of issues. So it's essentially genetic center is not a lab. It's a multidisciplinary center wherein you have all these people because the real problem starts after you get the result of a genetic test. So he has goshti salu hota jayala genetic test sa report. That's why you require a team effort. And fortunately, we are fortunate to have that kind of setup today with the green array labs wherein a person who really is not really related to genetic field has taken an initiative to establish such a center and i think we deserve all deserve a round of applause for that dr Gupta. so when we're talking about genetics where does the genetics help in sudden cardiac death first and foremost before the event wherein we can can we prevent that event or can we prognosticate that event secondly during the event can we know that this particular gentleman is going to get a sudden cardiac disease, sudden cardiac death, and we can prevent it or during the CPR, can we minimize or maximize the chances of survival? So that is, and third and last, which is usually the case, what happens after the death? Or if he survives by God's grace, somebody has given him a good CPR, somebody has was fortunate to have access to an AED and he survived, what next? Just putting in an ICD is no point. I mean, somebody, ARVC, you put an ICD, he'll get 10 shocks. What about his wife? What about his children? What about his mom, dad? So these things come afterwards. So genetics has a role to play in all these things, pre-event, during event and post-event. So I'm not going to get into the details of genetics. We'll see four representative cases and see how do we apply this genetic testing in the practice. So this is the first case. A 21 year old female who has been diagnosed with a seizure disorder despite normal neurological evaluations. Now, this particular sentence is the most important. Anything which is a resistant seizure in childhood, not responding to multiple anti epileptics, please rule out a cardiac disease. Always remember this is a rule of thumb. Any seizure in children can be a hypoxic seizure due to arrhythmia or sudden cardiac arrest. So, whenever your heart stops effectively, because of ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, there is a hypoxia, hypoxia triggers a seizure. So recurrent seizure, think about arrhythmia, especially when there is no typical seizure and you know the, it presents like a stroke Adams attack. This patient was noted to have, so what is the next thing? So simple things, ECG, 2 echo and reef required halter. So this patient had an abnormal EKG, which was showing prolonged QT interval. Now, whenever I say QT, I remember my residency days because QT means QTC. 
आणि व्हेन एव्हर यू थिंक अबाउट ई सी जी अँड कॅल्क्युलेशन यू रन अवे फ्रॉम ई सी जी बिकॉज यू डोंट वॉन्ट टू कॅल्क्युलेट ॲक्सिस रेट क्यू टी दिस थिंग हाऊ मेनी ऑफ यू हॅव ॲक्सेस टू अ अंडर स्क्वेअर रूट वाला कॅल्क्युलेटर वी नेव्हर हॅड इन अवर कॉलेज डेज बट नाव इट इज विथ द टच ऑफ अ पाम यू हॅव ॲप्स यू जस्ट पुट इन द मिलीमीटर्स अँड यू गेट क्यू टी सी यू पुट इन द एज यू गेट करेक्शन्स बॅझेट्स फ्रेडरिशियाज ऑल काइंड्स ऑफ नॉन सेन्स फॉर्म्युलाज आर देअर सो यू डोंट रिक्वायर एनी काइंड ऑफ अ स्पेसिफिक कॅल्क्युलेशन यू गेट द रिझल्ट डायरेक्टली so whenever you see qt prolongation correct it for the heart rate and see whether it is more than 480 or whatever the thing is and then go ahead not only you have to see the qt prolongation but some phenotypes of the ecg they are also important i'll come to it later so this gentleman does this uh, lady had qt prolongation then a holter monitor was attached which revealed polymorphic vitis now this polymorphic vitis are very interesting monomorphic vitis are relatively stable polymorphic vitis are twisting vitis which show different twisting of around the points tdp so these particular are very unstable and they can definitely degenerate into a ventricular fibrillation so it is very important for us to know that and her family history again very important thing whenever you analyze a genetics related disease or anything with a sudden cardiac death always take a detailed family history so this lady had a maternal aunt and maternal grandmother so i म्हणजे तिची मावशी आणि आजी आईच्या कडची आजी दे हॅव डाईड सडनली ॲट एज ऑफ नाईन्टीन अँड ट्वेंटी नाईन सो दॅट गिव्ज अस अ क्लू रिगार्डिंग द मेंडेलियन इनहेरिटन्स ऑल्सो सो दिस इज व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट नाव ऑब्विअसली दिस डज नॉट रिक्वायर एनी रॉकेट सायन्स दिस वॉज अ लॉंग क्युटी सिंड्रोम विच वॉज रनिंग इन द फॅमिली नाव व्हेअर डज जेनेटिक सो आय डिड नॉट रिक्वायर एनी जेनेटिक टेस्टिंग सो व्हेअर डज जेनेटिक टेस्टिंग रिक्वायर एल क्यू टी एस हॅज गॉट थर्टीन डिफरंट जिनोटाईप्स एल क्यू टी एस वन टू थ्री फोर टेन वेन आय वॉज इन यू एस इन मेयो क्लिनिक देर वॉज अ प्रोफेसर अकरमान मायकेल अकरमान अँड हिज ओनली ओ पी डी वॉज फॉर एल क्यू टी एस सो दिस जेंटलमन हॅज डिस्क्राईब सेवंटी फाय पर्सेंट ऑफ द एल क्यू टी एस जिनोटाईप फिनोटाईप कोरिलेशन्स वॉट एव्हर इज पब्लिश इन लिटरेचर एल क्यू टी एस आर व्हेरी स्पेसिफिक दे हॅव व्हेरियस डिफरंट फायडिंग्स ऑन ई सी जी विच आर व्हेरी क्लासिकल सो दिस इज वन कंडिशन वेअर यू कॅन प्रेडिक्ट द जिनोटाईप बेस्ड ऑन द फेनोटाईप ऑन द ई सी जी by field t waves slow lazy upstroke of t wave so these are different different and why do i need to know whether it is lqts 1 2 or 3 mere ko kya karna hai i just want to impress you no the triggers of arrhythmia are different in every lqts so lqts 1 lqts pregnancy is the trigger other lqts auditory stimuli are the trigger third one sleep is the trigger fourth one something else is the trigger and accordingly the treatment also changes and that is why if you see uh, the lower uh, part on the right hand side there are some drugs which help in specific genotype of lqts so like mexilitin is useful in lqts 3 lqts 1 you can just paste them somebody who is not affording icd so icd is cost like 5 lakhs 6 lakhs they are not affording but the lqts 1 is there you can just put in a normal pacemaker paste them with 80 90 instead of 72 their chances of getting vf are reduced qt is shortened so these are the way by which you know that by knowing the type of subtype of lqts you know how to prognosticate if you look at this these are the representative cartoons where exactly we can actually find out etiology and how can you do so if you know that somebody is harboring a gene of lqts and is not yet had any kind of cardiac arrest or syncope but you have to be careful he may have in future so you may give some preemptive things you may give some uh, advice that you don't do heavy exercise or you want to put in an icd to someone icd is a big thing in india so you require either a survivor of the cardiac arrest or you what is called as 1.5 prevention so primary prevention sati icds are not cost effective in india so if you have a genetic study which says that this has got a scn5 a gene boss you can go for icd because you will never know you will get into a fibrillation or there are some subtypes which are amenable for radio frequency ablations so genetics plays a big role in guiding us for that coming to another case a 21 year old female she was referred to a lipid clinic now this is a very common problem and in october 21 she was invited for a genetic testing because she had abnormally high lipid levels and i'll tell you you see here the cholesterol was 334 ldl was 255 hdl 42 triglycerides were closely normal 
so familial hypercholesterolemia is a very common problem because we don't look at aplala vatta ki fakt cholesterol vadle no especially if somebody is having a high cholesterol more than 190 200 ldl please ask them history of coronary artery disease now in this gentle one ask the history and it is studied with cardiac events somebody has had a mi somebody has had a bypass somebody has a sudden death somebody has had a mitral infarction so they were all offered cascade testing now cascade testing somebody must have described you you have a initial case and then according to that you do another testing so genetic testing was done in this case and he was found to have apob mutation now i'll come to that there are certain 3 to 4 mutations which are very important in familial hypercholesterolemia and then therapy was started why it is important to know familial hypercholesterolemia it is an imminently treatable condition it is not like something like a waste basket diagnosis where you diagnose and then say yes i have diagnosed and forget you what can you do nothing but here you can have a treatment in fact i remember 15 years ago dr ms ramat did world's first angioplasty left main angioplasty in a 10 year old girl she was homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia that time we had tough time getting statins in fact uh, mr khanna from mqr provided her free of charge statins but then you all are aware high dose statins have their own problems but nowadays we have amazing drugs pcsk9 inhibitors we have bempedoic acid we have other medicines which can actually treat this hypercholesterolemia very well and that is why it is very important how do we diagnose familial fh we call there are some criteria which have family history personal history physical signs like simple sign looking at their tendons tendo achilles and this area you can see the xanthomas you can see arcus senilis ek sada torch do at taka arcus senilis somebody with age for 35 having arcus senilis go for his blood lipid levels and last thing dna testing if you see the criteria says more than 8 or equal to 8 points is familial so if somebody has a genetic variant he is directly diagnosed you don't need to get any other criteria and that is very important so these are the three four genes which are very important ldl receptor pcsk9 and apob some are over working some are under working and they give rise to heavy uh, loads of cholesterol and definitely incidences of uh, coronary artery disease are very high and these are very common in fact dr sahani from delhi has got a huge data on heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia it is as common as 1 in 10 people we don't have any big cohorts though but there is a registry which is going on under the aegis of lipid association of india but very common familial hypercholesterolemia and make sure that you do not uh, miss these people try to screen their uh, siblings and descendants also and the treatment of cholesterolemia is also very fascinating there are drugs which are genetically engineered drugs in fact the there are two drugs in the right corner lomitamide and mepomersen these are drugs which introduce a stop codon a stop codon is the codon in a dna formation where the formation of dna stops so this stop codon is introduced via these drugs and cholesterol production is stopped there is something called as missense rnas which are introduced so these are the drugs which are very much fascinating drugs and the future medicine in fact even coronary artery disease might lie, lie the solution might lie in such kind of drugs coming to the third case 19 year old female a soccer player had an eye, uh, abnormal ecg with tva inversions to in v1 to v3 in a routine evaluation nowadays there is a fad of doing marathons and runnings and you always hear he was running and he just dropped dead problem is that nobody does a monitored exercise test in these people neither they do not monitor their own intensity so simple thing like american college of sports cardiology has said simple ecg nikalo they don't advise eco but in india eco is as cheap as doing a test so you can always do an eco also you get additional information so ecg and eco simple thing some changes you can go for further evaluation but do not especially after 40 if somebody who is sports enthusiast wants to become like dr norange and run every year but not everybody is dr norange his fitness levels are beyond comparison you know he is blessed for that and he is be he has toil hard for that but somebody like me who doesn't exercise that regularly wants to run a 40k no you have to undergo 
a cardiac evaluation. So this lady had a cardiac evaluation done, then Holter monitor was done, which showed frequent PVCs. Again, very non-specific, but yes, so ECO demonstrated a mildly enlarged right ventricle with apical wall motion abnormality. Now, whenever we see apical or any wall motion abnormality, the next knee-jerk reaction is NGO Kebejo. My boss, my teacher, Dr. Professor Durai Raj used to say, Ritu, you want to become a cardiologist, become a cardiologist. Don't try to become a blind stentologist. So never ever, whenever you see an abnormality in ECO does not equal to sending for angiogram. So this apical hypokinesia is not induced by coronary artery disease. This is induced by fibrosis. And whenever there is a fibrosis in the heart, it's a nidus for arrhythmia formation and ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation formation. So this is apical wall motion abnormality, RV was little enlarged. So again, going towards dilated cardiomyopathy. So the appropriate investigation next is cardiac MRI. Now this cardiac MRI also requires certain things about cardiac disease. This is a very, very important test. See your ECO tells you about structure. I mean, there are some things in ECO like tissue Doppler, speckle imaging, strain. They tell, tell me about muscular level movements of the heart. But cardiac MRI tells me about scars, tells me about fibrosis, tells me about late gadolinium enhancement. Tells me that this gentleman is going to get a heart attack, going to get a heart arrest. So this is very important. Cardiac MRI is available in the city of Pune, Mumbai. Although there are very few centers which interpret this very well but then you have to make use of this cardiac MRI especially patients with syncope patients with intractable epilepsies patients with suspected arrhythmias always make use of cardiac MRI and this confirmed areas of fibrosis corresponding to the wall motion abnormality and again family history she reported a paternal cousin who experienced sudden cardiac arrest while running track and has an ICD so somebody in family has an ICD Going further, it was revealed to be ARVC. ARVC is arrhythmogenic right ventricle cardiomyopathy. Somebody in your family has it. And he was found to have a gene variant called PKP2. This PKP2, forget about the name. There will be 100 names which will be bombarded today. So there is a gene which codes for P uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And this lady was also tested for that. And obviously, after a discussion, she was told not to do exercise. No athletic level activities and was put in an ICD. Additionally, her family members were screened and they were further counseled. Now, again, this is a matter of ethics and morals and uh, legality. Can we just advise an ICD based only on genetically found some variant? The answer, I don't know. There are, it's still in evolution. Maybe some other people in this field can tell me, but yes, if he is affording and if somebody is having and there is some clinical history, definitely they can go for an ICD. So these are cardiomyopathies. As I told you, cardiomyopathies are either thick, that is hypertrophic, dilated. And in dilated cardiomyopathy, it is not lack of blood supply which makes them dilated or weak. It is the molecular level problems with the sarcomere of myocardium, various problems, actin, myosin, intercalated disc, everything is coded by a gene and they can give rise to a dilated cardiomyopathy. And whenever it becomes unstable, then you get what is called as arrhythmias. And this is the third option, the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, what this lady had. Again, there are four or five genes which code for this. Some of them have Mendelian inheritance. See, if they follow Mendelian inheritance, it is very easy to diagnose. But there is something called as polygenic inheritance. Whereas there are many genes, many environmental factors, they come together, but still you can prognosticate, you can risk stratify these patients based on gene condition. Last case, a 49 year old man suffered a sudden cardiac arrest while lifting weight. So cardiac arrest. He's underwent cardiac evaluation, coronary angiobikia, echo kia, MRI, nothing found. His first elect ECG showed first degree heart block, very non-specific finding, no LQT, nothing, nothing, nothing. So there is no clear family history of cardiomyopathy. Nothing. He was diagnosed as an idiopathic wave. Always remember he had a cardiac arrest and he was put in an ICD. A comprehensive cardiomyopathy arrhythmia genetic testing was ordered and was found to have a defect in a gene called as SCN5A. This is a sodium channel encoding gene and this is a very important gene. This shows how genetics plays. SCN5A codes for three to four cardiac conditions depending on how it is expressed. If it is a lack of function, it becomes Brugada. If it is gain of function, it becomes LQTS. So this is called as allelic polygenity. So depending on how this plays, 
you get different diseases and they all end in sudden cardiac death. So Brugada syndrome and all you must have heard many times, but this is one of the basic genes of Brugada syndrome and just carrying the disease like BRCA, BRCA1 in gynecology. Nowadays there is a fad of do BRCA1 and get your uh, uh, the breast removed, thanks to Angelina Jolie. So this is a BRCA1 of sudden cardiac death, SCN5A. So tomorrow people will say do SCN5A and put in an ICD. Are ICDs have that got their own problems, man. I mean, see, so that's why this guy was recommended to have routine cardiac evaluation, avoid sodium channel blocking. Now, very common drugs such as gatifloxacin, terfenadine, cetirizine, they can play havoc with your sodium channels and cause prolongation of QT interval. Add to that, if you have a SCN5A, you are definitely heading for a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and death. So avoid that. Simple thing like fevers have to be treated in these patients very fast. Yesterday only I got a call from my patient who has been treated with an ICD. He said, Mala three shock nahi basla, sir, atta don shock basla. Mala, kaya zala, tula, tapa oh, mani, mala viral chalo hai So he's good now. Yes, it was an appropriate therapy. We checked it, but fever, simple thing, trigger. So clinical screening of uh, two minutes, I'm finishing, madam. So, <laughs> Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, there are various genes. There is something called as gene negative HCM, gene positive HCM. Again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's an abnormally thick muscle. So it is more prone for arrhythmia formation. That much you have to remember. And I'll end my talk with this one slide, molecular autopsy. See, this is the future of sudden cardiac death. When we were in Sassoon, doing a single clinical postmortem was a task because nobody was ready. All the forensic guys were busy in doing medical legal autopsies and pathology, nobody was interested in doing it. In fact, uh, I remember me and Sangali Madam, we had a very interesting case. Nobody was ready to do an autopsy. So what about molecular autopsy? What molecular autopsy is you can preserve the tissues of a dead man. Even clotted blood is enough. And you can actually do a genetic study on that and find out how this gentleman has died. He's died suddenly at the age of 23. Why? Because this is important from his family. This is important from his siblings point of view. And so I think in near future, we will have um, access to things like molecular autopsy. And what about um, guidelines? Yes, our cardiology societies all over the world are now uh, recommending the genetic testing for prognostication for um, uh, diagnosis. And this is how we have to understand that genetic testing is not just for our own benefit it carries a prognostic it carries a diagnostic and sometimes rarely and in future therapeutic value and this is very very important and with this i'll stop my lecture thank you excellent talk sir with uh, practical tips and how to act and it is because of the electrophysiology and it is not um, ischemic. Um, any questions? This lecture, sir, uh, everyone is awake uh, even after lunch. Okay. I mean, <laughs> because it is to the heart. And uh, so it was a wonderful talk, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it, it, it actually works on the de novo pathway. And it reduces. In fact, it reduces so much that they have only licensed this drug in familial hypercholesterolemia. Yeah, so that acts on the particular enzyme which converts, like HMG coA reductase enzyme, you inhibit by statins. It works on that, but at a molecular level. No, but it is very expensive, prohibitively expensive, 25 to 30 thousand dollars for one dose. But for homozygous hypercholesterolemia, they have to do because otherwise they can't live. But bempedoic acid is a drug which has come very recently along with statins. So statin, 80 milligram, 40 milligram you give, he starts getting pains of muscles, aches, sometimes rhodomyalysis. So what you do is 20 milligrams of statin with ezetimib, combinations you get plenty, and add bempedoic acid. Bempedoic acid acts on two steps above in the de novo pathway of cholesterol formation. So you get amazing results. LDL becomes less than 55. It is comparable to those PCSK9 injections, which are again 20,000 rupees per injection every two weeks for whatever you want to take. So nobody takes it. Thank you. And, sir, sir, please wait. Please wait. Sir. Please wait.
सर थैंक यू फॉर कीपिंग एवरी वन अवेक एंजियोप्लास्टी की भीति न घता तुम्हें सगैंक जेवला चा गिल ट्रिप पर घून गए तबल धन्यवाद आय रिक्वेस्ट वरियानी सर डॉक्टर गुप्ते सर एंड डॉक्टर सुहास पिंगड़े सर पास्ट प्रेसिडेंट आई एम ए महाराष्ट्र स्टेट टू कम ऑन द डायस टू फेलिस्टेट डॉक्टर शिंदे ऑल्सो द चेयरपर्सन टू जॉइन फॉर द फेलिस्टेशन I request Dr. Varyani sir to sir Pingray sir come back. Varyani sir to I request uh, Dr. Vijayanti Patodan, Madam, to join the chairperson's desk. <laughs> I request the chairpersons to introduce Dr. Preeti Arora, who would be speaking on how genetics help in diagnosis and management. Yes, uh, Dr. Preeti Arora. She is a dedicated chief genomic scientist with a strong background in molecular biology and extensive experience in leading research and development initiatives. She is a gold medalist in microbiology during her uh, postgraduate studies. She has awarded CSIR fellowship for pursuing PhD. She has done a PhD in microbiology from Agarkar Research Institute in Pune uh, uh, 2019. And she's a uh, chief genomic scientist at Green Array Genomic Research and Solution. She's a strong background in molecular techniques such as uh, Sanger uh, sequencing, next generation sequencing, and chromosomal microarray analysis to contribute to cutting edge research and diagnosis. I think, uh, shall I continue? No, no, no. <laughs> so, thank you very because, much, uh, ma'am, for us. I have provided, yeah, she has provided the guidance and mentorship to the postgraduate students for their dissertation programs and she has published over 20 research articles and book chapters in international journals showcasing a strong commitment to scientific exploration. She has re represented Green Area Genomic Research and Solution on both national and international platforms, establishing strong uh, partnerships and collaborations within the scientific community. So what to yes, yes. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the introduction. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that it's a pleasure uh, that I'm getting today to uh, present some of the interesting clinical cases that we actually have seen at Green Array. Okay, how much this genetic testing has helped in diagnosis and management. So before actually we move or jump into the clinical cases, I just want to give a brief overview of our company that is Green Array Genomic Research and Solution. So starting with the company background, uh, Accurate Diagnostic Private Limited, it's a parent organization of Green Array Genomic Research and Solution. So it's a research and molecular diagnostic laboratory. It's located in Pune and it was established in the year 2020 by Dr. Sajjan Shah. So um, as I already said that Green Area Genomic Research and Solution is not only involved in the diagnostic, uh, along with the diagnostic, uh, we are into very much into in the research and academic section also. So uh, just a minute. Uh, the laboratory has three major department. One is cytogenetic department, another is molecular genetics department, and third is the microbiology department. Uh, we at Green Array are doing all type of genetic tests, whether it's a chromosomal test, molecular test, or the gene expression testing. Under chromosomal, we are doing karyotyping, chromosomal microarray analysis. Under molecular test, we are doing QFPCR. There is a targeted single variant testing. 
single gene gene panel whole exome sequencing and the whole genome sequencing uh, the green array laboratory is equipped with state of the art equipment so we have all the instruments starting from pcr Q, uh, rtq pcr sanger sequencer microarray system and the next generation sequencer so uh, now coming into the diagnostic services i'll just briefly go through what are the services we are uh, what are the tests genetic tests we are doing uh, under preconception we are doing karyotyping there is a genetic carrier screening panel chromosomal microarray whole exome sequencing in prenatal nips fish qf pcr postnatal newborn screening male infertility uh, y chromosome microdeletion there is a single gene test also some gene panel and also the semen microbiome testing we are doing uh, for the male infertility in female infertility fshr gene mutation fragile x syndrome pcos gene panel and there is a comprehensive panel which is covering more than 50 gene on next generation sequencing platform for the recurrent pregnancy loss, there are two different panels. One is short gene panel, which in which uh, our focus is mainly on the genes which are associated with the thrombosis. And another is an expanded panel in which we are covering more than 50 genes on the next generation sequencing platform. Similarly, we are doing various genetic tests on product of conception sample also. So we are doing like chromosomal microarray analysis, fish karyotyping. And in infectious, uh, we are doing respiratory pathogen panel, dengue, chikungunya, HPV, all 14 high risk type, STD, HIV, HBV, HCV, influenza panel, and the TB PCR. Uh, recently, we have validated and introduced our uh, nutrigenomics uh, testing. So in that, uh, we have various comprehensive panel, including the diet panel, weight management panel, fitness panel, cardiac panel, and a PCOS panel. Uh, since I have already explained that we are doing various types of genetic testing under preconception. -pre so in preconception, we are doing karyotyping, chromosomal microarray analysis, that is high resolution 750K. And there is a comprehensive panel that is a genetic carrier screening panel, uh, which is covering 421 gene associated with almost 400 congenital autosomal recessive disorder. So till now, our laboratory has processed more than 1,000 samples for karyotyping and CMA. And similarly, 152 couples are screened for genetic uh, carrier screening. So during this screening procedure, we have come up with some of the interesting case that I'm going to discuss today. So one such case is a case of a non consagonous couple with a history of three recurrent pregnancy loss and that too before the 16 week of gestation was referred to the clinic. So initial um, investigation like hormonal profile of the couple revealed normal parameter and the ultrasound scan was also normal. So uh, basically to understand at the genetic level, uh, they have referred for uh, chromosomal analysis because in case of recurrent pregnancy loss, the majority of cases are because of balanced translocation. So first uh, genetic analysis was referred for the karyotyping. So the results suggested the male karyotyping came out to be normal. In female karyotype, uh, uh, a unique and a novel balanced trans reciprocal translocation was detected between the long arm of chromosome 4 and the long arm of chromosome 13. Since this couple with balanced reciprocal translocation have a 50% chance of having recurrent spontaneous abortions and a 20% risk of having child with abnormal genetic makeup. So this case study thus reported a novel balanced translocation that could result in the formation of unbalanced gamete due to meiotic error associated with first trimester recurrent pregnancy losses. Thus the couple was informed about the risk of birth defects in their offspring due to the karyotype finding. Hence this test helped this couple to make an informed reproductive decision regarding subsequent pregnancies. Now, another case is related to our genetic carrier screening panel. So there was a, a non consagonous couple who lost one uh, male child at the age of one year. Based on the clinical finding, he was suspected to be affected with SMA, but uh, the genetic testing was not done on the affected child. Since the child was no, no longer available for genetic testing, so the couple was advised to go for genetic carrier screening test. So the preconception genetic carrier screening of couple has revealed that both were carrier for SMN1 exon 7 deletion. So this carrier screening test helped identify the genetic disorder that caused the death of a child. 
and uh, carrier screening test can help get a final genetic diagnosis even if the affected child is not available for genetic testing. So this final confirmation can help in prenatal diagnosis in the next pregnancy. Such couple can screen future pregnancy for the presence of defective gene in the fetus and make appropriate informed decision. In prenatal, uh, we are extensively doing the non-invasive prenatal screening, or I can say it's a fetal DNA testing in a maternal blood. So looking into this comparison chart, we can say, uh, we can see that uh, um, the fetal DNA testing is highly sensitive. It is a sensitivity of more than 99.99%. And uh, as compared to the first trimester screening, which has a sensitivity of around 60 to 80%. So this all sensitivity specificity, we all get from the literature and whomsoever have done the testing and the validation point of view. From a lab perspective, I just want to show how much we are confident about the NIPS. What is our observation from a green array lab of point of view? So till now, we have processed more than 2,269 sample for NIPS. So during this screening procedure, uh, we came up with some of the high risk pregnancy, out of which six were trisomy 21 and three were uh, detected as a sex chromosomal abnormality. All the nine sample we have confirmed, um, this high risk sample were confirmed either by karyotyping or fish on amniotic fluid and all six came out to be positive for trisomy 21 and all three came out to be positive for some of the sex chromosomal abnormality. So from this data, I can confidently say the sensitivity and specificity of NIPS screening is more than 99%. So uh, there is also one thought in everyone's mind that uh, when we send sample for a NIPS testing, there are some sample which went in on no call. But uh, from a literature review of, uh, I think uh, there is a literature of 2018, where they have said that in a NIPS, 3 to 5% of sample went into a no call. But at that time, uh, there was no fetal DNA enrichment process was there. Now, with the advance in the technology, we can enrich even the fetal DNA from a maternal DNA and we can reduce this no call. And from our observation, I can say that we have processed more than 2,269 samples and only one sample went into a no call. So that has reduced a lot also and the sensitivity and specificity has also increased a lot also. So uh, there was a case, a uh, 32-year-old pregnant female there was no previous history of any abortion and MTP, no family history of any genetic condition. Uh, their prenatal investigation NT scan normal at the 11 week of gestation, USG normal 13 week of gestation. Uh, she was just referred for an NIPS in her 14th week of gestation just to rule out the possibility of chromosomal aneuploidy. So this NIPS result uh, came out to be high risk for trisomy 21. So this um, high risk pregnancy was uh, again uh, confirmed with either fish and karyotyping and they have also came out to be positive for 21. So in this case study, the patient had no prior indication of any chromosomal abnormality. The NT scan and even the USG reports were normal, but the abnormality was picked up at this early stage of pregnancy, helping her to make an informed decision about the pregnancy at the appropriate time frame before getting into advanced gestational age. So this case, I can say it's a very good example of why NIPT should be considered for all pregnant women, irrespective of clinical indications. Uh, in prenatal, um, as Surgeon Sir has given the brief about uh, everything of the newborn genetic screening. So uh, this, uh, in, a, in a time span of a year, we have uh, screened 790 newborn through this newborn genetic screening panel. And from this statistics, I can say that uh, 5% of sample we observed as came out to be positive through this newborn genetic screening. Some of the variant we detected as a variant of uncertain significance. Some of the newborn are carrier of some of the pathogenic variant. So now if we have a look in the distribution of pathogenic variant in carrier, we can see that there are large number of mutation in our ethnic population are associated with BTD, then G6PD, and then GJB2 gene mutation. So this genetic testing will definitely help in diagnosis and management. 
along with that this data will act further as a database because there is no indian database available right now we are right now also relying on other country database to what condition to be screened which type of mutation are prominent and which are not so this can also help in developing a new database of our indian population so these are some of the distribution of variant that we have observed that in the pathogenic there were some SNPs and enders both are involved. So I can say that this newborn genetic screening panel, it is highly cost effective, it has a great specificity and a fast turnaround time. So there are some newborn cases that we face while doing this newborn screening. A consagnus couple conceived normally, opted for newborn screening. There was no family history of any genetic condition. This screening revealed the newborn to have a homozygous variant in hexa gene known to cause a life threatening rare condition that is Tay Sachs disease, which is commonly characterized by symptoms like loss of muscle coordination and psychiatric symptoms. This is an autosomal recessive condition. The APGR score uh, for the baby was normal, but the baby was uh, still kept under continuous follow up to check if the baby met all the developmental milestone. So after certain follow up till nine months, baby has met all the developmental milestone, later started showing some low weight gain and decreased responsiveness. Therefore, the baby was kept under continuous medical surveillance. Parental testing for this couple for a similar variant showed that both partner were a carrier of this specific variation. So this case is an example of how newborn screening helped the family to know the risk of their newborn to develop a condition in the future that can be life threatening and help the newborn to get on time surveillance and treatment interventions. Also, this information will be useful to the couple in planning the next pregnancy. Um, Another interesting case that uh, we have observed at Green Array while doing this newborn genetic screening was a non consagnus couple with no family history of any genetic condition. They have just opted as a routine screening as a newborn screening and they have an elder son who is six year old. The couple opted for a newborn screening genetic panel for the second child. So this screening revealed that the baby is a carrier for the HFE variant. Is just a carrier of a HFE variant and this HFE gene mutation is basically associated with hereditary hemochromatosis. A mutation in this gene causes increased absorption of iron despite a normal dietary iron intake. So it's an autosomal recessive condition which states that the newborn will remain a carrier means asymptomatic while sharing this genetic finding about the newborn and explaining the inheritance and chance of the baby developing the condition then the couple revealed that the elder son complained of occasional discomfort in the liver area for quite some time so the general uh, investigation is normal for the elder son biochemical investigation was also normal they were asked to check this variant in the elder son as well and he was found to be homozygous for this disease after genetic testing. So this child is at risk of developing the disease and its associated symptoms. The elder child was subjected to further testing immediately and received adequate medical care for this issue. So this is an example I can see how genetic newborn screening assisted in determining the infant carrier state, which proved to be life saving, saving for the sibling who had a severe version of the illness. In male infertility, we are doing uh, various testing. One is such a single gene test that is the FSHR gene mutation test for which we have uh, processed more than 250 sample of different conditions. Some are for oligoesthenozoospermia, oligoesthenoteratozoospermia, azoospermia and asthenozoospermia. So we have observed, observed that uh, um, there is a mutation in FSHR gene which may be associated with male infertility and can be hampering the semen parameter and all. Another test that we are doing in male infertility is a semen microbiome testing, where we have observed there is a drastic difference in the semen microbiome when we compared with a fertile semen with an infertile semen. In recurrent pregnancy loss, we have two different panel, one short gene panel in which we are focusing mostly on the thrombophilia related gene. So here also we have found out that uh, uh, we got a lot many mutation in PII gene and MTHFR gene. There's one case, a 30 year old female who had experienced four recurrent pregnancy loss and one IUI failure. 
there was no known history of any genetic condition in the family amh level was around 4.94 and uh, genetic investigation uh, they went for a small uh, recurrent pregnancy loss panel that is a thrombophilia panel in which a homozygous pathogenic mutation was detected in a PI1 gene. So this PI1 is basically involved in normal blood clotting. So this gene mutation caused complete PI1 deficiency, resulting in impaired production of the PI1 protein. Excessive uh, affected female may have excessive bleeding and abnormal bleeding in pregnancy and childbirth. So and later on, uh, during their follow-up measurement of PI antigen level and PI activity in the female result suggestive of PI activity lower than one unit and PI antigen was undetectable. After she conceived for the next time, close monitoring was and treatment was given. So after the treatment basically was given to prevent the intermittent bleeding in the first and the second trimester, the patient was on strict monitoring as the PI1 gene is also associated with So basically the treatment uh, was given to prevent the intermittent bleeding in the first and the second trimester and the patient was also on a strict monitoring as the PI1 gene is also associated with pregnancy, preeclampsia during pregnancy. At 20, 34 weeks, she developed gestational hypertension, but there was no proteinuria. The blood pressure was also controlled. She delivered a healthy baby. At term, about 15 to 60 percent of women with RPL are found to have one or more mutation predisposing thrombophilia. Genetic factor uh, cannot be modified, but can be managed to a very good extent. Like in this case, diagnosis of a mutation that was leading to thrombophilia was managed uh, through proper medical interventions and care. 
we are also doing the whole exome sequencing we have done a lot many sample and we have come up with most of the interesting cases one such case was a non consanguineous couple presented for preconception consultation with the concern that their previous child was diagnosed with delayed milestone no history of any genetic condition in the fam family uh, the previous gestational screening usg 35 week iugr uh, LSCS done, baby admitted in NICU for five to six days. Clinical detail, affected baby, mild dysmorphic features was there, myopia, myopia was there. So initial genetic investigation was done basically to rule out the chromosomal related abnormality like the karyotyping and the CMA analysis and they come out to be normal. So they uh, further went for a whole exome sequencing and in the whole exome sequencing, a likely pathogenic variant was detected in exon three heterozygous in CHAMP1 gene, which is associated with neurodevelopmental disorder with hypotonia, impaired language and dysmorphic features. So this condition is characterized by impaired intellectual development, speech and language impairment. Parental screening, couple screening, Sanger sequencing was performed for the variation which was detected in the child and the couple was not detected with this variation. So in this case, whole exome sequencing helped in the accurate identification of the condition in the affected child. As the parents were not detected by the mutation which are present,
um, we have uh, validated this HPV self sampling kit in more than 1000 sample. So till now the lab has processed around 2540 sample for HPV and uh, from and that is for the all 14 high risk type not only for the HPV 16 and 18. So from this data I can say that not only the HPV 16 and 18 in the recent year we have found there is a high prevalence of HPV 33 also that is also a high risk type. And uh, looking into this data, we can say that we are getting more number of positive in the age group of 30 to 40, which needs a high screening at this age group. And not only for the HPV 16 and 18, uh, every woman should be screened for all 14 high risk type. So that was about the diagnostic and uh, interesting clinical cases that we actually observed at uh, Green Array Lab. Now, uh, coming into the research and development, as I already told that laboratory is not only focusing on the diagnostic part, our major focus is also on the research and also the academic section. So um, our research laboratory is DSR recognized, that is Department of Scientific and Industrial uh, Research. The primary aim of DSR is basically to promote R&D by industry, support a large cross section of a small and medium industrial unit to develop state of the art globally competitive technology of high commercial potential. So we have our own ethics committee, we have institutional biosafety committee. Now coming into the uh, product that we developed, at Green Array, the first product that we developed was the COVID-19 um, RT lamp based COVID-19 detection kit. So uh, this kit generally doesn't require any hi-fi instrument like a PCR or RT-PCR. We can do the detection simply by a color change. If the sample is positive, it will turn from pink to yellow. And if the sample is negative, it will remain as a pink. So it's just a visual detection of a positive and ne negative samples so this uh, kit was the first kit that we developed at green array and this kit is also optimized against the gold standard rt pcr based covid 19 detection kit and uh, the kit has presented 100 percent sensitivity and specificity for covid 19 rna detection the second product that we developed at green array was the cost effective pcr based hpv all high risk type detection kit after that we realized that some women are not comfortable going to the clinic and giving their samples so why not to design some self sampling kit then we come up with the hpv self sampling kit and this also we have validated in more than thousand sample and uh, the third product that we developed at green array is the cost effective newborn genetic panel so it's a 47 gene panel on next generation sequencing platform basically to screen neonates for condition which are very much commonly observed in Indian scenario. Uh, these are some of our key publication. We are into research. We are publishing all the articles. We have also presented Green Array in various national and international conferences, various poster like uh, in the international conference on prenatal diagnosis and therapy and also on the BGCI. Uh, international conference on recent trend in bioengineering. In this year we have presented two poster in ISPD and again on the BGCI and another in the Molecular Pathology Association of India. So now coming into some of the research projects that are ongoing at Green Array Lab or in our research division of our lab is first is to study the role of semen microbiota in male infertility where we are studying how the microbiome is causing male infertility. Another project that we are working is on the characterization of gut microbiome in obese and lean adult by 16S rRNA gene sequencing. Reproductive microbiota and their role in pregnancy outcome, how the vaginal microbiome is contributing to the recurrent pregnancy loss and also the preterm birth. So we are identifying some of the molecular uh, signature that uh, from which we can determine whether that a particular lady is at a risk of preterm birth or a recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, we are also working on preeclampsia. We are locating an identification of some of the genetic biomarkers. So some of the biomarkers we identified through some of the bioinformatic analysis. Now we are testing this biomarker in actual clinical samples. Uh, another project that we are working is exploring new therapeutic targets for diagnosis and treatment of endometriosis using Omnics approach. Another project is we are looking on the GJB2 gene mutation in Indian population with non-syndromic hearing loss. So these are some of our technical collaboration. We are associated with various um, colleges, research institute, basically for the research and other academic activities. So with the Symbiosis International University in Tignes Biotech, FC, we provide service to Serum Institute of India, IRSHA, research collaboration with MIT, VIT Vellore, Modern College and Symbiosis Skills and Professional University. 
since i already told we are very much into academics also we provide hands on training workshop in advanced molecular biology technique for all the student and anyone who want to learn this technique so more than 2000 students already trained for like starting from dna extraction to sanger and also there is a customized training available if anyone wants to have on next generation sequencing platform and the microarray system also uh this genetic course we have uh, uh, recently come up basically for the clinicians so we are we are covering uh, it's a online certificate course where we are covering everything from the basic of genetics what test to be recommended in which condition where various case scenario everything we are covering in this genetic course for clinicians this is our advisory committee and thank you very much Thank you. Uh, Thank you. With all your this case discussion, I think uh, all the audience must have known the importance of genetic study in uh, day-to-day -day practice now because uh, we need only uh, we uh, require, means uh, have to do all these st studies whenever there are cases not like that. But uh, we have uh, means, uh, we expect only one child. So mm. with that child to be a uh, normal. Or if there is any problem, and we see that uh, many people uh, they are getting married late, yes. so that also the problem uh, uh, comes in this uh, field. So I think uh, you have elaborated the lecture very well, and uh, I must th thank you and all the green, green array uh, uh, equipments uh, we have told. So I think you have just now, Dr. Mr. Ma Atul Maharik has told. So you can visit Green Array Lab. It is at. Uh, the um, uh, happy colony Kothrud, and you can uh, see the uh, you know all the equipments they are really uh, true very well thank you yeah thank you dr preeti it was a wonderful uh, presentation very informative and we really look uh, for to the research data because having Indian data has always been a great toughest challenge. I've been working in yes. medical uh, research for last maybe 15 years and it's really difficult. So look forward to maybe association from our end also and uh, sure. otherwise your results will definitely be the game changer in the field of medicine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ma Any question from the audience? I request Dr. Raju Varyani, sir, to come onto the stage to felicitate speaker, Dr. Preeti Arora, the chairperson, to join for the felicitation. Dr. Sanjay Patil, sir, please join. With this, we move on to the next lecture uh, by Dr. Dark Farkar. It's a keynote address about human microbiome, the next frontier of precision medicine. I request the chairpersons to introduce Dr. Dr. Farkar. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Prashant Dr. Farkar. He is a microbiologist by training and he has obtained PhD in genetics uh, in antibiotic resistance in bacteria. AMR has been one of the most challenging situations globally. He pursued postdoctoral research in molecular and cellular immunology. At present, he is the director of Dr. Agarkar Research Institute, Pune. He has more than 110 papers in international journals to his credit and has 10 Indian and US patents to his credit. So we are really privileged to have you here. And he'll be talking on human microbiome, the next frontier in precision medicine. 
Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir, had told that this is the latest one and very exciting branch, which is going to change the whole scenario, he said. So all of us are looking forward to listening to you, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, for adding additional monovaganic dabao on me because of this last comment. <laughs> Uh, at the outset, I must uh, thank the organizers, especially Dr. Gupte sir, for inviting me. I'm an academician, so I will be talking mostly in terms of the laboratory data that has been generated at various places. Uh, since I'm a microbiologist, my interest has been investigating the microbial diversity associated with extreme pristine and other habitats. And whenever I have been investigating such unique sites where the temperature has been more than 100 degrees Celsius or pressure exceeding 2000 PSI or even the highly alkaline or acidic or highly cold environment, you tend to get, uh, you tend to come across various microorganisms. But having said that, the most unique system where you get to see the extensive diversity is the one which is associated with human and that is something which has been of our interest and that is something that we have been investigating and i would like to uh, throw some light on some of the latest things that have been happening in this particular area uh, whenever we talk about uh, human and we talk about our anatomy physiology that uh, doctors are very well very good at uh, we must appreciate the fact that we are not alone and there are some numbers that I would like to share with you that in uh, in 2008 the entire human genome was sequenced and after that more than 20,000 human genomes have been sequenced and there are several million exons of human genome that have been sequenced and all of us have come to one conclusion and that conclusion is there are more than 20,000 genes in a human genome. That means more than 20,000 uh, proteins that are possibly encoded by our genome. When we compare this data just with the microorganisms which are present in our body or on our body, then that number is staggering. If at all we just try to count them in number, quantify them, then we have 10 to 100 trillion microorganisms and the genes that they encode are more than 3 million. So if we compare with 20,000 genes by human genome and with 3 million or more than that by microorganisms, then we must appreciate the fact that the proteins that are encoded by these uh, bacteria, viruses, fungi, archaea, and several other groups of microorganisms present in our body have to play some important role in our uh, health, in our being well. So what exactly is this microbiome and how exactly they play an important role? So when we talk about microbiome, we don't restrict necessarily to bacteria. We talk about archaea, we talk about fungi, we talk about various viruses which are present. So it's not only these mere organisms, but it is their metabolites, it is their proteins, it is their genes, their structural elements such as protein, peptides, lipids, polysaccharides, as well as various metabolites such as short chain fatty acids, organic acid, and several other, which contribute, which determine the health and metabolism of any human being. Meaning that there is a theater of microbial activity that actually influences our health, our day-to-day well-being. So what exactly uh, does the microbiome have to do with our health? It is something which is very important. Uh, if we look at the microbiome, it is intimately linked with the human health, but this has been done through several activities that they carry out. One of the most important activity has been digestion. And why do I say that? Because in our day-to-day -day routine diet, we have polysaccharides, we have complex carbohydrates, we have proteins, we have lipid oily, and none of these components are taken up by our intestinal epithelium or gut as it is. So it has to be broken down. Our body definitely produces several enzymes which help in its degradation, but we must appreciate the fact that major degradation or major enabling force behind degradation these complex nutrients into simplified absorbable element is played by microorganisms who produce a series of unique enzymes which will degrade it. Not only that, these organisms through their metabolic uh, activities and production of metabolites such as short chain fatty acids, they modulate the immune response also. 
and this is something which is of very interest to us that the immune response needs to be regulated it needs to be maintained in a state of homeostasis and if at all it has to be maintained in a state of homeostasis that means there has to be a balance between pro and anti-inflammatory responses and for that one of the major component that plays a very important role is regulatory t cells or t regs and these t regs are very fluently controlled by the metabolism of the gut microbiome and that is something which is again very important third and one of the major important properties or important facets of this microorganism is the protection against the infectious diseases we eat we drink many times the street food the contaminated water and many times nothing happens to us there is a great story that when robert Koch put forth his postulates and when he proposed that many of the microorganisms are essentially causing disease and he talked about malarial parasite he talks about salmonella and there was one gentleman he just picked up his culture and he drank it and he said show me whether i get that disease and he did not get the disease and simple reason for that is because he had such extensive he was probably blessed with a very healthy microbial flora which offered protection against them and this is something which is very important for us to appreciate that the terrific lining that is there on the gut epithelium which is contributed by these microorganisms is what protects us these microorganisms not only prevent the invasion by the pathogens but it also sometimes produce antimicrobial agents which will inhibit the growth and activity of these pathogens and that is something that our body requires so several activities such as metabolic health again very important parameter because these microorganisms through their ability to produce butyric acid can control the sensitivity to insulin and can control the levels of the glucose and indirectly or directly it is also monitored by the microbial flora something that we rarely appreciate and these are various facts and facets of this microbial population that has been associated with the gut epithelium that really has attracted attention in recent years especially with the advent of some of the interesting techniques uh, which have become available uh, in the various laboratories uh, it has become very easy for us to uh, identify what type of microorganisms are present in our body and what role they could be playing. Con conventionally, whenever we have to map what type of microorganisms are present, usually the techniques that are used routinely, conventionally in pathology labs are microscopic techniques or which are culture dependent techniques. These are the two types of uh, techniques which are followed. If at all, there are microorganisms which are very unique in their morphology, such as pyrochids, uh, malarial parasites, or some of the amoeba or such kind of organisms, yes, they can be identified using the microscopic techniques when you are talking about or when we have considering the specific tissue part. But majority of the organisms, when you have thousands of species which are present in our gut, if you want to characterize them, they, it probably will not be possible for us to use such techniques. Even the conventional cultural techniques, even if you give the school stool sample for analysis, normally the test or media that would be used would be specific for Salmonella, Shigella and such organisms. And you would detect the presence or absence of such organism. What about Clostridium difficile? How many of the labs would look for that and very few the anaerobic cultivation of the anaerobic obligate anaerobic cultures is not very easy not routinely followed and that is the reason why there has to be an alternate approach wherein we can or not only identify what type of organisms are present but whether they are significant in the given context or not that needs to be identified and for that purpose the dna based techniques are very important and just now we have heard from dr Preeti arora that what type of techniques are available in green array laboratory i must say that with the availability of the next generation sequencing techniques it's not really very defective very difficult and not only it's not even very expensive to carry out the sequencing of the entire metagenome now by doing that whatever different types of organisms are present we will get the idea about that but it is not only enough to know what types of organisms are present whether those genes are expressed or not which is the second step and for that purpose one needs to look for the transcriptome analysis that whatever genes are there whether they are getting expressed into rna or not 
even if the RNA is there, sometimes that's not enough. That RNA, whether it is getting translated into protein or not, so proteome sequencing is the third component. And even if the proteins are there, whether the substrate is available, then only those enzymes will act, convert that substrate into a product, and whether that product is harmful or not. And for that purpose, the metabolomics needs to be analyzed. Meaning that one has to have a combination of genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics and metabolomics. So for that purpose, one needs to have access to techniques such as next generation sequencer for genomics and transcriptomics, LCMS or GCMS for the identification of what types of proteins are present and metabolites which are present. Sometimes if at all you are going to have a targeted approach, then for that purpose you need to have the microarray. These were the techniques maybe 10-15 years back, they were unheard of. Only the few very sophisticated laboratories would have access to these and these days this is entire changed and many laboratories have it and we are blessed in Pune to have such laboratory where we can have that. How did we get this idea? How do we combine all this information together? It is not a job for one laboratory or one person. It is a very expensive uh, exercise which needs to be carried out and this exercise was initially initiated after 2008 by a United States government. It was initiated by National Institute of Health and the special grant worth more than 250 million dollars was given by White House through their specific uh, funds that were available at their disposal. Why am I telling you this? Because this underscores the importance of this particular area which was recognized by even the US government and after that they came up with the project and this project was known as the Human Microbiome Project. This was initiated after Human Genome Project was completed and in parallel there was another project which was human intestinal tract program which was run by the European Union. Obviously the Americans were far ahead and they did actually sequencing of more than 3000 reference bacterial genomes from genomes and then they investigated, they sequenced, they identify what were different communities, what were different metabolites which were produced. And later on in the first phase after identifying all this information, in the second phase they targeted three particular conditions. They used the multiomics microbiome analysis a with respect to pregnant woman, B with respect to inflammatory bowel disease and three with respect to type 2 diabetes. So these are the three major diseases where there is a huge uh, body of literature which is available which has explained the relevance and importance of the microorganisms. So in the phase one when the scientist team they carried out diagnosis, they targeted the intestinal system that was the most important one, most diverse one. But in addition to that, they also look for the respiratory tract, they also look for the vaginal tract, they also look for the kidneys and they also look for uh, the, the other parts, that is the oral part where they investigated the microbial uh, population which was there. So when they investigated, they found out specific types of microorganisms which were present, mainly in most of the cases, the microbes that influenced the health in particular cases was the one which were different bacteria and these bacteria were typed, they were identified, they were proposed and I have just listed, I will not go into details of that because it was very clear that whenever you are looking for the dental plaques, there were anaerobic cultures which were prevalent and there were facultative cultures which were prevalent when there was a buccal mucosa which was investigated or even the microbial flora associated with the tongue was investigated. They also did the investigation in certain other cases such as skin which was the largest organ in the human body. They also studied the urinary microbiome and they also studied, they found out that whenever you are investigating the microbial community of the vaginal flora of the urinary tract and the gut microbial population, there were a lots of overlaps. And based on that, they identified certain group of microorganisms. Very interesting numbers that in stomach, there are hardly any microorganisms which are present because of the severe acidity, of course. And this con contribute to 10 to the power 1 to 10 to the power 3 CFU, that is coniforming units per ml. This number goes up to 10 to the power 6 in duodenum, more or less the same in the jejunum and ileum, but in colon, the numbers goes up to 10 to the power 10 to 11. That means there is a thick paste of microorganisms which is present in such cases. 
and these microorganisms if at all their balance is damaged their balance is disturbed if at all there is dysbiosis which is known then it would cause a lot of differences in the gut brain axis the gut brain endo crying axis, gut, uh, heart axis, and several other such parameters are there. In such cases, everywhere there are adverse effect. And what happens when there is a eubiosis, everything is fine. At that time, if you look at the metabolites, then the short chain fatty acids, the antioxidant, pro uh, uh, antioxidant molecules, then there are the healthy gut epithelium and there are several other such parameters you will see all these molecules all these genes expression is enhanced and as compared to that if you look at some of the other parameters such as inflammatory mediators or uh, pathogenic organisms their expression is somehow deletes or it is decreased now what does it tell us this tells us that these microorganisms play a very very important role and if at all you look at uh, some of these um, uh, the neurological disorders I'll just take a minute to <clears throat> yeah so in case of Alzheimer's disease in case of Parkinson's disease in case of autism spectrum disorders in case of gastric cancers you will see that in all these cases the studies have identified what different types of bacteria are present and uh there what exactly uh, they changes i mean whether there is an increase in number of these bacteria or decrease in their number of bacteria has been proven so it actually gives us some kind of insight with respect to the bacterial association with these diseases that in cases of such kind of conditions whether you are going to get up regulation or down regulations in this particular population and that is something that is of our interest because then it gives us idea whether we can use these tools as even a diagnostic tools and that is something which has been of interest so what does this all lead to this all leads to a path towards precision medicine and why do i say that it is because when you take a look at all these factors that is the multiomics approach where you have investigated the genomics where you have investigated the proteomics the transcriptomics the metabolomics and also taken into consideration the individual human genome then that gives you a specific interaction between the body uh, in, in between the individual and its microbial flora once you have understood that then that can lead to a targeted uh, approach i'll give a very simple example let let's imagine a combination of prebiotic and probiotic i'm sure all of us have heard this terminology you have lactobacilli bifidobacteria all such organisms which are known to be probiotics and on the other hand you have also heard of prebiotics such as fructo oligosaccharides zinulin and several other such dietary fibers are there now how does this how can we combine these together as a personalized or precise medicine you can carry out the sequencing of the microbial population when you sequence the entire metagenome from that it is very easy for us to identify which gene belongs to which organism you can in fact by using the technique called as binning you can separate this individual sequence of individual organisms from that we get a clear-cut idea which organism has ability to use or degrade which dietary fibers so from that we essentially get the idea about the choice of those dietary fibers which are not used by harmful organism but which are used by only the helpful bacteria or friendly bacteria and you have the combination of those probiotic cultures which are required for example you want high butyrate producing bacterial culture or you want high acetate producing bacterial culture then you can combine them together and with this approach for a specific individual you can design a targeted one a first fecal transplant case that will happen also can be considered as one of the interesting parameter we all must have heard of this particular case where it was it happened in united states when a person was suffering from bacillary dysentery for a very long time and he was not responding to any of the 28 different antibiotics that were given to him either as individuals or in combinations and at that time doctors decided to try the fecal transplant when his wife who was healthy this particular individual had lost more than 40 kgs of his weight and he was he had become absolutely fragile bedridden in hospital and at that time the 
since his wife has been healthy for a very long time since they both shared the same environment same dietary uh, preferences they took the fecal material from that and through the nasopharyngeal route they introduced it into his body and when it was transplanted within a very short period of time that is within six weeks time this person gained 15 kgs of body weight and that was something which was a very unique case again it was individual at that time whenever these doctors had to go ahead they had initially collected the sample from this individual investigated the microbial flora understood what type of microorganisms he needed but were not there they investigated the microbial flora of his wife they investigated and confirmed that there were no pathogenic organisms were present they in confirmed the compatibility and then this was used and it was all possible because of the availability of these latest genetic techniques or analytical techniques and that is how people go ahead and do that so we all know that we cannot change our genome we cannot change whatever is our genetic makeup but we know that microbiome can be influenced it is very easily influenced by dietary preferences it is very easily influenced by the exercise and even by diseases and even by the drugs we know it can be manipulated we can introduce certain uh, bacterial uh, cultures from outside so what it tells us is as per our requirement whenever we want to do that and when we anticipate that such kind of bacterial introduction is going to be useful we carry out the genome analysis we use this particular sophisticated technique to analyze and then we can prepare a customized formulation and introduce this genome into body and then it can be very easily used. There are several examples, especially with respect to type 2 diabetes, that there is when there is an abundance of butyrate producing bacteria, it is linked very strongly with type 2 diabetes. With colorectal cancer, there is a very strong correlation between prevalence of the Fusobacterium and Porphyromonas, which is a dental pathogen, by the way, and it has impact on the colorectal cancer. There is a liver cirrhosis where you know there is a low abundance of friendly bifidobacterium and lactobacilli and there is a higher abundance of potentially harmful bacteria such as members of Enterobacteria and Valonirilaceae. So these are the several cases where we know. So from this kind of data, we can actually look for a combination treatment to inhibit the harmful bacteria and to promote the friendly bacteria. And if at all we come up with such kind of combinations, then that would definitely help us in making use of microbiome for the application in the medicine and there are several examples of such therapeutics which are dietary interventions which are absolutely fine and there are prebiotics probiotics symbiotic which is combination of both there are antibiotics there are fecal microbiota transplantation and now these days you get the capsules and it has become very uh, acceptable way of uh, taking the fecal transplant and uh, the company will make the customized capsule for consumption and one can use it there is a customized phage therapy and there is a customized biotherapeutics where certain antibodies which are targeting certain harmful proteins or agents when they are to be targeted these antibodies are expressed on the surface of bacteria and then those bacteria are introduced so that they will get into our environment and they will express such kind of antibodies so there are different ways in which we can use them and this in this particular slide i have tried to summarize i will not go into the details of that because in crusk we have discussed most of this part but i would just like to uh, differentiate at this particular point what exactly is the difference between the probiotic and fecal transplant uh, normally if at all we want to see a uh, individual where the host physiological augmentation is to be obtained or achieved for that purpose we can give the probiotic treatment when we know that because of the presence of pathogen diets antibodies alcohol and environmental parameters and several combinations of one or few or more or all of these then there is a disturbance of the microbial community structure which is known by the term dysbiosis then obviously we have to have some kind of intervention and that at time to replenish the entire gut flora with the healthy flora normally a combination of broad spectrum antibiotic followed by the treatment with the microbial population is followed to achieve the microbial equilibrium and restoration of the healthy flora and this is where the 
uh, fecal transplant from with the availability of the healthy donor who has the same dietary preferences who also has the uh, which is who also is from the same environment uh, can be used and this is something that can be achievable so towards the end i would just talk mainly about the examples of the microbiome based therapeutics i have listed certain examples for just uh, for our information and these are some things which have been investigated which have been proved to be useful uh, there are certain cases where the challenges and ethical that uh, ethics about uh, the use of this microbiome needs to be discussed and there are ch challenges in the form of suitability of the cultures that we are using the biosafety of the cultures that are to be used, especially some of the borderline cases where you are using streptomyces species. There are certain saprophytes, certain pathogenic and some friendly species. You have to have a very accurate identification as well as quality check to use such kind of cultures. You have to have a very terrific and in-depth microbial characterization that has to be done. And after only having the uh, several human trials, to prove its stability, to prove its usefulness, to prove its harmlessness, then only we can go ahead with this. So there are challenges which we have listed some of them, the unidentified microorganisms, especially the viruses, because whenever we are doing this, these are some of the parameters which normally are not very well uh, understood or investigated. Some of these cultures need to be properly identified. That is one part understanding the interactions and dynamics and adaptation is something that needs to be investigated and identifying specific microbial molecules as well as the mechanisms which regulate the host health are something which has to be identified i would say that at this particular time we are in early days we are in early days because this is a new up and coming branch of science this is something which is going to have profound implications on our health. This is something which offers as a wonder pill, which would have uh, ability to cure several diseases. But if at all it was the case, then it would have done so earlier. So there is need for a lot of investigation that we need to carry out. And this is something that has been done. As uh, in the previous presentation, Dr. Arora mentioned that they are collecting the data for the human population, for the Indian population. This is something which is very important and I must stress on this, that there are several efforts, but there is still a paucity of information regarding this. And if at all we want to take this further, and if at all we want to find these uh, as a solution for some of the diseases, which can be affordable solution, which can be in the interest of society to achieve such societal benefits, I believe that there is a need to work very closely. I always believed that doctors in India are where the they are the best of the brains but maybe because of several reasons as every individual doctor has to look for so many patients very few if any doctors are involved in the research but that is the need of the hour if at all even one percent of the doctor even any one of any or few of the doctors are ready to give one percent of their time for research related to development of the newer therapies which could be for useful for the indian population then i believe that our country will have a great future again i would like to thank the organizers for giving me opportunity to share some of my thoughts and introduce this interesting topic and i hope that when we meet next we will have far more data to discuss thank you thank you so much thank you dr prashant sir it was a wonderful and really uh, a talk which has given a lot of vision to every listener present in this house and uh, yeah, thank you for introducing uh, most of the doctors to the new horizon in the field of medicine and the future, which is not very far off. It's it has to come soon. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, can we take up a question, sir? Sure, sure. Yeah. How do you do fever transplant? No. Okay. So now this has become a very routine technique uh, where there are certain companies which offer you these services. So what doctors do is they initially carry out the screening of the individual, the donor. 
and they also carry out the screening of the recipient they identify the need of specific type of cultures and then in those cases those cultures are put in a capsule in a lyophilized form and these capsules are administered earlier days they used to prepare the enriched solution of bacterial culture and through nasal nasopharyngeal route they used to introduce this now they don't do that they just prepare the capsules and those capsules can be engulfed Okay, Father Sir, yeah, that was an excellent uh, lecture and uh, giving future insights. I would say, Madam mentioned about barcoded babies. Probably you are speaking of barcoded uh, pupils in future. So I request uh, Dr. Gupte Sir, Dr. Sanjay Patil Sir, and President uh, Dr. Varyani Sir to join the felicitation uh, of the speaker and the chairpersons to join. I request uh, Gupte sir to felicitate the chairpersons. Padmayar Madam, she is trustee, I am a Pune. <laughs> Dr. Alka Shirsagar Madam, treasurer, I am a Pune. Dr. Vaijanti Patwadhan, Madam, Managing Committee Member and Past President, I am a Pune. We thank all the chairpersons for chairing this session. Thank you, the chairpersons, for chairing the session. I take this opportunity on behalf of IMA Pune from bottom of my heart. We wish to thank Dr. Sanjay Gupte sir and Dr. Rasmita Gupte madam for this wonderful CME and oration. IMA Pune wishes to thank you and I request Dr. Sanjay Gupte sir. Sanjay Gupte sir, please, please come on to the dais. I request President Raju Variani sir, Dr. Sanjay Patil sir, Dr. Navrange sir, and Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, madam, to come on to the dais. We wish to felicitate Gupte, sir. Madam, will you be a, okay. Request Dr. Arti, please join this Dr. Surgeon. What is the second lecture?
moving on to the next session we have a lecture by dr seema gaikwad on earliest and fastest detection of infectious diseases for this i would like to invite the chairpersons dr raju varyani sir and dr sanjeev khud an eminent gynecologist to chair the session uh, we also wish to thank the whole team of uh, dr gupte hospital and especially mr nitin gupte sir Mr. Avinash Joshi, sir, please, are they here? Okay, <laughs> just. Khali galat ka. Nee, kaise ta kam karna rei loko pude hi hai. That's nahi thi nee. Me magu na chasta. So many times, both of them came to IMA for meetings. So much we discussed. And ya sagya tu nee itka sundar program aaj apla zala. Ya sagyan se khub khub dhanne wada. Kuch hai? ओके ओके सर सर थैंक यू वेरी मच ओवर टू यू द चेयरपर्सन फॉर द सेशन हेलो या गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन इट्स इंडीड अ प्लेजर टू बी अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस वंडरफुल प्रोग्राम एंड माय सिंसियर थैंक्स टू डॉक्टर संजय मैडम एंड माय फ्रेंड राजू एंड द होल टीम uh it was uh, i must thank sanjay for giving me this opportunity because this has given me an opportunity to meet madam our uh, the one who gave a fabulous oration and secondly uh, uh, madam taught me how the baby delivers baby pelvis gyun she is the first one uh, when we were residents junior residents to have learned the first lessons of obstetrics from you and sanjay is the one who taught me hypertonic kavela uh, hypertonic uh, saline gyun um, uh, abortions keli jayji so the first lessons actually were learned from them and so i must thank them for giving me this opportunity to chair this wonderful session so uh, may i request raju to introduce our first speaker we have next talk by dr seema gaikwad madam she will be talking on earliest and fastest detection of infectious disease Dr Seema Gaikwad has done MBBS from Government Medical College Miraj in 2010 she has done post graduation MD microbiology and DNB microbiology over to you Dr Seema Gaikwad madam thank you thank you so much sir uh, thank you IMA for giving me this opportunity uh we shall now discuss earliest and fastest detection of infectious disease so infectious disease as we all know is an emerging branch and cdc has dedicated its one unit uh, to infectious diseases which is called the national center of emerging and zoonotic infectious diseases that is ncezid so cdc defines infectious disease not only as the uh, illness that is caused by germs like bacteria viruses parasite fungi which multiply in the body and then can cause infection but some which uh, some germs which need carrier to spread like food water air by some by vectors out of which some of them are emerging which we have never seen uh, before these are newly diagnosed this which were completely gone and have come up to a new area some which were previously there in that area now they have vanished and now they have coming to some new areas so there are uh, different emerging and reemerging infections as we call them and some of them are zoonotic which are spread by from animals to humans like lyme uh, rabies and all so all this uh, entire uh, classification is given by cdc as as far as infectious diseases goes so when you talk about any uh, disease for that matter a diagnostic cycle comes into picture when you see diagnostic cycle there is a pre analytical phase analytical and anal uh, post analytical phase so when you talk about pre analytical phase it is when you uh, when the patient goes to a physician or clinician he, uh, the physician examines and a test is prescribed some investigations are advised to the patient and the patient is uh, is going to the laboratory to uh, get those tests done so this uh, this phase from where the patient goes to the physicians get examined and the test is advised is the pre analytical phase and when the sample reaches the laboratory to the report is generated is the analytical phase and after that the 
treatment is started and we call it as a post analytical phase so uh, we'll focus on the analytical phase for any infectious diseases we have the basic like we have uh, always been discussing about microscopy we have cultures we have biochemical identifications now that we were doing manual some are some have automations have come up and there are serological tests wherein we uh, detect the antibody antigen titers and then we have come up with molecular uh, analysis so uh, allow me to say that molecular uh, diagnosis is the future. So when I say that, I want you all to ponder over this fact that uh, before, uh, early in 2000s, PCR came into picture. We were uh, taught to advise PCR as a very glamorous test, like some of the viruses, infections, like some parasites, some fungi, still have PCR as gold standards for them for detection of their core antigens or something like that so when you see pcr or molecular diagnostic it has always been so glamorous so expensive these tests were never done in our near neighbor by laboratories they were always been shipped to you know metro cities or some reference laboratories where you would get those tests done at some humongous cost you have to pay like from thousands and thousands and thousands bucks you have to pay but just just when it seemed so impossible to think about molecular diagnostic, COVID happened, pandemic happened. And you know how molecular diagnostic has moved. It was within time of, you know, days and uh, hours, we would get results. Very, very, very rural and remote areas got their VDRL labs were set up where they did their PCR. Samples were picked up from homes. People were quarantined and the samples were picked up from their home. Within hours and times of days, the reports were available. Patient would be quarantined, treatments would have been started, steroids, and patients' lives were saved. That is what uh, molecular diagnosis has done. And this has been only realized, only uh, happened after COVID. We have come to know this fact that yes, it can be done. Yes, it can be done in a cost effective way. Yes, it can be done, done in a timely manner. Yes, it doesn't have to have a fancy name or a fancy laboratory. Yes, we can do it with our present uh, laboratories also. So uh, when you talk about uh, molecular diagnosis, what it is about, it is just to uh, address or to target the nucleic acid, the protein or the antigen, which is responsible for causing that infection. You extract the nucleic acid out of it, you amplify into a detectable level and you detect those. So when you amplify them, you can uh, do a polymerase chain reaction that the small amount of antigen is attached to uh, peptides and polypeptides and the bond is uh, formed and you get a long chain of uh, uh, polymerase chain reaction. The uh, product which is formed after uh, uh, doing a PCR can be detected by various ways. You can just detect it visually by doing a gel electrophoresis. It can be done by uh, fluorescent or direct visualization, sequencing. Or, and when you do a um, uh, polymerase chain reaction and at the same time you visualize it, it is called as real-time PCR. And real-time PCRs or PCRs for that matter has been an integrated and high throughput uh, uh, technology right now. It is also in some cases been uh, proved as point of care. So when we talk about infectious diseases, when we talk about molecular diagnos uh, diagnosis, and when we talk about earliest and fastest detection of uh, infectious diseases, what can be uh, better than discussing tuberculosis, right? So uh, I'm just going to give you a few numbers. I know nobody here uh, needs any introduction to tuberculosis because we live in the world capital of tuberculosis. 28% cases are uh, today, uh, the worst 28% cases we have in India right now. We are among the eight top countries uh, um, loaded with tuberculosis. Every three minutes, two patients die of tuberculosis. So you just imagine by the time we finish our talk, what is what we have what tuberculosis has done to us so uh, how about prevalence so uh, when i praised so much the pandemic like pandemic has given molecular a different era we have come to know that yes uh, diagno molecular diagnosis can be point of care it can be easy it can be uh, you know approachable and things like that but 
the fact we cannot deny is that by 2019, right from 2014 to 2019, we have come long way in diagnosing, detecting, and managing tuberculosis. But this entire goal of tuberculosis uh, management or you know elimination, uh, eliminating tuberculosis was derailed during those two years of pandemic. Our goals were completely derailed. Our figures have been shattering. You know the prevalences have gone above like 90. 90 percent more tuberculosis cases have been reported by 2021 and god knows what's going to happen in 2025 uh, but still we have a goal of ending tuberculosis by 2025 while uh, who gives the same goal to end tuberculosis by 20 2032 uh, the world but india needs to be ahead of time and we have to uh, end tuberculosis by 2025 if we if we say that we are capital of tuberculosis so is it is it really doable can we do that we'll see so this is this is again those figures which are really disturbing 10.6 million people fell ill in tubercul uh, with tuberculosis in 21 1.6 million died Every year, 10 million people fall ill with tuberculosis, no matter which year or which uh, era we are talking about. And 5 million people die each year of TB. So TB being the most uh, dangerous killer of, inf uh, of in, in infectious disease right now. So it definitely deserves your time, right? It definitely deserves to be discussed right now in this platform. And this is our own honorable uh, Prime Minister, Narendra Modi ji. He has been uh, inaugurating uh, the free TB India campaign in February 2023. So yes, we all are moving to the, towards the same goal. So when it comes to diagnosis of TB, we all have read in our um, microbiology books and the same old age techniques we all know. But there are some modifications here and there, not much. Uh, smear microscopy, we were doing the Z and stain. Now WHO has endorsed fluorescence microscopy. Culture techniques, we were told to culture them on LG medias. And now we have the liquid cultures, uh, trade name being MGIT. Molecular methods, we have come up with many molecular methods. Famously, we know about the CB NAS, which is also called as gene expert and line probe assay. And sequencing is the upcoming thing. Then there are tests for latent tuberculosis like IGRA and TST, which have been only used for diagnosis of tuberculosis. And WHO or Government of India has banned them for diagnosing tuberculosis per se. The active tuberculosis cannot be uh, diagnosed using these tests. And then, uh, then there are some other serological tests like the LAMS and ADA, which have been old age and we know how to use them. So again, these are uh, these are few tests, microscopy, cultures, the phenotypic and uh, drug sensitivity, and again, a platter of molecular tests. So every now and then every year round the clock there are tests there are companies which come with various platforms various uh, principles and they design many such tests so that uh, tuberculosis uh, diagnosis done in a rapid and earliest way. They claim to uh, do so. So WHO, what they have done is they endorse few tests, few molecular tests, or few such tests which uh, uh, which are WHO endorsed, which you can rely on. The, uh, the sensitivity and specificity of those tests are uh, studied over wild, uh, worldwide data. And few of those tests which were endorsed, like in 2007, automated culture, uh, liquid culture was endorsed by WHO. 2008, first line LPA. 2010, expert was endorsed. And uh, 2015, urine and TB lamp was endorsed. 2016, first line LPA was endorsed. And in 2019, we had the TrueNAT, which, are, which is our own Indian gene expert, like the TrueNAT, which is chip based, which was designed and uh, was a made in India product. So uh, this is the uh, diagnostic algorithm of TB, I am sure everybody uh, knows. But just think about how, how times have been changed. We remember, uh, you know, memorizing those algorithms wherein we were uh, asked to take three sputum samples, consecutive three days, do a smear microscopy, do a x-ray. We have totally shifted to CBNAT totally shifted to molecular diagnosis, be it presumptive or be it all the diagnostics, be the previously treated close contacts of DRTB, PLHIV patients, or the pediatric age groups. Everybody, the first test for the uh, diagnosis is a CBNAT, which is commonly called as the gene expert. It is a molecular test. It is a semi-nested PCR. 
again if you are a if you are subjecting a sample to gene expert it will either give you a rifampicin resistant result or a sensitive result again if it is resistant uh, we can go down and see the uh, second test which is advised by the uh, rntcp or now the ntep is the second line lpa again a uh, uh, reverse hybridization pcr for uh, uh, for letting you know whether the fluoroquinolones and second line injectables are resistance or sensitive so yes not only has uh, there been a modification of uh, various tests and various principles and various platform but also national programming programs are integrating all these platforms into uh, our algorithm so that it is available everywhere and it is available as a point of care so uh, to convince you more on what I'm trying to say, let's just uh, go back to this case. This was a 43-year-old staff nurse. She worked in the same hospital where she uh, was diagnosed and treated. It was a private hospital in Pune. She was uh, presented with backache, uh, radiating to both lower limbs for three months. She had a significant weight loss of three kgs. There was no cuff and no fever. Okay, So MRI was done. There was D12, L1, uh, disc erosion, edema, and soft tissue involvement was seen. And the MRI report suggestive of TB spondylitis. A CT-guided biopsy was done, and sample was subjected to gene expert. So when, uh, of course, gene expert, uh, when first you do it is an MDR. So MDR TB was detected in low levels and rifampicin sensitive uh, resistance was found. Then uh, the clinician was very worried whether we are dealing here with XDR or just an MDR. So uh, he's, he asked to subject us the sample to gene expert XDR. In gene expert XDR, it was surprisingly found to be sensitive to INH, ethambutol, fluoroquinols, and second line injectables. So any idea what we are dealing here with? By definition, if MDR, you have to call a patient MDR by definition, you have to have rifampicin and INH resistance both at the same time. But here Gene Expert has only said it is only rifampicin resistant while INH was found to be sensitive on uh, XDR Gene Expert. So yeah, just uh, to give you a brief idea, Gene Expert, there are MDR and XDR Gene Expert. XDR being the newer version of Gene Expert. Previously, this was the model of their Gene Expert wherein only MDR was done. It is a very simple method wherein the sample and the buffer you can see a small bottle those two are mixed and put it in the cartridge which is this blue colored cartridge and that cartridge is loaded into the machine for 52 minutes to be precise is the runtime everything uh, calculated right from the sample processing to us max to max you will receive a result and this is a semi nested pcr everything happens inside the cartridge no need of any biosafety or uh, three level preparations or no well trained staff required just you put up the sample inside the cartridge and the machine takes care of the rest and then they, uh, there is something called, they came up with gene expert ultra so what was so fascinating about ultra is that uh, earlier when gene expert mdr was uh, designed they came up with ct values we all are very aware about ct values the cycle thresholds the difference in the cycle thresholds of the probes which they put up were measured and uh, difference if there was a significant difference it was called as rifampicin resistant if there was no significant difference it was called as rifampicin sensitive but there was some uh, probes which were which failed to pass and were invalid results so they came up with a new technology of gene but ultra wherein the entire pcr happens the uh, double stranded dna is synthesized and it is broken down to uh, do a melt curve analysis so melt curve analysis if you have a normal tb genome which has been degraded you will get uh, the melt curve analysis at certain given temperature if the, there are mutants involved it will break down at an earlier temperature so the t max is lower so that is how uh, we come up to a conclusion. Yes, we have rifampicin resistance or mixed population accordingly. Then they came up with gene expert XDR, wherein all the uh, second lines like fluoroquinolones, injectables like amikacin, kanamycin, capriomycin, ethionamide, all those were uh, diagnosed, all those reports were given to us and not just detected, not detected. They also told us whether the resistance was low level or high level. And there is something that is called indeterminate also. Okay. So there, there was a lot of confusion again. Then we, uh, so yeah, the MDR, uh, 
be it MDR, be it XDR, or be it gene expert, the advantages is you get the results in two hours. You get to know if it is rifampicin resistance along with tuberculosis. The sensitivity and specificity are quite good. It is superior. It has known to be uh, showing superior performance in patients with uh, PLHIV, and the bio safety and training precautions are really minimal. Two disadvantages. Uh, Coming to disadvantages, culture and DST, you cannot give up. No, you are not allowed. Since you are a national program, you cannot give away with culture and DST at any point of time. Blood, stool, and urine samples are not recommended. Posse bacillary, like the pericardial fluids, sinov synovial fluids, or pleural fluids, tend to have low bacillary load. So they have claimed to have low sensitivity. INH mono resistance is missed. Rifampicin hetero resistance discrepancy results have been seen. And patient not, uh, not at risk of drug resistance have tested positive and then in that case you are asked to repeat the uh, gene expert so coming to the second uh, test we discussed in the algorithm was the LPA the line pro uh, trade name being Enolipa so it is again you have to extract the DNA you do amplification a PCR product is generated a double standard DNA you get you have to break that DNA and put it into a uh, 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 put it on re reverse hybridization it is it is copied on a uh, strip and the strip is read in this way they have their own controls and everything but this test has a disadvantage there are there are lots and lots of cross contamination so even if you uh, see the controls that is the conjugate control or the ampli amplification control or m tuberculosis control once you get all these controls then only your test is considered to be positive but it was seen that there are lots and lots of fall positive cases due to cross contamination happening with lpa so again coming to the advantages and disadvantages yes rapid detection of rifampicin you get to know whether your patient is mdr or not in less than 48 hours you get those results you don't have to wait for cultures and dst and 48 samples so a, a huge throughput for 48 samples at a time you can test again disadvantage you cannot get away with cultures and dst uh, since lpa detection is more than 10 to the power 5 cfu per ml like you have to have 10 to the power 5 uh, colony forming units in your sample if you want to uh, if you have to detect it by LPA so only smear positive cases are subjected to LPA not the smear negative ones because they believe that it is uh, less in colony count uh, there, there were no specified guidelines for the second line injectable drugs and yes it requires trained uh, people and expertise to read as well as perform those tests so uh, coming to sequencing so all these tests we have in our market we we use day in day out we have the advantages we have the disadvantages with us so let's see what is upcoming upcoming is sequencing so sequencing is what we are going to study the entire genome you we have known during covid that in less than two uh, years like we had a pandemic for two and a half years less than two years span of time the virus came it infected it caused a pandemic it caused lockdown but we but being such smart humans we have been able to uh, find out the entire genome we were able to develop a vaccine against it and yes now we are we have overcome that pandemic so that is the power of sequencing sequencing can give you the entire genomic type of that uh, organism the strain the lineage the evolution that has come up with so uh, sequencing can be done from sputum sample or it can be done from the culture DST. When you do it from a liquid culture, it uh, takes less time because uh, liquid cultures gives you uh, better positivity. So it can be done in eight to 14 days after your liquid cultures are positive. It can be done from the solid cultures, which take more time, like six to eight weeks. And then it can be directly done from the sputum sample as well. We'll see how. So when you talk about whole genome sequencing, it is it is a very fascinating process. It has it is very expensive. It is a very uh, robust uh, thing to do. But to simplify it to you, you are going to uh, extract the DNA from your sample or the culture if you have culture if you have whole, whole genome uh, sequencing only allows you to use the cultures, not the samples. So you take uh, the DNA extract uh, extraction out of those sample uh, of those liquid cultures or solid cultures 
features and you make a double strand out of it and then there are sequences made so these sequences are put up in your uh, central storage like there is a genome of tb which we all know that the, the tb genome has been designed and just like a jigsaw puzzle all these short sequences are placed here and there and once the jigsaw puzzle is solved you get a report and you can see which uh, codon or which particular base pair is missing what mutation it confers to and uh, the good news is uh, not just is the technology advancing who is endorsing and it has come up with a catalog of various mutations various codons which have been replaced and causing mutations and what does it indicate when you replace certain codon what is it going to implicate how is it going to change your treatment protocol so recently version one of this document or catalog of uh, you know uh, these uh, mutations have come up on who website and soon they will be giving a uh, version two as well so who is advancing also to sequencing and you will be uh, you should not be surprised to see uh, sequencing done here and there and who endorsing this test so yeah uh, again the specimen there is a bacterial culture same the genome uh, genomic dna is extracted sequencing library is made and the raw it is match up to the raw sequences we have okay so uh, then there comes first and second uh, next generation sequencer first generation it's it, it's just that it is essentially a automated electrophoresis the which the visualization of the sequencing is different while in next generation it is rapid it is uh, with the with the help of uh, bioinformatics uh, and it is a low throughput high cost uh, thing Again, the disadvantages or advantages. Advantages, it is high resolution. It allows you to know the exact type, the exact lineage, the genomic makeup of your patient's strain. What strain is your patient infected with? You need not to go and, uh, you know, you study, you, no, no, it is rifampicin resistant. Let us avoid rifampicin. You need, you will be getting the entire genomic, which codon is replaced, what does it mean? Everything you can get in a whole genomic sequences. You can predict drug resistance TBs if you see one codon missing and if you see that it is low level resistance might as well you give a higher dose or skip that drug okay so you can predict drug resistance TB and it will help you guide the patient uh, treatment you know TB the biggest problem uh, with TB is uh, the adverse drug reaction patient gets himself treated for two to three months there are some adverse drug reactions we find out that the patient is resistant to so and so drug and now we have to change so adverse drug reaction does a lot of damage so we can uh, we, if we can foresee all this we can be thorough about what empirical or uh, treatment we have to start uh, on the our patients on we we can totally overcome the limitations of a molecular tests like gene expert and lpa because gene expert targets the rpob gene which is re responsible for rifampicin resistance and lpa if it is second first line it will again target the rpo gene if it is second line it will tar target the gyrase and ethambutol genes which are responsible for second line uh, drug resistance uh, disadvantages yes it is very expensive it is labor in in intensive it is financially demanding it is it will mostly rely on the central data. So you will have to have always an access to the central data. You will have to give your sequences to them and you will have to wait for the report format from them to come. By, uh, that is what it is called. The bioinformatics is very challenging. There are ethical concerns. There are technical complexes. There are, there, there are uh, papers and case reports wherein discordance have been seen because the genotypic tests which we have been doing uh, right till now, like LPA and and gene expert give you only idea of few genome sequences or only few area of that entire genome so there is going to be discrepancy when you treat your patient based on gene export or lp and then a whole genome sequence report comes sometimes you might find discrepancies then then there is something called as target sequencing target sequencing only gives you the advantage that you can directly do it from your sputum sample you take a sputum sample subject it to dna extraction and you can perform sequencing based on that here when you give sequences in whole genome uh, sequencing just two minutes sir. whole genome sequencing uh, you will be uh, having sequences only few uh, different sequences while target you have specific targets for target sequencing 
again the advantages and dis disadvantages full genome sequenced is uh, in uh, sequenced in whole genome and uh, it um, in uh, targeted few targets are done only advantage here for targeted is you can directly do it from the sample so you uh, cut down the time of culture which uh, which takes for liquid or uh, solid cultures uh, Disadvantages, WGS requires a lot of uh, complicated bioinformatics and a relatively simpler in targeted. So coming back to our case, uh, so this patient was uh, uh, given, uh, diagnosed with rifampicin monoresistance, a high dose rifampicin and HSHZE treatment was done. Clinical, but 45 days down the line of treatment, clinical and radiological worsening was seen. But when they sequenced, they found out this F511 CCG mutation, which corresponded to rifampicin resistance, which only means that this clinical and radiological worsening was a part of IRIS syndrome, but nothing else. And the patient has improved with no relapse. Again, the same P uh, patient with PTB, expert rifampicin resistant, LPA showed INA mutations, WGS confirmed that INS high level mutations and the patient was started with 18 month regime. So yes, we need to uh, come up with combination of TB screening and diagnosis. No test, no one test can solve your problem. We need to decentralize this. We need to have more point of care tests and promising thing is the molecular diagnostic. And uh, we have many other tests available at our Green Array Lab, Influenza Panel, TB uh, Respiratory Panel, TB PCR, HIV, HPV, and STD Panel. All these tests are, along with those platforms, are soon going to get enable accredited. The lab is centrally located. We have a very cost-effective uh, uh, platforms here. And you can send in those tests. All those tests will be done in uh, external and ex internal quality proof areas and enable accredited labs. So yeah, please uh, send all the samples to Green Array Lab and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seema. Thank you, sir. I think it was a wonderful, comprehensive talk. Thank you, sir. Now, being a gynecologist, yes, sir. for the physician, it's easy. But yes, for sir. a gynecologist, diagnosis of genital TB is a very, sir. The treatment is very simple. True. The challenge is the diagnosis. True. And probably from your talk, what yes. I can see, well, there is, light at the end of the tunnel yes through molecular diagnosis yes sir. So thank you thank you so much any questions uh cost of cbnet for uh, mdr is 2500 roughly for xdr it goes from range of four to five thousand uh but just because ma'am you asked uh we haven't figured out the cost of uh, wags in green array but for competitive marketing price if i have to tell you wgs comes with a cost of just six thousand rupees so it is cost effective as well but i'm sure it would get cheaper as more and more sun yes. would be there yes. probably that is yes. a few Future actually. Yes, definitely. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Seema Gaikwad, for your talk. I request uh, Dr. Raju Varyani, sir, Dr. Kurn, sir, to join for the facilitation, Dr. Rajan Sanche, sir, President elect, and Dr. Gupte, sir, Dr. Navrange, sir, to join for the felicitation. Before the last lecture, I would like to inform that the feedback forms would be distributed. We need the feedback forms filled in for the MMC points to be uploaded and credited in your account. So for the next lecture, I would like to invite Mrs. Manju Kurup for her lecture on role of genetic counseling in clinical practice. Well, uh, although this is the last talk of the day, well, as a clinician, I feel this is the most important talk. See, because the thing is, uh, when you are young, you are constantly doing many, many things. But when you mature, you understand where not to do. 
and then you know what to do what not to do when to do see then that part of counseling is very very important and uh, uh, here we have uh, in dr manju kuru who is going to uh, tell us the role of genetic counseling well as it is genetic counseling is a rare speciality there are very counselors but genetic counseling there are very few and madam we are really looking forward to your talk now she is a msc in biomedical genetics from vellor more than 6 years of experience as a genetic counselor and has had many contributions to the field so without any much ado we would go ahead to your talk now as a clinician there are two dilemmas which i normally face number one see the now with so many uh, labs coming in patients come with lot of reports sure sir and then there is one remark of undetermined undetermined uh, significance variant of uncertain and, significance yes and as a clinician i really do not know what to do or how to what what to tell the patient okay. about the future another important thing when it comes to counseling see when we have cases of repeated uh, uh, miscarriages say three miscarriages now on one side our textbooks and our personal uh, experience also says that the patient has 70 80% chance of going ahead with a normal baby in spite of three uh, repeated losses now but on the other side when you uh, when the patient has a report and then you know finally at one stage it leads to ivf and pre implantation genetic diagnosis where the cost is about 3 lakhs of rupees so you know i am in a dilemma ki whether to tell her no no keep trying once or to go ahead with this so please we look sure, forward sir. to your answers sure sir i'll just try to cover all your queries in the presentation so beginning with the presentation what is genetic counseling So American Society of Human Genetics defines genetic counseling as a communication process that deals with a special health service that provides information and support to the people who have or may be at risk of genetic disorder in a family. So genetic counseling is a skill-based communication process that employs scientific knowledge regarding principles of human genetics, genomics, psychological aspects of genetic disease and communication expertise. to support individuals and their families to understand and cope with genetic diagnosis so like sir mentioned there are n number of genetic tests that are available so like uh, different genetic tests have different principles they have different purposes like for karyotyping if we want to see if any major chunk of dna is missing or if there is any numerical abnormality we go for a karyotyping and fish analysis if we are looking for some specific chromosomal aberrations and chromosomal microarray analysis like we had discussed previous in the sessions if any micro deletions or duplications that could not be found out by a karyotyping or a fish analysis we go for a microarray analysis which is of a higher resolution and a single gene sequencing when we want to focus on a particular gene which is associated with a particular condition and a panel testing where more than one gene is associated in causing a condition exome analysis when there are multiple condition running in the family and we are not able to exactly pinpoint if we have to go for a panel testing or a gene analysis specific we go for an exome analysis and also if we have to see a exonic as well as a intronic region that is a coding and a non coding region we go for a genome analysis and epigenetic analysis like we had previously seen in doctor's lecture so it is certain genes that are expressed the way it is expressed so for all these genetic testing the application can be of various type it can be for diagnostics testing pre symptomatic or predictive testing carrier testing for pharmacogenomics prenatal testing it can be for newborn screening or pre implantation genetic testing so surely genetic testing is complicated but invaluable in medical diagnosis and determining treatment for many diseases and conditions So as per National Society of Genetic Counseling there are more than 40000 different tests available and more than 10000 conditions genetic conditions that have been enlisted and more than 16000 genes that have been identified now sir your question arises like which test to give for which patient so deciding which genetic test to offer and to whom can be a complex process that involves careful consideration of various factors so which can be the unique characterization of a condition that is a genetic condition its features its clinical representation the circumstances of each individual 
continuous communication like for getting the detailed family history as much as possible from the patient and it should be patient centered approach are essential in the process of deciding which genetic tests to offer so this is when genetic counseling actually comes into picture so genetic counseling could be included in clinical practice by trained candidates who can assist clinical practitioners in this time consuming procedure to ease their work in their hectic schedule So what exactly genetic counseling focuses on? It actually focuses on the psychological aspects and taking the family history, the onset of a specific condition in the family, what is the age of onset, and to see what all genetic history is there in that family, and to provide support and additional information about all the genetic tests and options that are available that is particular for that patient. And also interpretation of the result where it can be a pathogenic variant, what it signifies, a benign variant, what it signifies, and like a variant of uncertain significance. And also detecting the type of inheritance pattern by a proper pedigree analysis. And also if we are getting a positive result for a patient, how that information is beneficial, not only for that patient, but also for the additional family members. So these are the major aspects that genetic counseling looks into. So how did it all start? Like in 1947, Professor Reed Sheldon, he was the one who termed the, who coined the term genetic counseling in USA. And he wrote the first book in genetic counseling, Counseling in Medical Genetics in 1956. And 1981 was the era where genetic counseling was actually identified as a separate profession when Professor Peter Harper, he wrote the practical genetic counseling book. So the main aim behind this was to prevent or minimize the recurrence of serious disorders presumed to be completely or partially genetically influenced. So what are the main genetic counseling goal in clinical practice? To increase the family's understanding of a genetic condition, discuss options regarding disease management and the risk that benefit of further testing and other options. Like, sir, you had a query like when we can suggest for a testing. So it actually depends on what exactly is the family history, what is the pers patient's personal history, and what all testing it is already been done, and what was the finding. So basis that we can provide options to the patient. And it is upon the patient that which test is feasible for that patient, and what would be the outcome. So at least in our Indian scenario, it is like not the patient who decides what is supposed to be done. It is always a family. They sit together on a dinner table and they have a discussion like what exactly has to be done for the female exactly. So help the individual and the family to cope with potential outcome and reduce the family's anxiety regarding the genetic testing, the cost and everything. So who can be referred for a genetic counseling? So it is if there is a family history of a genetic condition, it might be known or if any genetic condition is suspected in the family or if a patient is a carrier for a certain condition and they want to know if there is a risk for the next generation to develop the condition. And if there is a consanguineous marriage in the family, if a fetal structural anomaly or prenatal ultrasound abnormality is observed, abnormal screening test result, either traditional serum screening or cell-free DNA screening, known teratogenic exposure during pregnancy, recurrent pregnancy loss, and if a patient proactively is well read and wants to know if he is a potential carrier for any genetic mutation that can lead to a predisposition in the next generation or even the other family members, he can also opt for a genetic testing only if there is a proper family history or if certain condition that doesn't require and directly he can go for a carrier testing. So what is the most important component of genetic counseling is a pre-test counseling. This is a session where patient has an opportunity to facilitate the informed decision making after knowing all the positive and the negative points like the limitations of genetic testing he is going to opt for. So 
so here informed consent is the major aspect of pretest counseling which is received by the patient after the patient is informed about why he is being offered the genetic testing and what is the accuracy of the genetic testing and what are the available options alternate options for that genetic testing and what does the positive result or the negative result or the uncertain result signifies after the patient is informed about all these information and if he is convinced and no other additional doubts is there for that patient he can provide an informed consent which is helpful for us to proceed with the testing so it is very essential to provide all the information during the pre test counseling because inadequate pre test counseling can adversely affect the patient's understanding of genetic testing process as well as the accuracy of the test and the next component of genetic counseling is the post test counseling which is an informative dis discussion that involves educating patient and their families about the occurrence or recurrence of the genetic disorder in the family so it is very true that if the pre test counseling is very informative and all the information has been shared to the patient in the pre test counseling session the post test counseling becomes easier by providing clear information addressing concerns establishing open communication pre test counseling creates a foundation that supports individual through the entire testing and the counseling journey so what are the applications of genetic counseling it can be applied in prenatal setting pediatric adult genetic counseling or cancer genetic counseling so prenatal genetic counseling as the name suggests during pregnancy if there is any previous history of any genetic condition in the family or the previous baby is affected with some genetic condition or if there is any abnormal ultrasound reports or biomarker reports or if there is a history of infertility multiple miscarriage or stillbirth even in the family or the patient herself has the history so what is pediatric genetic counseling is caring for the children if the child is showing any signs and symptoms for any genetic condition which could be a congenital defect abnormal newborn screening result intellectual disability or developmental disabilities or autism like disorders vision or hearing problems so genetic counseling for adults it can be provided in case of any history of cardiovascular condition psychiatric condition cancer genetic counseling if there is a early onset of cancer in the family or if multiple generations are affected with some certain cancers or if or the patient is closely related to the patient, person counselor who wants to do the genetic testing so also in case of conditions like familial hypercholesterolemia and similar conditions muscular dystrophy and other muscle diseases inherited blood disorders such as sickle cell disease so what are the types of genetic counseling it can be prospective which allows the prevention of the disease if no genetic condition is detected in the family but as discussed earlier if the patient wants to proactively go for a carrier testing that is known as a prospective genetic counseling retrospective genetic counseling which is hereditary disorder has already occurred in the family and the counselee wants to know if he is predisposed for that certain conditions like mental retardation inborn error of metabolism or for psychiatric conditions so the steps of genetic counseling the major part is the history so patient's past clinical history the present history and if there is any family history of any related conditions if this is a consanguineous marriage if anybody is affected with some congenital anomaly taking all those history is very important it is very truly said that the family's future starts with the family history so the next very important part is the pedigree charting so constructing a pedigree with proper interrogation through time is time consuming but it is ultimately rewarding because it is a pictorial representation with which helps us to know how many members are affected in the family and what is the onset of the condition and what could be the possible risk for the next generation or the siblings to be affected by that condition and it is the way where we can detect what is the inheritance pattern of the genetic condition so estimation of risk mode of inheritance pedigree analysis the result of other tests these are all 
the way that we can make an estimation of risk for the other family members as well as the next generation for the counseling. So diagnosis and analysis phase. So in certain cases where there is a rare congenital disorder or multiple anomalies are detected in a baby. So in certain cases, we have to go for an ex extensive literature search and review of information. And we need to consult expertise also who have been working in that field to know what exactly the test can be referred for the patient. That is the chromosomal analysis test is perfect for that condition or going for a genetic analysis means molecular DNA analysis is perfect. Like chromosomal, we have karyotyping or microarray and molecular DNA testing where we can go for a single gene or multiple gene. So this is one extremely important part, which is again time consuming for counselors because they have to collect all the information because before they actually go and counsel the patient. And this is the most important part exchange of information like discussed before they should know all the benefits and limitations of doing the genetic testing, what implies the positive genetic if the result is positive what it implies to him her, himself or the family members it is very essential for him to know that and assess the counselee's understanding of the fact and relevant hereditary pattern diagnostic and management option for the disorders so this is the referral and the support phase at times the counselees are interested to connect with other families or other NGOs that specifically work for that condition like for thalassemia or sickle disease so that they can know if their baby is affected what is their experience and how to cope up with that situation for example down syndrome conditions so in that cases they do ask for referral where they can talk and get more information so that is also the included in the role of a genetic counselor and support can be provided in case the patient is emotionally down in that case if a genetic disorder the cure is unknown he can be connected with a clinical geneticist for management plan that can be provided appropriately and also if one counseling session is not enough for the patient to understand multiple counseling sessions can be provided for that patient as a part of support phase so what are the code of ethics by national society of genetic counseling that a counselor has to follow so summarizing it it is the most important part is it should be a non-directive counseling like dr fadke madam and also said that this is the most important part for a counseling session we counselor should never be a part of what decision the patient has to make it should be the patient should be completely empowered with all the genetic information the benefits and the delimits everything so that the patient can make an informed decision for himself and the other family members but it should be completely his decision and also we should respect the patient's decision and we should support throughout the genetic counseling procedure testing procedure and the whole aim should be the benefit of the patient and doing good for the patient and no negligence with patient's health and it should be a non-biased counseling session because it should be not that in case of rpl we are just supporting the female candidate or the male candidate it should be unbiased we are just there counselors are there to provide them with the required information they are about supposed to know for their health and genetic aspects so this is just basic general scenario like if a couple a couple in their 30s they have a six years old son wife's mother passed away due to breast cancer at the age of 40 which is an early onset and she has a family history of heart disease as well the concerned couple opted for genetic counseling to see what is their risk what is the wife's risk and the next generation risk so certainly in this case the procedure is the same first should be the risk assessment and while taking the family history the pedigree should be drawn in such a way taking into account the cancer history as well as the cardiac condition that is there in the family the age of onset the condition that was diagnosed and also providing with all the available options for him or her for testing and informed decision making help and understand the genetic risk factors that could be passed on to the future children and explore the other options and emotional support and health management options and also education and advocacy which is an important part because 
at times patients if they are detected positive they are very secretive they don't share it with the other family members he should be because at last it is his or her decision if he has to share with the family members but as counselors it is our responsibility that we are supposed to inform them what is the health benefit they are going to know if they know that they are at the risk of developing the condition so sharing that information is very essential and we have to provide them with that information so this is a second case scenario where a young couple who are planning to start a family they are both carrier of thalassemia although neither of them has the disease itself they are unaware of the potential risk associated with having children so initially ideally in this case the couple is supposed to have a genetic testing done that is the hbb screening if they both have the similar genetic mutation in them so inheritance pattern it is autosomal recessive so the next generation will have a 25 percent risk of developing the condition so in this case a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis might be recommended or going for a prenatal genetic testing, which is a single variant that is detected only in the family. So these are ideally the procedure that are supposed to be followed. So this example underscores the crucial role that genetic counselors play in ensuring the health and well-being of individual and families at risk of genetic conditions. So this is the third case scenario where the ethical and the psychological issues are coming into picture. A 29 years old man presented for counseling with a concern that his fiance had a family history of a rare eye disease. His fiance is not affected, but her father has completely lost his vision in his early 40s and his younger brother had blur vision since his 30s. So the consultant had presented for the counseling session alone without even getting his fiance along with him so here the ideally what is supposed to be done is the affected person that is the index or the proband case as is supposed to be diagnosed supposed to be referred for a genetic testing to see if it is what is the variant actually running in the family to see if it is actually predisposed to and also to see what is the risk for the, his fiance to have that condition but in this case the consultant insisted on directly testing his fiance for the genetic condition and she was not present in the counseling session to understand the condition and also to give her informed consent and here genetic counseling plays an important role it is very important for the counselor to respect a patient's autonomy non-maleficence and beneficency. So the counselee was convinced to get his fiancé first for the genetic counselling session to proceed in the ideal process for proper predisposition analysis. The benefit of getting the proband test tested were discussed with the counselee. So in accordance with the ethics of genetic counselling, the job of genetic counsellor is to offer unbiased information and assist in making well-informed decision it is always advised that the genetic information only be given to the concerned individual 18 years of age or older or to parents because it is a personal sensitive and confidential information that could be occasionally be used inappropriately. So coming to the summary part. In India, genetic counseling has a great scope and demand in the upcoming years. Beginning from a basic karyotyping test for Down syndrome, we have come a long way ahead in genetic testing and counseling facilities. Genetic testing has evolved to encompass a broad spectrum of condition offering insights in various aspects of individual's health including metabolic disorder intellectual disabilities etc the landscape of genetic testing is dynamic and ongoing research continue continually expands the list of condition for which genetic testing is possible there is still much to be done and genetic counseling professionals can greatly contribute to the awareness and education of genetic science to the public at a large considering the community genetic approach. Thank you. Sir, I think I did not address that variant of uncertain significance. So, sir, when we get a result of uncertain significance, initially what we are supposed to do is a clinical correlation, which is ideally done by a medical geneticist. So, if there is a clinical correlation, then we can see that is what is the risk for the additional family members or the next generation. Or if the occurrence is spontaneous we have to see if the parents are carrier for that condition if no that condition might have a variable penetrance 
so that is one aspect that we can take into account and the if the parents are normal then we can see it is a spontaneous occurrence and what are the chances for developing that spontaneous occurrence in the next pregnancy so according to that we can take a call what is the next suggestive approach for that patient thank you so okay. now we know where to refer him. yes sir sure. <laughs> anyway any questions सगळे निघालेत पण फक्त एक सांगते की जाताना चहा घेऊन जायचा आहे त्यामुळे सगळ्यांनी रिक्वेस्ट चेअरपर्सन डॉक्टर गुप्ते सर डॉक्टर नवरंगे सर डॉक्टर संजय पाटील सर अँड डॉक्टर संजय ती सर टू जॉईन फॉर द फेलिसिटेशन आय रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर नितीन गुप्ते सर and mr avinash joshi to join followed by uh, the chair persons uh, felicitation ani sagle nighalet pan saglyanna ek athvan karun dete ki 15 october la elections ahet ima madhe saglyanni zarur yaycha I request Varyani sir to felicitate uh, Mr. Nathan Gupta sir. अविनाश जोशी as it is customary i'll give this briefest thanksgiving thank you all <laughs>